audiobook titled The Flying Dutchman, 00-15, by Sally Sally. This work belongs to author Sally Sally, source ScribbleHub and RoyalRoad.com, Part 0, The Rift, Previous. It's a place of magic and wonder, where dragons soar through the skies and goblins lurk in dark corners. The landscape is dotted with ancient ruins and mysterious dungeons, filled with traps and secrets waiting to be discovered. The people of this world are as diverse as the creatures that inhabit it. Some are skilled in the art of magic, using their powers to shape the world around them. Others are master craftsmen, creating intricate works of art and engineering marvels that are the envy of all who see them. Despite its many wonders, this world is not without its dangers. Adventurers brave treacherous dungeons and face off against fearsome monsters in order to protect the people of their kingdoms and unlock the secrets of the past. The Demon King's castle floated in the middle of the treacherous ocean, surrounded by a thick fog that obscured its dark and ominous shape. Rumors spread among the adventurers of an ancient and banished god named Belarius, who had once reigned as the Demon King. It was said that Belarius wielded immense power and instilled terror in the hearts of all who crossed his path. Despite his exile, tales of his malevolence and cruelty continued to haunt the land. The residents lived in constant fear, always wary of the potential return of the Demon King and his horde of demonic minions. He sat on his throne with his eyes flaming with a sinister glow as he watched the heroes attempt to siege his fortress through his crystal ball. Belarius chuckled darkly, seeing their so-called bravery as nothing more than futile attempts to challenge his reign. Suddenly, the crystal ball flickered and crackled, as if sensing the presence of danger. Belarius's heart skipped a beat as his minions barged in, out of breath and bleeding. My lord, one of them gasped. The heroes have breached the outer defenses and are advancing towards the throne room. They're stronger than we anticipated. Belarius's sinister smile widened as he rose from his throne, ready to face the challenge head on. Let them come, he hissed, for they shall witness the true power of darkness. Belarius's minions bowed down before him, their loyalty unwavering. For years I have been searching for a way to open the ancestral rift, Belarius declared, but now, it is no longer his problem with the discovery of the ancient artifact. With its immense power, he knew he could conquer other worlds with ease, fulfilling his insatiable thirst for power. As he activated the artifact, a powerful surge of energy erupted from it, causing the ground to shake and the air to crackle with electricity. The force was so intense that it split Belarius's flying fortress in two, leaving a deep chasm between his loyal minions. Yet, instead of fear or panic, a twisted smile spread across Belarius's face. This was exactly what he had anticipated. Before he was banished from the realm of the system lords, he once witnessed the ancestral rift open for the first time when the ancients still walked the land. With only the throne room floating and the cube-shaped artifact remaining intact, Belarius laughed as his fortress fell. Within a brief moment, a lance hit the ground with a resounding thud, sending shockwaves rippling through the air. As the dust settled, the heroes emerged from the debris, their determined expressions contrasting against the chaos around them. Amused by their tenacity, Belarius couldn't help but admire their bravery, for little did they know that this was all part of his grand plan. The banished god Belarius, also known as the Demon King, towered over the heroes with his twisted, writhing form. You cannot stop me, mortals, Belarius boomed. Your world is but a stepping stone to my ultimate goal the conquest of all worlds. You cannot open those gates, Demon King, the hero shouted, his voice echoing through the collapsing chamber. Your evil conquest ends here, the hero gritted his teeth, his sword at the ready. He knew that this would be a difficult fight, but he had trained his whole life for this moment. He was not about to back down now. The heroes charged forward, their weapons flashing in the dim light. Belarius met them head on, his own powers clashing against theirs with a deafening sound. The battle was fierce and brutal, with the heroes and Belarius trading blow for blow. But the heroes were determined, their wills were unbreakable. Unfortunately, Belarius proved to be too powerful for them. Belarius defeated four of the heroes with ease, leaving only one remaining, their mage, whose energy was waning. The mage had cast spell after spell, but the strain of the battle had taken its toll. As Belarius approached, he was about to deliver the final blow when suddenly the exhausted hero smiled. Despite the overwhelming odds stacked against him and his fallen companions, the mage summoned all his remaining strength and unleashed a spell never before seen. 
The air around them grew heavy, time seemed to slow, and even the mighty demon lord's movements became sluggish. In that precious moment, the last of the mage's companions, who had been lying unconscious on the ground, regained consciousness and rushed forward to help the mage. As the mage lost his strength and his companion fought, they could see the relic in the distance, shimmering with an ethereal light. We have to get to the relic, the mage gasped, his voice strained from exhaustion. For what seemed like an eternity, they finally reached the relic. The mage's companion noticed that he was bleeding and that his wound was too deep to be easily healed. Sir Seldrick, your wound looks severe, the companion exclaimed, concern etched on his companion's face. The mage forced a weak smile and replied, I will be fine. For now, the relic comes first. The companion hesitated, torn between helping the mage and fulfilling their mission. However, he saw the demon king laugh once more as he broke Seldrick's spell. Knowing that time was running out, the companion made a quick decision. Fighting the banished god head-on, Seldrick helplessly watched as his companion charged towards the demon king, knowing that his own strength was no match for the banished god. He could only hope that his companion's bravery would buy him enough time to find a way to change the relic's power and stop the demon king once and for all. He activated the relic its ancient energy surging through the floating structure. He can see the runes materializing in thin air as it orbit around the relic. With a burst of light, the demon king was suddenly standing in front of Seldrick. His immense power was almost suffocating. Seldrick laughed mockingly, knowing that the demon king's time was running out. He used a fraction of the relic's teleportation power to save the three remaining heroes from the demon king's clutches. In a few moments, the demon king grabbed Seldrick by the throat his grip tightening with each passing second. Your feeble attempts to escape will only prolong your suffering, the demon king hissed, his eyes glowing with fury. Seldrick laughed in defiance. I have made changes in your plan, and your time as the ruler of darkness is coming to an end, he declared confidently. The demon king's anger intensified, his grip tightening even more as he growled, you may have saved your friends, but you cannot save yourself from the inevitable. Seeing the rift change in color behind the demon king made Seldrick smile, knowing that his adjustments were taking effect. As the demon king noticed the change in color, his fury turned into a mixture of confusion and concern. Seldrick's smile widened, knowing that he had successfully disrupted the demon king's carefully laid plans. No! You cannot defy me! The demon king shouted, his voice trembling with a hint of desperation as he threw Seldrick to the ground with a powerful blast of dark energy. Seldrick's body hit the ground hard, sending a sharp pain radiating through his weakened limbs. Gasping for breath, he struggled to lift himself up, feeling his strength fleeting with each passing moment. The flickering light in his eyes dimmed as the life force within him waned. Ah, that truck really changed the course of my day. Seldrick managed to mutter as he closed his eyes, succumbing to the darkness that enveloped him. As he died, the runes suddenly glowed with an eerie intensity, their ancient symbols pulsating with a newfound energy. The air crackled with a mysterious power, hinting at the possibility of a greater force at play. What did you do, mortal? The demon king roared in disbelief, his voice echoing through the structure. He looked down at the lifeless body of the hero his once formidable opponent now nothing more than a lifeless husk. He looked at the relic again and realized that it was not just a symbol of power but a ticking time bomb. Panic surged through the demon king as he comprehended the imminent danger. The relic's aura intensified, with sparks sizzling and dancing around its surface. With each passing second, the pressure within the relic grew, threatening to shatter its ancient containment. The demon king had no choice but to flee, knowing that his domain would soon be consumed by the explosive aftermath of his defeated foe's final act. As the explosion erupted, a wave of force surged in the vicinity, shaking the very foundation of the Demon King's stronghold. The explosion weakened his powers further, causing him to stumble and lose control over his dark energies. His once formidable strength diminished, leaving him vulnerable and powerless against any potential threats that may come his way. In a desperate attempt to escape the devastating aftermath, the Demon King mustered the last ounce of his weakened power and vanished into the depths of the ocean. The battle had taken its toll, and now he was left with no choice but to hide beneath the waves, hoping to evade any impending danger that might lurk above. The vast expanse of the ocean became his temporary sanctuary, 
shielding him from the relentless pursuit of his enemies and giving him a chance to regroup and strategize for his eventual return to power. 0. Part 1. Departure. 2 a.m. Unknown date. An unknown fishing vessel was cruising somewhere over the North Atlantic. A sailor aboard the fishing vessel was smoking just outside when he noticed something unusual about the water. It was glowing with a strange white light. As he looked closer, a massive beam of light emitted from the water, illuminating the entire vessel and temporarily blinding the sailor. The rest of the crew members rushed out to see what was happening. By the time they reached the deck, their eyes widened in astonishment. They saw a substantial curtain of energy beaming up into the sky, halting just above the clouds and forming a towering vertical wall. The lights manifested as a ghostly white glow, dancing across the sky in a mesmerizing cadence, flickering and shifting like an otherworldly display of aurora. It was abundantly clear that whatever had caused this phenomenon had originated from the ocean depths. What is that? inquired the captain, the astonishment evident in their voices. They all stood there, captivated by the enigmatic spectacle of light and energy unfolding before them. None of them had ever encountered anything remotely similar, leaving them utterly incapable of explaining the inexplicable. The crew members remained in a state of awe as the phenomenon persisted for several minutes. When it eventually subsided and they were left to their thoughts, speech seemed to fail them. Puzzled and spellbound, they found themselves grappling with the enormity of what they had just witnessed. Later, they dutifully reported the entire incident to the authorities. It didn't take long for the details to become public, and the news swiftly propagated like wildfire. NASA's satellites have identified and documented peculiar anomalies in the North Atlantic. In addition, there have been accounts of colossal, enigmatic structures of unattributed provenance. These findings have stirred the curiosity of a wide spectrum of individuals, ranging from scientists to experts all driven by a shared desire to comprehend this baffling occurrence and ascertain its plausible underpinnings. The phenomenon has also garnered the attention of global powers, including the United Nations, which has opted to initiate a comprehensive investigation. Subsequently, it came to light that the wall emitted a peculiar yet harmless form of radiation. Upon meticulous examination, an incident involving an unmanned underwater vehicle unfolded. Unexpectedly, the vehicle was drawn by a potent underwater current toward the wall, resulting in the vehicle's seamless passage through the wall while its cable remained unbroken. Astonishingly, the video feed from the vehicle persisted, continuously transmitting data. Further scrutiny of this video feed unveiled an astonishing revelation. The opposing side of the wall, now dubbed the Rift, unveiled an entirely distinct environment from that of the North Atlantic. The unearthing of this rift heralded the dawn of fresh prospects for exploration and scientific inquiry. Simultaneously, it ignited a cascade of inquiries regarding its origins and raison d'etre. The realization eventually crystallized that this constituted an immense gateway, an endeavor of truly monumental proportions. Consequently, the discovery of the rift catalyzed a revival of fascination with the wall and its underlying significance. An array of scientists and researchers embarked on speculative deliberations, postulating that it could conceivably serve as a portal to an alternate realm or dimension. In response, the United Nations swiftly convened a dedicated committee charged with delving into the rift and its prospective ramifications. Notably, substantial resources were allocated for extended investigations and comprehensive study of the rift and its contiguous regions. The incident involving the unmanned underwater vehicle kindled an epoch of unprecedented exploration and curiosity within the scientific community. Before long, they dispatched an UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, to traverse the aperture and reach the opposing side. This time, the drone's observations unveiled not but an expanse of boundless ocean, devoid of any discernible anomalies. Undeterred, a second drone was launched engineered with enhanced operational parameters and autonomous flight capabilities to navigate extended distances sans human intervention, ensuring its safe return. Several days later, the second drone returned, remarkably intact. Following painstaking hours of meticulous footage analysis, a breakthrough emerged. The drone's recordings revealed the presence of a vessel, a ship reminiscent of the medieval sail ships. Strikingly distinct from the norm, the ship bore an unfamiliar flag. Yet, the true astonishment lay in its crew composition. The onboard individuals included those unmistakably human, alongside beings displaying features reminiscent of animals, such as feline ears and tails. 
The unearthing of this medieval sail ship, housing a diverse assemblage of humans and creatures possessing animalistic attributes, has inaugurated a plethora of inquiries within the scientific community. This singular discovery has precipitated profound speculation regarding the plausible existence of alternate civilizations and species dwelling beneath the ocean's depths. The next phase entails intensified exploration and inquiry, aimed at unraveling the enigmatic truths concealed within this remarkable revelation. After meticulous deliberation, a decision was reached to embark on a groundbreaking endeavor, the conception and construction of two cutting-edge vessels specifically tailored for operations within the extraordinary realm. The first ship to be sent was the Queen Anne's Revenge, which is supposed to be a strategic support vessel. They also removed their electronic warfare systems, replacing them with an advanced navigation system to increase their tactical advantage during missions and deter and counter any potential attacks in the special region. The Queen Anne's Revenge can also provide additional support to the ships they are escorting such as by providing supplies or assisting in rescue operations in the event of an emergency. In summary, the Queen Anne's Revenge is one of the most vital components of a mission that carries troops and other exploratory vehicles, as they ensure the safe passage and protection of the flagship, the Flying Dutchman, in hostile or uncertain environments. The Flying Dutchman, a pioneering reconnaissance vessel, has been meticulously enhanced to navigate the intricacies of the specialized realm. Externally, its structure is fortified with resilient hull plating and augmented radar systems, primed to endure the rigors of the unique environment. Internally, the vessel presents an assemblage of cutting-edge laboratories and instrumentation, conceived to facilitate rigorous scientific inquiry. Moreover, it is equipped to execute comprehensive surveys, proficiently mapping unfamiliar terrains via a constellation of advanced sensors and integrated mapping technology, embedded within the hull. This vessel boasts a self-sustained weaponry system, twin rainmetal Erlikon Millennium guns, also known as rainmetal GDM-008, adorning its lateral flanks. For more formidable engagement capabilities, it houses a complement of 16 vertical launching systems, VLS. This configuration incorporates an innovative mechanism for both missile housing and launch, augmenting the vessel's offensive potential. The missiles themselves are guided by a convergence of technologies including laser, electro-optical, infrared, radar, and inertial navigation systems, converging into a comprehensive, multi-layered guidance network. This synthesis of cutting-edge advancements in weaponry and surveillance transforms the Flying Dutchman into a formidable and adaptable vessel, aptly equipped for its role in the uncharted and challenging special region. The augmentation of weaponry on both the Queen Anne's Revenge and the Flying Dutchman can be attributed to a pivotal incident that underscored the necessity for enhanced defensive capabilities. A harrowing occurrence transpired when a colossal and formidable creature unexpectedly breached the rift, wreaking havoc upon a research vessel poised to traverse the boundary. This incident culminated in substantial damage to the vessel, laying bare the vulnerability inherent in a lack of protective measures. In the wake of this alarming event, a resolute consensus emerged within the expedition's leadership. It was acutely evident that the unfamiliar realm held untold dangers, necessitating the provision of potent defenses to ensure the safety of both personnel and equipment during missions. The integration of formidable weaponry, encompassing advanced guns and a missile system guided by a multifaceted array of technologies, was thereby rendered a paramount imperative. These measures are now poised to function as a deterrent against any unforeseen threats and to promptly neutralize potential dangers that might arise during their exploratory endeavors. Thus, the weaponry serves as a pivotal safeguard, underscoring the commitment to mitigate risks and secure the success of their groundbreaking forays into the uncharted special region. The vessel's interior expanse is characterized by its generous dimensions, offering ample accommodation for crew quarters, storage facilities, and functional workspaces. This interior is ingeniously integrated with an array of laboratories and workspaces, meticulously designed to accommodate the diverse needs of scientists and researchers. Here, they can conduct intricate experiments and meticulously scrutinize their findings. The heart of the ship houses a central engineering nexus, complete with a pair of nuclear reactors, boasting a combined power output capable of sustaining a small city. This profusion of energy reserves bestows the vessel with an effectively boundless energy source, primed for prolonged missions at sea. 
the ship's utility is further magnified by a flight deck and hangar capable of hosting dual helicopters and an unmanned aerial vehicle, UEV, meticulously configured for surveillance and reconnaissance maneuvers. The onboard technology envisions the pinnacle of innovation, encompassing systems devised to monitor and govern propulsion, power generation, and other vital functionalities. Comprehensive apparatus and tools are also on hand for the upkeep and repair of these intricate systems. The Flying Dutchman embodies a sophisticated communication nexus, enabling seamless data interchange with prospective land-based installations. This communication prowess bestows the ship with an indispensable role in scientific exploration and research expeditions. Moreover, the vessel's architecture is engineered to withstand the rigors of inclement weather and surging waves, ensuring the well-being of its crew and safeguarding the integrity of its equipment during extended voyages. Notably, the ship also dedicates a capacious segment to crew habitation, inclusive of amenities such as a gym and recreational area, fostering elevated morale during protracted maritime journeys. Ship specifications. Length, 284 meters. Beam, 60 meters. Top speed, 35 knots. Comprising a cadre of exceptional engineers, technicians, and scientists, the ship's crew is meticulously assembled. This team is adept at operating and maintaining the vessel's state-of-the-art systems and equipment. At the helm of this ensemble stands Commander Deccan, an unflinching and valorous veteran skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Possessing a steadfast adherence to discipline and efficiency, Deccan is renowned for embodying an emotionless demeanor. Assisting him is Executive Officer Thomas McGregor, a strategic luminary acclaimed for his navigational acumen and planning prowess. He is vested with the responsibility of supervising the ship's operations and ensuring the seamless execution of tasks. Collectively, this accomplished cadre steers the Flying Dutchman toward its pioneering endeavors with unwavering resolve. At 6 p.m., the Flying Dutchman is now securely docked at the purpose-built pier, its prow directed toward the rift. Complementing this strategic alignment are the defenses meticulously established by the United Nations to preempt any potential threats emanating from the rift. The ship's indomitable crew, possessing a wealth of training and expertise, further augments its imposing presence. With these comprehensive fortifications, the Flying Dutchman emerges as a resolute force poised to confront any scenario with unwavering resolve. The crew now aboard is joined by a plethora of supplies and indispensable equipment, integral to their impending expedition into the special region. Commander Deccan, a paragon of leadership, queries how's the ship? The ship is in excellent condition, Commander, replied the Chief Engineer. And the crew is ready to depart as soon as you give the order. We have conducted all necessary checks and preparations for the journey ahead. Our escort is waiting on the other side. We are ready to set sail at your command. Commander Deck can acknowledge the Chief Engineer's update with a nod, subsequently initiating the ship's advance toward the rift. As the vessel crossed the threshold, a brilliant radiance enveloped the ship and its occupants bathing them in light. This dazzling illumination heralded their successful transit through the rift. With its dissipation, they emerged on the other side, greeted by the awaiting escort ship. Internally, jubilation reigned as the realization that they had penetrated the special region took hold. With exuberance coursing through them, the crews swiftly commenced their activities. Equipment was promptly arranged, and preparations for the initial stage of their mission began in earnest. Now, with the twin ships primed, they embarked upon the trajectory toward the uncharted territory. A potent amalgam of exhilaration and trepidation coursed through their ranks, underlining the gravity of their forthcoming odyssey, an odyssey poised to potentially reshape history. Their collective resolve was unwavering. They acknowledged the formidable journey and obstacles that lay ahead. Yet, propelled by determination, they stood resolute, ready to confront the unknown with steely determination. 2. Part 2 a deadly encounter with a modern ship. It was a cold, foggy afternoon that day. Why aren't we seeing any land? Asked one of the scientists in their group while staring at the sea ahead of them. The lead archaeologist smiled and replied, I'm sure Commander Deccan knows better. How can you be so confident about this? We've been sailing in the same direction for three weeks now. Why hasn't there been any land? There should be some islands or something along the way. I thought we were supposed to explore the new world said the second scientist. We are exploring the new world, but we also need to ensure that we don't harm the environment and the indigenous species that inhabit it, replied the first scientist. 
We have a responsibility to study and understand this new world without causing any irreversible damage. A few minutes later, something appeared on their radar. What do you think that is? Another scientist inquired. Send a UEV to investigate, said Commander Deccan. They were determined to proceed with caution. As the UEV flew towards the unknown object, they held their breath in anticipation of what they might discover. As the UEV got visuals on the object that was heading toward them, the captain orders the cruisers to prepare for any possible scenario, while the scientists frantically try to identify the unknown object on the video feed. As it gets into their visual range, they realize that it's unlike anything they've ever seen before. It's an old and battered merchant ship. The ship looked like it had just escaped from a Pirates of the Caribbean movie set. Well, I guess our trip to the New World just got a lot more interesting, said the first scientist with a sarcastic tone. Commander Deccan then ordered his crew to keep a close watch on the merchant ship and to be prepared for any eventuality. The scientists began to scan the ship with their tools, trying to glean any information they could about it and its crew. Commander Deccan then ordered his crew to keep a close watch on the merchant ship and to be prepared for any eventuality. The scientists began to scan the ship with their tools, trying to glean any information they could about it and its crew. Sir, we have received reports of human activity on the ship. The ship might not be a ghost ship or a pirate ship and might actually have a valid reason for being there, like being a merchant ship or a part of another scientific expedition. As the vessel slowly came into view, it was obvious that this was no ordinary merchant ship. At the helm, a figure with an eye patch, a bushy beard, and a sinister grin stood tall. The flag that flew from the mast was a menacing black, with a skull and crossbones boldly displayed. There was no mistaking it. This was a pirate ship, and it was headed straight for them. Don't fire the cannons just yet. They might be carrying expensive items, declared the pirate ship's captain. The pirate ship's captain was renowned for his astute business acumen, and he understood that using a strategic approach would yield greater rewards. What about the other ship? asked one of the captain's underlings, pointing at Queen Anne's revenge. We won't worry about the smaller ship. It isn't important to us. The bigger one might be carrying valuable cargo, replied the captain. To the pirates, it seemed like an easy target, just another vessel to plunder and pillage. But what they didn't know was that the modern ship was equipped with state-of-the-art technology and weaponry. Little did they know that the decision to attack this ship was actually a death wish. They also tried to establish communication with the merchant ship using one MC, one main circuit. This is the UN Expeditionary Force. I request that you immediately identify yourself and state your intentions, Commander Deccan said. The pirates scoffed at the attempt to communicate thinking it was just another feeble attempt to scare them off. They continued to approach the frigate, confident in their abilities to overcome any resistance. Commander Deccan frowned as he continued to observe the ship through his binoculars. The lack of response was concerning, and he couldn't shake the feeling that the man who was standing at the helm was up to something. Meanwhile, the crew of the UN Expeditionary Force remained on high alert, ready to defend themselves if necessary. As the tension grew, Commander Deccan sighed and made the decision. Commander Deccan ordered a warning shot to be fired towards the approaching enemy ships, hoping to deter them from any aggressive actions. The crew watched anxiously as the warning shot echoed across the ocean, waiting to see how the enemy would respond. Captain, their ship is sending us a warning shot, shouted one of the pirate's underlings. Keep on moving, it's only one cannon. The Flying Dutchman's cannon caught the attention of the captain of the pirate ship who initially mistook it for a piece of decor. He understood, though, that it wasn't just for show, as the warning shot impacted the water a few meters from their ship, thinking that reloading might take some time. But as the Flying Dutchman was now at the pirate's cannon range, the pirates were not messing around, and the situation had become more serious than he initially thought. He quickly ordered his men to prepare for battle and to man their own cannons. The crew of the Flying Dutchman knew that they had to act fast and efficiently to avoid being hit by the pirate's cannon fire. The Flying Dutchman, on the other hand, has a strong shell that allows it to easily resist hostile fire. According to data from the UAV launched two years ago and subsequent unmanned flights, most aquatic life appeared to have experienced some form of gigantism, which resulted in the loss of numerous UTVs, utility task vehicles. As a result, the military has created a new type of UTV that is fortified with tougher materials in order to survive attacks from these bigger aquatic monsters. 
This new technique has proven to be effective in subsequent operations, significantly reducing the number of UTV losses. This brings us to the Flying Dutchman, which is a trustworthy and tough ship for any off-world mission because it has also been reinforced with these strong materials. As the pirates fired their cannons, the Flying Dutchman effortlessly withstood the attacks. Thanks to its reinforced hull, the projectile only chipped its paint. The captain of the pirate ship flinched as he saw their attacks were ineffective against the Flying Dutchman's sturdy construction. Realizing their firepower didn't stand a chance against such a strong ship, he quickly ordered his crew to retreat. Knowing that continuing the battle would only lead to their defeat and possible capture by the enemy. Commander, the ship is getting away. Good. As the scientists heard that the pirate ship was retreating, they asked if they could capture them, knowing that they might give us information about this place and probably ask some questions. The commander thought for a moment and nodded in agreement, realizing that the scientist's plan could be beneficial to their mission. He ordered the crew to prepare for the pursuit and capture of the pirate ship. Hearing Commander Deccan's approval, the scientist gave a deviant smile. Back to the pirate ship, which is sailing away, oblivious to what is about to occur. One of the pirates who had just finished rigging the ship and took a little rest on top of the mast while looking at the two ships they're running from suddenly turned pale after. One of the ships slowly changed its course, locking to their ship. Sweat started to pour down his face, and he yelled, Captain, their ship is getting closer. He shouted in a panic-stricken voice, pointing his hand towards the ship. The captain calmly replied, We will not panic. Prepare the cannons and ready the crew for battle. The crew quickly followed his orders, determined to defend their ship. As the ship draws closer and closer, gaining speed and catching up to them, tension starts to build up among both sides of the crew, but they remain focused on their tasks, knowing that their lives and the safety of the ship depend on their actions. The captain of the pirate ship stands tall, watching the approaching ship with a steely gaze, ready to lead his crew into battle if necessary. He regretted approaching the ship in the first place and now knowing that their weapons are useless. He wonders if there is any way to negotiate a peaceful resolution and avoid capture, but he knows that ultimately the decision lies with the captain of the other ship. How's the pirate ship's crew? asked Commander Deccan while sitting on the captain's chair. Chair in the middle of the bridge of a ship, from which the captain of the ship controls the ship and gives orders to the crew. The chair is typically located in the center of the bridge so that the captain has a good view of all of the ship's controls and instruments. The chair is also often equipped with a communication system so that the captain can communicate with other ships or shore stations. They are expecting us to board their ship. They are currently preparing for a fight, replied Lieutenant McCredger. I suggest we approach with caution and be prepared for any unexpected moves. The Flying Dutchman is now beside the pirate ship. The Flying Dutchman was so big that the pirates had to look up to see its deck. But just as the Flying Dutchman is about to board the pirate ship, a voice booms out from the ship's loudspeaker. This is Commander Deccan of the Flying Dutchman. I request your immediate surrender and cooperation. Any resistance will be met with force. The captain glances up at their ship, noticing a dark figure bending down to them and waving his hand as if greeting them. The guy above was Lieutenant McCredger along with a team of armed men dressed in hazmat suits behind him, waiting for orders, carrying a shotgun with beanbag rounds. It's a non-lethal round. Also ick what kind of shotgun they're using. Just use your imagination. Fire the cannons, shouted the pirate ship's commander, sending a hail of cannonballs at the ship at point-blank range. Smoke began to pour from the barrel. Lieutenant McCredger exhaled and rested his palm on his forehead when the smoke had cleared. What were these idiots thinking? Lieutenant said to himself, tiredly, there were no dents. Only cannonball marks were visible. Look, Lieutenant McCredger is here to save the day. His magical forehead palm resting technique is sure to protect us from any harm. And what do you know? It worked. There are no dents on our ship. Only small, insignificant cannonball marks. Way to go, Lieutenant. You truly are the hero we need, one of the lieutenant's men said quietly trying his best to hold his laughter with the rest. Damage report? asked Commander Deacon. No damage or noticeable dents, sir. Good, return fire. Make sure to disable their mast and don't harm the crew. Dr. Sarah wants them alive for her experiments. All right, boys. It looks like the doctors has some interesting plans for those poor enemy sailors. I wonder what kind of experiments she has in mind. Well, 
As long as we can disable their masts without causing too much harm, we'll be able to put on quite the show for our resident mad scientist. And hey, at least Commander Soanso can take comfort in the fact that his ship remains insignificantly marked by cannonballs. Cheers to that, said the gunner. The flying Dutchman then slowly distanced itself from the pirate ship so that it could aim precisely at the mast. Captain, their ship is slowly moving away, shouted one of the pirate underlings. The tension on the pirate ship rose as they watched the flying Dutchman's negative 45 Malawian Quatch's gun battery started to turn towards the pirate ship. The captain of the pirate ship quickly realized the danger and ordered his crew to steer the ship away as fast as possible. However, it was too late, as the enemy ship's cannon fired a precise shot that hit one of the three masts, causing it to collapse onto the deck of the pirate ship, permanently disabling it. Seeing what the damage had done to his ship, his sweat started to pour down on his face. The captain knew that they were in a dire situation and needed to act fast. They quickly gathered their crew and began discussing their plans. One of the pirate's underlings suggested surrender, realizing that escape would only lead to certain death. The pirate captain responded I didn't become a pirate to surrender. We will fight until the end and make them regret ever crossing our path. The pirate crew prepared for their last stand as the flying Dutchman approached. They knew it was a fight they couldn't win, but they were determined to go down fighting. The captain rallied his men and gave them a fiery speech, urging them to give it their all. Men, we may be outnumbered and outgunned, but we are pirates. We do not surrender, and we do not back down. Today, we fight for our pride and our freedom. I need each and every one of you to give it your all. Together, we can make a stand. We may not be remembered for centuries to come. You know that our end promises us a glorious death in battle. But it is not just about dying for a cause. It is about living with honor and fighting for what we believe in, no matter the cost. So, raise your swords high and let's show them what true pirates are made of. With a resounding cheer from his crew, the pirate captain led the charge, planning to ram the ship towards their inevitable fate. As the enemy ship closed in, the pirates readied their weapons and braced for impact. It was do or die time and they were ready to make their stand as their ship began to slow down. But just as the enemy ship was about to collide with theirs, the enemy ship conducted evasive maneuvers, avoiding the collision by mere inches. The crew let out a sigh of relief as they continued their pursuit of the enemy ship, ready for whatever challenges lay ahead. The crew knew that they had to be prepared for any sudden moves by the enemy ship. They tightened their grip on their weapons and kept a watchful eye on the enemy's every move. Looks like we pissed them off, Commander Deccan growled as he watched the enemy ship narrowly avoid collision with their own. The crew of the pirate ship braced themselves for the inevitable retaliation, but they were determined to show their worth as true pirates. They readied their weapons and kept a watchful eye on the enemy ship, knowing that they had to be prepared for any sudden moves. The chase continued, with both ships locked in a deadly dance of pursuit and evasion. But the pirates were not about to give up. They would fight until their last breath, if need be. Sir, they're heading toward us again. Wait, they're not firing their cannons, shouted the captain's underlings. How interesting, shouted the captain, who is now filled with adrenaline. The pirates glee at the flying Dutchman that is now sailing too close to them now sees men in fire hoses. It is called boarding defense. It is a non-lethal way to deter or stop pirates from boarding a ship. The flying Dutchman's crew then sprayed them with high-pressure water on the deck. The force of the water was enough to knock down an unfortunate pirate who was standing in its way. Some were thrown overboard by the powerful jet of water, while others were lucky enough to quickly retreat inside their ship. This method has been proven effective against pirates in their world. Let's go, men! shouted Lieutenant McCredger as he wore his mask, an M50 full-face mask, while repelling down to the enemy ship with his men. One of the men throws a flashbang. Even though it's overkill, it's an effective way of disorienting the pirates and gaining the upper hand in the fight with a foe with unknown abilities. As one of the pirate crew members who has animal-like features starts covering his cat-like ears after the flash bang goes off, McCredger takes advantage of the distraction and charges forward to engage in close combat, choosing to punch the huge sucker in the face instead of shooting him, knocking it to the ground instantly. Two more men attacked from behind, holding cutlasses, but were knocked down by his men with their gun, non-lethal, knocking three more ruffians down. Another pirate dashed towards them but was blown away by the water, 
which sprayed them with high-pressure water on the deck. The deck was now empty, and the others had retreated inside the ship. They damn well know that they're walking into a trap, but they have no choice but to continue forward and face the consequences. They tightened their grip on their weapons and prepared for the inevitable confrontation. Two pirates were now waiting for them to come inside. Then a flashbang entered the room, disorienting the two pirates, who were then knocked down with their guns. The captain can clearly hear his crew shouting battle cries, only to be interrupted by multiple loud bangs. The sound drew closer and closer. The captain is grateful for his mother's teachings as he channels his magical energy into his hands, creating an orb of lightning as he waits for them to come. As the captain waits for the impending battle, his mind drifts back to his past. He remembers the lessons his mother taught him about controlling his magical energy and using it to defend himself and others. He thinks about the times he had to fight off bullies in his youth, always finding a non-lethal way to subdue them. Now, as he faces yet another battle, he hopes that he can continue to use his skills in a way that honors his past and protects his crew. Remembering how he lost his mom fighting in a pirate raid and how he was captured and forced to become a pirate himself, the captain is determined to use his magic to rise through the ranks and become a powerful force to be reckoned with. He knows that by using his abilities, he can lead his crew to victory and earn the respect of his peers. As the sound of approaching footsteps grows louder, the captain closes his eyes and focuses on his magic, feeling it surge through him like a wave. The captain feels a surge of sadness and anger. He pushes aside the emotions, knowing that he needs to stay focused on the present moment. The captain feels a sense of pride, knowing that he is honoring his mother's memory by using his powers. Even though he is a notorious pirate, he has his own plan. Remembering his mother's advice to always use his skills for good, he sets his sights on becoming the greatest pirate captain to ever sail the seas. He knows that with determination, hard work, and a touch of magic, anything is possible. As he prepares for battle, he takes a moment to reflect on how far he has come and how much he has yet to achieve. With his mother's wisdom guiding him, he feels confident that he can overcome any obstacle that comes his way. But as the battle rages on, the captain suddenly hears his mother's voice in his mind saying, Don't. He hesitates for a moment, wondering if he should continue fighting. But he knows that this is what he must do to protect his crew and their quest for treasure. He pushes aside the doubt and presses on, using his powers to defeat their enemies. As the fighting subsides, he feels a twinge of guilt for ignoring his mother's warning. But he knows that sometimes you have to take risks and make tough choices in order to achieve your goals. McCredger gestures for them to follow him as they make their way deeper into the ship's interior. Finally reaching the door, he takes a deep breath and opens it, hoping that what lies behind it will be worth the risk. As the door creaks open, McCredger's heart races with anticipation. The captain of the pirate ship was now standing in front of him, glaring with a menacing look. McCredger knew that this was the moment of truth, and he had to act fast. The captain sees the men dressed in strange yellow armor, hazmat suits, and without warning, he fired a magic bolt of lightning, hitting McCredger. McCredger was knocked to the ground, still conscious but in immense pain, as if he had been punched in the gut. To his surprise, McCredger was shocked to see that the pirate had magic, something he had only seen in TV shows and movies. He realized that this was going to be a much tougher fight than he had anticipated. Another bolt of lightning hit Lieutenant's men, but one of his men was lucky and was able to shoot the pirate's arm with a beanbag round, bruising the pirate and causing him to drop his hand but it did not stop him from throwing another blow. The captain tries again and again, but to no avail. Most of McCredger's men are still standing, even though in pain, they are now in a deadlock. Both sides determined to win the fight and unwilling to back down. The pirate got down on his knees and cried sadly. That spell was enough to kill a normal being, he whispered to himself. He remembers his mother's voice saying don't, and now he has paid the price for it. McCredger approached him and extended his hand holding a handcuff. The defeated pirate reluctantly accepted his fate and allowed McCredger to cuff him. He had underestimated his opponent, and now he had to face the consequences of his actions. As they led him away, the pirate couldn't help but feel a sense of shame for his defeat. What were you guys thinking? asked McCredger while dragging him to the deck of his own ship. As he got out of his ship, he was shocked to see that all of his crew was alive and there were no casualties. He saw men being tied down to the broken mast. 
He felt a sense of relief knowing that all of his crew was safe, but couldn't help feeling embarrassed and humiliated for being defeated. Forgive me, my men, he said. I have failed you, he admitted. But the crew forgave him, understanding that their food was nearly depleted and that it was not entirely his fault. In fact, they were relieved to be rescued and grateful to have their captain back. It was a humbling experience for the once arrogant pirate captain, but he knew he had learned a valuable lesson and would never underestimate the sea or his opponent again. 2. Part 3 Capture Who are these pirates? asked one of lieutenant's men while collecting blood samples from the tied-down pirates on the deck. The lieutenant sighed and said, they're just a bunch of small-time crooks trying to make a quick buck. But they picked the wrong ship to mess with this time. He looked out at the vast ocean, remembering the battle that had just taken place. We'll need to stay vigilant though. There are always more out there looking for trouble. He watched as his men carefully extracted the blood, knowing that they needed to check for any possible diseases or infections before bringing them on board their own ship. As the blood samples were being taken, Dr. Sarah's urgent call came through, requesting the presence of the pirate captain. The lieutenant quickly relayed the message and they all waited anxiously for his response. It was a strange request, but they knew better than to question Dr. Sarah's orders. Maybe we can finally convince them that pineapple does belong on pizza. The lieutenant cracked a smile at his own humorous thought as they continued to assess the captured pirates. One of his men chuckled and asked, What's the deal with pineapple on pizza anyway? The lieutenant replied with a grin, Oh, it's just a cheesy joke. But hey, Maybe if we offer it to these guys as a peace offering, they'll spill some information. Everyone laughed at the lieutenant's pizza joke, momentarily forgetting the serious situation they were in. The pirates, who were watching the conversation from a distance, were puzzled by the mention of pineapple on pizza, not knowing what it was or even meant, but decided to keep a close eye on the lieutenant and his crew. One of the men in hazmat suits looked down at one of the pirates with cat-like ears, the one that was punched in the face by McCredger. My God, are those real? He whispered to his colleague, referring to the pirate's unusual physical feature. The other man shrugged and replied, No wonder why Dr. Sarah wants to study them. They're fascinating beings. The pirate with the cat-like ears overheard the conversation and pretended to ignore it. Yeah, cat rears are cute, but have you seen those maids wearing cat ears? Asked another hazmat guy, changing the topic. The rest of the team looked at him confused. What are you talking about? One of them asked, oh, you know, those anime maids with cat ears and tails. They're all over the internet, he explained. The pirates continued to observe from a distance, wondering what kind of strange conversation they had stumbled upon. He had grown tired of people staring and making comments about his appearance, but he couldn't deny that he was proud of his unique trait. Hey, we were supposed to be keeping an eye on them. This is not an anime convention shouted one of the men wearing a hazmat. Ha oh, the furries are going nuts if they hear this one, joked the hazmat guy, earning a few chuckles from the rest of the team. The pirates, still watching from afar, exchanged confused glances. Were they speaking some kind of secret code? They couldn't quite figure out what anime is or what maids with cat ears had to do with anything. But one thing was for sure, these hazmat guys weren't your average bunch. One of the hazmat guys looked down at the pirate with cat-like rears and asked, Hello, uh, do you understand me? What do you expect me to say? Meow, the pirate replied. Suddenly, a brief silence fell over the group. The hazmat guy looked at the pirate with cat-like ears. The confusion among the pirates only grew as they watched the hazmat guys, confused to hear the pirates reply in perfect English. They were shocked that they all spoke the same language. Hoa hey hey hey, you speak English, asked the hazmat guy, who laughed in disbelief. In the special region, English is the common language, which surprised the hazmat guy in the conversation. Even the pirate with cat-like ears replied in perfect English, causing confusion and shock among the group. It seemed that speaking English was essential for communication in this region. The hazmat guy couldn't help but chuckle at the absurdity of it all. Here he was, dressed head to toe in a protective suit, talking to a group of pirates who looked like they belonged in a fantasy novel. He couldn't wait to tell his colleagues about the unexpected language barrier they had encountered on their mission. As the group continued to converse, they suddenly heard a voice and saw Dr. Sarah arriving by boat. Her sudden arrival surprised everyone, causing a momentary pause in their conversation. Hey guys, I hate to interrupt your fantastical chat, 
But I'm going to need y'all to give me some of those sweet, sweet blood samples, said Dr. Sarah with a grin on her face. Well, they can't really see her face since she's wearing a hazmat suit, but they can hear the amusement in her voice. The hazmat guy couldn't believe how nonchalantly she asked for blood samples in such a humorous way. But as soon as the pirates heard her voice, they were in awe. Her voice was like a siren's call, a maiden to pirates wonder. Her voice was like a siren's call, a maiden to pirates wonder. Even inside her hazmat suit, Dr. Sarah's voice carried a captivating beauty that left the pirates enchanted. The hazmat guy couldn't help but notice the awe in their eyes. Dr. Sarah's appearance was met with both relief and excitement, as they had been waiting for her blood samples for research. Hey everyone, sorry to keep you waiting, she said as she boarded the pirate ship. I've got the blood samples you've been craving for research, said Lieutenant McCredger while giving Sarah a pat on the back. She added it with a smirk. The hazmat guys couldn't help but laugh at the irony of their situation. Here they were, in this strange land, communicating in English and eagerly awaiting blood samples from a pirate crew. It was certainly a unique experience for all involved. Hey lady, what are you going to do with our blood? asked another pirate. Dr. Sarah's smile widened as she looked at the pirate, her hazmat suit adding a mysterious allure to her already captivating beauty. Oh, don't you worry about that, she replied with a devious glint in her eye. I'm sure I'll find some creative uses for it. The pirates exchanged nervous glances, unsure if they should be excited or terrified by her answer. The pirate was watching from a distance, still processing what happened during their capture. It all happened so quickly. The hazmat team stormed onto the ship and took control before anyone could react. Now they were all being held captive, waiting to be prodded and poked by the strange needle-like equipment. But one thing they knew for sure. His spell wasn't going to work on these hazmat guys. Dr. Sarah finally approached their captain, and the atmosphere shifted suddenly. The captain felt a sense of unease as Dr. Sarah approached. She finally stood in front of him, standing close enough that he could see a glimpse of her face inside the hazmat suit. He couldn't read her expression through the thick material, but he could sense that she was studying him closely. Her eyes were a piercing blue, sensing no magic in her. He couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off about her and her team. The lack of magic made him feel uncanny, as if they were not of this world. She suddenly grabbed a knife from her belt, and the captain tensed up, thinking that she was going to cut his throat. She, on the other hand, used the knife to cut the rope that was tied to him. Is it really a good idea to free him? I mean, he just electrocuted us with his hand as if he were Emperor Palpatine himself, and now we're just letting him go. This is why I never wanted to be a part of the hazmat cleanup crew. Too much danger, not enough common sense. The hazmat guy warned her about the captain's dangerous abilities, but she seemed determined to help him anyway, as she cut the rope and freed him. The captain was in shock and confused as Dr. Sarah cut the rope that bound him. He couldn't understand why she would do this after approaching him with such an unsettling presence. We need your help, she said firmly, her voice commanding attention. The captain hesitated for a moment before nodding in agreement, realizing that Dr. Sarah was not someone to be taken lightly. What do you need help with? The captain asked, trying to hide his unease. Come with us, Dr. Sarah replied, gesturing towards the door. We are not from this world, Dr. Sarah continued, and we have reason to believe, and we need someone to help us navigate through them safely. The captain's curiosity was piqued, but he couldn't shake the feeling that this was all a prank or some kind of elaborate joke. Dr. Sarah's desperation, on the other hand, made him pause. We also overheard from one of your crew members that you were once a skilled navigator. When the captain's previous profession was mentioned, his heart skipped a beat. Yes, he used to be a navigator. He still utilizes his abilities for piracy and smuggling now, and he wasn't sure whether he could aid these strangers. He weighed the risks of revealing his past, and decided to keep it to himself for now. Instead, he nodded and changed the subject, hoping they wouldn't press him further. Very well, he answered calmly. I will help you, but I will have to learn more about you and your intentions before I commit further. The captain was determined to play it cautiously, knowing that these strangers might be violent if crossed. He would be on high alert until he had a clearer grasp of their motivations. That's fine, said Dr. Sarah. We don't want to make any quick decisions just yet. We only came here for one purpose. To find out more about your world, study it, see how it works, and gather as much information as possible, Dr. Sarah said with a smile. 
We are also here to learn more information about you and the people of this world and hopefully establish a mutually beneficial relationship. She paused for a moment before proceeding, and in order to do that, we need to understand you and other people's culture, beliefs, and values. So please, don't hesitate to share with us anything you think we should know. The captain was shocked at Dr. Sarah's response. He had expected them to be more hostile and defensive, but instead they seemed genuinely interested in learning about their world. He cautiously agreed to share information with them, still on high alert for any signs of aggression. However, the captain was still skeptical. He wanted proof that they were truly from another world before sharing any sensitive information. I appreciate your interest in our world, but he said, raising his finger. Before we can proceed any further, I need some proof that you are indeed from another world. Can you provide any evidence to support your claim? Was your major capture of your ship and crew not enough for you to believe us? Dr. Sarah's tone suddenly shifted, her eyes narrowing as she leaned forward. The hazmat team stood by, watching the interaction between the captain and Dr. Sarah with keen interest. One team member whispered to another, looks like the captain needs a bit more convincing. Another smirked and said maybe we should get our revenge for electrocuting us with his pirate magic thing and show him what it tasted like being tossed in the nuts. The hazmat team continued laughing. The captain looked at Dr. Sarah with a raised eyebrow, considering her words carefully. How did you even get here? He asked, ignoring the antics of the hazmat team. I need to understand how you people from another world have arrived in our world. Dr. Sarah took a deep breath and began to explain the details of their journey hoping that it would be enough to convince the skeptical captain. We are from a world where we live in a complex and multifaceted world with both scientific and technological advancements and global challenges. Until we found some sort of portal that led to this world, which we believe to be a parallel universe. The discovery of the rift has led to renewed interest in its potential implications, leading us to explore and interact with different kingdoms and even nations in this world. We have already made some important discoveries and established diplomatic relations with a few leaders. However, we are still learning about the political dynamics of this world and hoping to navigate any challenges that arise in our interactions. We understand that our story may sound unbelievable, but we assure you that we are not here to cause harm or disrupt your way of life. We simply wish to learn more about this world and find a way back to our own. You mean the ancestral rift? Asked the captain. What ancestral rift? Dr. Sarah was shocked at the sudden mention of the Ancestral Rift. She had never heard of it before and wondered if it was related to the portal that brought them to this world. She quickly composed herself and asked the captain to explain more about it, hoping to gain some insight. I only heard rumors about it, the captain began. But from what I understand, the Ancestral Rift is a magical gateway that connects our world to other realms. It's said that those who possess the knowledge to open it must have the ancient bloodline passed down from the first mages who created it many millennia ago. It's also said that it was the ancestral rift that later introduced us to monsters like goblins and demi-humans, like one of my crew in the past. The rift was opened hundreds of millennia ago by the ancients, who have long since disappeared, leaving behind only legends and myths. And what are the ancients? asked Dr. Sarah, intrigued by the mention of these mysterious beings. The ancients are thought to be an ancient human civilization that existed before our time. Some believe they had a deep understanding of how magic worked and created many magical relics and artifacts that have been lost to time, the captain answered. Did somebody talk about ancient relics? Another person dressed in hazmat gear entered the room. Sorry for interrupting, but I couldn't resist. As an archaeologist, ancient relics are of great interest to me. I mean, who wouldn't want to uncover the secrets of the past? Ah, I almost forgot. This is Dr. Kyle, one of our lead archaeologists, said Dr. Sarah. Dr. Kyle then began inspecting the ship's interior and taking pictures of the artifacts. From what I can see, this ship dates back to the 15th century and is crafted from sturdy oak timbers reinforced with iron braces. As an archaeologist, I marveled at the incarnate carvings adorning the ship's prow and stern. There were carvings of vines and some sort of mythical creatures, possibly sea monsters. But back to the matter at hand, it seems that you have stolen this magnificent vessel, asked Dr. Kyle. Well, I guess he just couldn't resist the allure of such a fine ship, the captain replied with a grin. But I must say, he's got some guts to steal something like this. So where did you steal it from? Dr. Kyle asked, trying to gather more information about the ship's origins. The captain chuckled. It's a funny story, really. 
I was out on a joy ride in my own little sailboat when I stumbled upon this beauty just sitting there with no one guarding it. So I figured, why not take it for a spin? And here we are. Dr. Kyle shook his head in disbelief but couldn't help but smile at the audacity of the captain's actions. Sir, we're ready to leave, one of lieutenant's men then interrupted. Good also, bring aboard one of the captain's men, Dr. Sarah said. Which one? asked one of lieutenant's men. The one with cat ears the lieutenant's men exchanged confused glances but quickly followed Dr. Sarah's orders. As the demi-human was brought aboard, Dr. Sarah administered a sedative to put him to sleep. The captain looked on in shock as his crew member was peacefully put to rest, realizing he may have underestimated the seriousness of the situation. Dr. Sarah then looks at their captain with unease. Don't worry, she sighed. He will wake up soon and be just fine. Dr. Sarah, what about my men? And my ship? The captain worriedly questioned as he made his way to the inflatable boat that Dr. Sarah had used to get to their ship. Dr. Sarah turned to the captain and assessed the state of the ship. Your ship can still sail, barely, she replied. We freed one of your men. Hopefully he will free the others and do the necessary repairs to keep the ship afloat. As for you, captain, we need to have some tests done to ensure there are no biohazards present before we board you onto our vessel. We cannot risk any contamination or spread of disease. Oh, wonderful, the captain responded with a hint of sarcasm. I was hoping to be stuck here with no crew and a dying ship while undergoing some invasive medical tests. Thank you for your concern, doctor. The captain was then suddenly surprised by the acceleration of the boat he was sitting on, stumbled, and almost fell. He quickly regained his balance and looked around, surprised at how fast the boat was moving. It was faster than any rowboat he had ever been on. Despite the captain's suspicion, he couldn't sense any spells or magic on the boat or feel any strange energies around him. The doctor smiled. Don't worry, captain. This boat may not look like much, but it's built to outrun any pursuing beasts. You'll be on our ship in no time. The captain watched as the boat picked up even more speed, cutting through the water like a knife. Despite his initial skepticism, he couldn't help but feel a sense that these people truly were from another world. He wondered what other marvels they had in store for him as he embarked on this unexpected journey. As the boat continued to sail towards the Flying Dutchman, the captain saw the huge ship in the distance, and he could make out the hazmat-suited figures on its deck. He knew that he had to be careful and follow their instructions if he wanted to survive this encounter. As they approached the ship, the captain took a deep breath and prepared himself for whatever lay ahead. He stepped onto the well deck and was immediately greeted by the hazmat guys, who led him inside. He couldn't help but feel a sense of unease as he followed them deeper into the ship, wondering what kind of situation he was getting himself into. Meanwhile, Commander Deccan was looking through the ship's deck with his binoculars, observing the pirate ship's movements, when one of his crewmen approached him and said, Sir, what is it? He asked. One of our UAV's radars picked up a landmass, sir, the crewman reported also reported strange energy and radiation readings, and it seems to be moving. This caught Commander Deccan's attention. He immediately ordered the crew to investigate and gather more data on this unusual occurrence. As they sailed closer to the land mass, the readings became even stronger, confirming that there was indeed something significant happening in that area. The commander couldn't help but wonder what secrets this mysterious island held and what dangers they might face as they approached it. Two. Part 4 Island As the hazmat guys led him inside the ship, the pirate captain couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. Meanwhile, Commander Deccan got word of some strange energy and radiation readings detected by one of the UAVs. He immediately ordered his crew to investigate and gather more data on the unusual occurrence. As they sailed closer, the readings became even stronger, confirming that there was indeed something significant happening in that area. Sir, he has arrived. The captain turned to see his lieutenant, McCredger, standing at attention. Report, he commanded. The lieutenant saluted and replied, We have successfully brought the pirate captain aboard, sir. He is currently in custody and awaiting further testing for any biohazards he may have brought on board. We are taking all necessary precautions to ensure the safety of the crew and prevent any potential contamination. Meanwhile, the captain was sent to the ship's laboratory for investigation and decontamination. The captain arrived in an odd white chamber filled with odd instruments and substances. Uncertain as to what these were or what they could do, Dr. Sarah finally began examining him, starting with the pupillary light reflex. 
She shone a light into his eyes and observed his pupils contracting and dilating in response. The pirate captain looked around the white chamber with confusion and apprehension. He bristled as Dr. Sarah approached him, shining a bright light in his eyes. She spoke softly, but her sharp gaze made him uneasy. What are you doing? He growled, trying to back away from her probing fingers. The crew watched anxiously from outside the lab as Dr. Sarah worked on the captive captain. She ignored his question and continued her examination, jotting down notes on her clipboard while the captain squirmed in discomfort. The pirate captain felt embarrassed and vulnerable as he was put under intense scrutiny by Dr. Sarah. Hey hey, calm down, one of the hazmat guys called out. He could see that the pirate captain was getting agitated and wanted to defuse the tension. Dr. Sarah looked up from her clipboard, her expression stern, as she addressed the hazmat guy. She then looks back at the pirate captain and says, The results seem normal. Despite your appearance, you seem to be in good health. However, we are still going to have to cuff your hands for safety reasons. I'm sorry, we don't want any pirate magic messing with our equipment. The hazmat guy steps forward with a pair of handcuffs in his gloved hands and gestures for the pirate captain to comply. With a deep sigh, the captain reluctantly extends his hands out in front of him as he is cuffed and brought to the bridge. Walking through the insides of the ship made of steel, the hazmat guy led the pirate captain towards the bridge. The sound of their footsteps echoed loudly against the metal walls as they made their way through the narrow corridors. Dr. Sarah followed closely behind, her eyes scanning the pirate captain's movements. As they reached the bridge, the pirate was struck by the number of crew members working in such a compact area, as well as the level of coordination and communication necessary to keep the ship functioning properly. He was also amazed by contemporary ship's alien navigational devices. In the middle of the ship stood Commander Deccan, a young, cold person showing no emotions. He glanced up at the arrival of the pirate captain but otherwise remained stoic and expressionless. The hazmat guy explained the situation to Commander Deccan, who simply nodded in response. The pirate captain couldn't help but feel intimidated by the commander's lack of emotion and wondered what kind of person could lead such a disciplined crew. Commander Deccan extends his hand and introduces himself to the pirate captain, breaking the tense silence. Welcome aboard, he said firmly. I am Commander Deccan. The commander turned to the pirate captain and asked, Do you know these waters well? We could use a guide. The pirate captain grinned at the thought of leading this prestigious vessel. I know these waters like the back of my hand, he said confidently. I can guide you safely to your destination. Commander Deccan nodded in approval. Excellent. We could use your expertise, he said, and he motioned for the pirate to follow him to the navigation room. The hazmat guy looked relieved that they had finally found someone who could help them navigate through dangerous waters. The pirate captain, impressed by the commander's authoritative presence, shook his hand and introduced himself as well. My name is Samuel Stormborn, also known as Captain Tempest. So you're an authority of this ship, and I must admit I'm amazed and tense with how quickly you seized my ship without any deaths. He smirked. However, even though he was impressed with Deccan, Samuel Stormborn couldn't shake off the fact that the commander was younger than him and still seemed disturbed. We're just doing our job, replied the captain with a slight nod. But I must say, your crew put up quite a fight. It's the first time my men have encountered such skilled opponents. The commander's attempt to ease the tension between them was evident in his tone. Samuel chuckled and replied, We're not ones to go down without a fight but I suppose that's what makes us pirates. As they worked together to navigate the treacherous waters, both the pirate captain and the commander knew they were using each other for their own gain. However, despite their underlying motives, they remained professional and worked well together. Samuel Stoneborn was grateful for the opportunity to showcase his skills, while Commander Deccan was pleased to have found someone who could guide them safely through unfamiliar waters. Finally reaching their destination. That island looks deserted, said one of the scientists on board the ship as Commander Deccan and his crew continued to close in on the mysterious land mass. The commander looked out towards the island and couldn't see any signs of life or activity. However, with the strange energy and radiation readings, they knew there was more to this island than meets the eye. As they came closer, everyone on board could feel a sense of unease wash over them, wondering what kind of secrets and dangers lay ahead. But the pirate knew the place. Captain Stormborn had been to this island before. 
There are rumors about it containing an ancient relic that is valuable to kingdoms that would love to get their hands on it. Little of what they found there years ago was just ancient ruins, even though he sensed a strong amount of mana emanating from the island, even going as far as searching every inch of the island but failing like the others before him. Sir, one sonar technician said while looking at Commander Dekken. What is it? Commander Dekken asked, turning to face the crewman. You have to see this, the crewman replied, pointing to his screen the captain peered over the crewman's shoulder and found it disturbing. No wonder other kingdoms wanted it so badly. The island itself is the relic. This changes everything, the captain said, turning pale and realizing what he was told to find years ago was just right in front of him. The sonar screen was showing massive limbs connected to the island, and the other appeared to be a tail. It was not connected to any part of the land mass under the ocean. The crewman looked at the captain with concern and asked, What now, sir? Commodore Deccan, unhinged by the situation, turned to the crewman, calmly saying, We need to report this to headquarters immediately. We cannot take any chances with this relic. Prepare a detailed report with all the information we have gathered so far. He now turns to Captain Tempest, who is also shocked by what he saw. Captain Tempest, from what the rumors say, does this island possess destructive powers on a massive scale? And are there more of these things lying around? Commander Dekken asked. Yes, there are more of these things in all shapes and sizes. But most of the things were either destroyed or ran out of mana. Which is why these relics have been around for so long. Possibly even longer than our recorded history. Captain Tempest spoke with awe and fear in his voice. The crew could feel the tension building as they realized the immense power that rested beneath the ocean's surface. The thought of what could happen if this power fell into the wrong hands sent shivers down their spines. You're saying that this thing has been inactive since it was discovered? Commander Deacon asked. Captain Tempest merely nodded, still in shock. He couldn't believe what he had just seen. The knowledge he acquired from these unusual folks was startling. They had discovered a massive secret in such a short period of time. He knew not to cross these individuals. From his vantage point... His captors were clearly extremely clever and capable of discovering secrets that even he was ignorant of. Despite being kept captive, he couldn't deny his admiration for their capabilities. He realized it would be a mistake to underestimate them. Good, well, send a team to that island, said the young commander, breaking the silence. We need to gather any information about it, and make sure to send our best operatives. We can't afford any mistakes. Take me as well, Captain Tempest said, you might need a guide. As I told you I'd been on that island years ago. The question was raised, is it a good idea to take him? However, Captain Tempest insisted that he should accompany them, as he had been on the island before and could act as their guide. Despite his admiration for his captor's capabilities. Good, we will need that kind of expertise, Captain, said Commander Deccan. You can now rest and wait for further instructions while we proceed with the mission. Captain Tempest nodded in agreement and stepped back feeling a sense of relief that he could finally take a break from the strenuous task of leading the team. He watched as Commander Deccan and his crew returned to their respective stations, ready to carry out their assigned tasks with precision and efficiency. Moments later, he was back at the ship's laboratory with the people who were guarding him during his capture, now wearing their standard uniform. As Captain Tempest looked around at the soldiers guarding him, he couldn't help but compare them to the well-disciplined soldiers he had observed in his past experiences. Their stance and attention to detail were astounding, and he couldn't dispute that they were a formidable force. He wondered if these warriors would be as effective as the others he'd seen, but he knew Commander Deccan wouldn't have picked them if they weren't up to the task. Dr. Sarah and her crew met Captain Tempest. Ah, uh, welcome, Captain, she responded, smiling. Captain Tempest was taken aback when she saw Dr. Sarah without her hazmat suit, revealing her beautiful blonde hair and piercing blue eyes. He couldn't help but be captivated by her mesmerizing glance, which seemed to pierce his heart. Captain Tempest was curiously reassured by the sight of her eyes, despite his current circumstances. What is it? he asked, trying to hide his fascination with her appearance. Sarah replied calmly, I have completed the tests on your other friend here. She pointed at his demi-human crew tied down in stasis with restraints. And the results? He asked, his attention now fully on his crewmen in restraints. Sarah's face became solemn as she gave him a clipboard containing the test results. He simply stated, I can't read it. This is a completely different language. I'm familiar with some of the letters, but I don't recognize the majority of them. 
Sarah completely forgot they were from a different world and was embarrassed as she began to convey the results to him in a way he would understand. He is perfectly healthy and in good condition, she stated. Captain Tempest breathed a sigh of relief, grateful for the good news about his crewmen. He couldn't help but feel impressed with Dr. Sarah's professionalism and competence, even as he tried to ignore the attraction he felt towards her. As they continued their conversation, moments later, the demi-human slowly wakes up and groggily looks around the room, confused and disoriented. He is being held in a bright cell, wearing different clothes. Sarah and the other scientists are observing him from behind a two-way mirror. Ah, you're finally awake, said his captain, sitting next to him. Captain? The demi-human muttered, still trying to make sense of his surroundings. What is it? asked the captain. Where am I? he asked, looking around confused. The captain let out a sigh and explained that he had made a deal with Commander Deccan to spare his crew in exchange for his cooperation. I see, and what about the others? He asked. They got lucky, the captain replied. Commander Deccan freed them, and our ship was barely able to sail. His men freed one of our crew. Hopefully he will free the others and do the necessary repairs enough for them to get back to the mainland. Suddenly, Dr. Sarah enters the room gesturing for Captain Tempest to come outside the room. The captain sighed as he stood. Wait for me here, Claude, he instructed Demi-Human before following Dr. Sarah out of the room. Demi-Human watched him go, feeling uneasy about being left alone in an unfamiliar place. He decided to follow the captain's orders as he nodded and waited patiently for his return. We're done with the preparations. The helicopter is ready to take us to the island, said Dr. Sarah as they walked through the narrow hallways of the ship while being escorted by the same two people that were part of the hazmat team. Helicopter? I thought we would be using the boat from before? The captain asked in confusion. Not knowing what a helicopter is, we're bringing more people to that island, Captain. The boat can only carry less equipment and move slower, so it's not ideal for this situation. And what's a helicopter? That, said Dr. Sarah as they finally reached the flight deck. Captain Tempest looked up and noticed the massive machine. While unusual people wore bizarre clothing on the flight deck, he could tell their clotting was not made of leather since it was brightly colored and plainly apparent. Some of them were wearing head protection and what seemed to be heavy boots while preparing the aircraft. What he saw was a Sikorsky S-92 helicopter. Hey, be careful with my equipment. Dr. Kyle shouted at the workers who were loading the excavation tools onto the helicopter. Oh, sorry, Dr. Kyle. We'll be sure to treat your precious excavation tools with the utmost care, one of the workers replied sarcastically as they rolled their eyes. Captain Tempest can't help but smile at the pair's conversation. These people never failed to surprise me, Captain Tempest thought to himself as he got inside the helicopter's interior. The seats were comfortable, but the noise was overwhelming. Dr. Kyle handed the headset to Captain Tempest to drown out the loud noise of the helicopter. As he put it on, Captain Tempest was amused by this otherworldly transport as it began to take off. The helicopter's powerful rotors whirred loudly as it lifted off the ground, and Captain Tempest felt a rush of excitement as they soared higher into the sky. Despite the noise, he couldn't help but feel a sense of concern as he saw the two ships below through the helicopter's large windows. Several minutes later, they finally reached their destination as their helicopter circled the island for potential landing sites. As they landed the pilot did his best to minimize their impact on the environment by avoiding trampling vegetation and landing in a pre-designated landing zone. Talk about eco-friendliness. The team then disembarked and began their mission. Ah, uh, I'm surprised to see seagulls wandering around this place. Dr. Kao remarked as he stepped out of the helicopter. Dr. Kyle had a keen eye for spotting potential dig sites, and his skills were crucial for the success of their mission. With all the necessary components in his huge backpack, Dr. Kyle then pulls out a case from his huge bag containing a LiDAR drone, which he quickly assembles. Captain Tempest notices that he does not know what he is doing as he assembles the drone. Dr. Kyle? The curious pirate asked. What is it? Dr. Kyle replied. Captain Tempest eyed the drone and said, I couldn't help but notice that you seem to be assembling something. Ah, uh, yes, Dr. Kyle replied, this is a drone that will help us map out this part of the area. With its LiDAR technology, this drone will act as a cartographer, taking detailed measurements of the landscape and creating accurate maps for us to use. We are lazy people, and it will save us a lot of time. The drone then let out a soft beep as it hovered above the trees, ready to begin its mission. 
The team gathered around Dr. Kyle as they looked at the control screen to survey the area. They watched as the drone zoomed off into the distance, gathering information about the landscape below. As the drone continued its journey, it stumbled upon a set of ruins that seemed like an abandoned medieval outpost. The team's interest was piqued. There, that set of ruins over there looks promising, Dr. Cobb pointed out as he led the team toward the ancient structures. As they approached the site, they could see that it was heavily overgrown with vines and vegetation. Determined to uncover its secrets the team carefully began clearing the area and taking notes on the different types of vegetation and structures they encountered, hoping to learn more about the civilization that once inhabited this island. As they worked tirelessly in the hot sun, they noticed that the ground beneath them felt different. Curious, Dr. Kyle instructed one of his team members to hit the ground with a pickaxe. The sound that echoed back was a deep thud, unlike any they had heard before. They finally uncovered the island's original surface, a layer of rock that had been covered by years of sediment and soil. Dr. Kyle expected this to happen. They tried to chip away at it with their pickaxes, but to no avail. Eventually, their pickaxes broke under the strain of trying to break through the rock. Sai, should we use the drill? One of his teams asked. Dr. Kyle considered the question for a moment before nodding in agreement. Yes, let's try the drill, he said. However, when they attempted to use the drill, it did not work. The team tried everything they could think of to fix it, but nothing seemed to be working. Frustration began to set in as Dr. Kyle realized that they needed an alternative solution. Dr. Kyle looked around at his team members, thinking of what they could do next to break through the tough rock. Suddenly, one member suggested using explosives, but Dr. Kyle quickly shut down the idea. Explosives will be a bad idea, he warned. They needed to think of a safer and more effective approach to solving their problem. All right team, since the drill is not working, we need to gather data manually, Dr. Kyle announced. Let's focus on documenting our findings for now. We can come up with a new plan later. The team nodded in agreement and began taking notes and photos of the ruins. As Dr. Kyle's team took notes and photos of the ruins, they began to piece together the architecture of the once great fortress. From what they could see, the buildings were made of sturdy stone that had stood the test of time. Intricate carvings adorned the walls and columns, depicting scenes from a long-forgotten era. Immediately after taking pictures of the ruins, the team made notes of their observations and speculated on the possible purpose of each structure. Despite the ruins being centuries old, the structures were still in perfect condition. The team marveled at the durability of the stone and the craftsmanship of the carvings. As they moved from one building to another, they noticed that each one was built with a clear purpose in mind. It was evident that this was not just any ordinary fortress but a clearly built giant command station, possibly used to oversee and control vast territories, as they had previously seen what lay beneath the island. Ah, uh, sir, it looks like we found what seems to be a door leading inside the structure, one of the members of his team called out. As they approached the door, they noticed intricate carvings etched into the stone, crowded with roots and vines, depicting what seemed to be a defeated serpent. Manny has tried to enter it. For centuries, mages, adventurers, and treasure hunters tried to enter this ancient fortress, hoping to uncover its secrets and claim its riches. But none had ever succeeded, as the fortress was said to be protected by magic and clever yet simple carved runes that repelled all intruders. Manny, however, was determined to uncover the truth behind the defeated serpent, and was willing to risk everything to finally breach the fortress's walls. This includes me, Captain Tempest said with a sigh. Dr. Kyle touched the door as he was admiring it, and the door suddenly rumbled and swung open. His men quickly raised their rifles as the huge door opened, revealing a dark and ominous hallway leading into the heart of the fortress. Momentarily after the door swung open, the runes etched into the walls started to glow and light the hallway casting an eerie orange light on the dusty hallways of the fortress. Sir, his men called out. Captain Tempest looked at Dr. Kyle. Now pale, you people have Terran blood coursing through your veins. What the hell are you talking about? Dr. Kyle asked, confused. The captain was still in shock as he finally began to piece together the truth. This explains why these people were not affected by his spell or their lack of magical presence. It's because these are the same people who once allied with the ancients. So the rumors of the Kingdom of Null's prophecy were true. As the realization hit him, Captain Tempest started to lose it. He began to mutter under his breath, his mind racing with the implications of what he had just learned. Hey, are you okay? 
Dr. Kyle asked, noticing the captain's distress. Captain Tempest shook his head and took a deep breath before replying. Your people were once valuable allies of the ancients because of their immunity against curses and spells that helped the ancients push the demon lord's army thousands of years ago and were once known as the Terran Alliance. However, after the war, factions from your realm started to fight each other, leading to their downfall and eventual retreat back to the ancestral gate. Wait, so you mean a thousand years ago, humans from my world, or what you call a realm? set foot in this world and fought some kind of battle between demonic forces and made an alliance with the people who once built this thing? Dr. Kyle asked, his gaze shifting to the massive door. How come the humans from my world may have been instrumental in turning the tide of that war and forging an alliance with those from another world? How the hell is this not mentioned in any historical records or textbooks? He muttered to himself. This does not make any sense. He furrowed his brow, deep in thought. Perhaps there was a cover-up. Or maybe the records were lost or destroyed over time. As Dr. Kyle was lost in his thoughts, one of his men cleared his throat and reminded him of their current situation. They were standing in front of the massive door, which they believed held the key to unlocking the truth about their world's involvement in the war and the alliance with another world. Dr. Kyle took a deep breath, refocused his mind, and motioned for his team to move forward. Captain Tempest led the way and the air was thick with the fragrance of old magic as they approached the chamber. Kyle felt a sense of thrill and anticipation, knowing they were the first people to visit the chamber in ages. As they entered, the team could feel the weight of history dragging down on them. Entering the huge hall, Dr. Kyle's team was met with the sight of corded dust covering everything. This place seems to be a meeting place, their version of the United Nations, where representatives from different factions would come together to discuss issues and make decisions. The team moved towards the center of the hall, where a massive circular table lay covered in dust. Dr. Kyle could feel his heart racing as he realized the significance of their discovery. Then suddenly a deep voice emitted from the halls, A visitor? Dr. Kyle immediately signaled for his team to take defensive positions, with some going prone and others standing. The sound seems to be emanating in the ancient chamber. The team stayed alert, ready to defend themselves if necessary. The voice spoke again. It seems that I have been sleeping for too long. Who are you, and what brings you to this place? Dr. Kyle was taken aback by the voice but quickly composed himself and replied, We are a team of archaeologists here to study and learn about this ancient hall. We mean no harm. The voice responded, Curious indeed. It has been many years since humans from Terra have visited this place. What happened here? Dr. Kyle asked with great interest. The voice spoke with a solemn tone, Of a vessel once powerful, now alone. I was once its leader, in glory I fell, in a duel with a demon underling from hell. The mages tried to heal, but failed in their task. Yet my consciousness remains, a vessel to bask. Together with the Terrans, the war we won. But now that peace reigns, my purpose is done. My existence now, is merely to observe. As humans from Terra, in arrogance they curve. Thinking themselves invincible, forgetting those who fought. Forgetting the sacrifices, and the battles they sought. It is a shame to see how quickly they forget, as Valerius punished them, stripping them of their net, their knowledge lost, their minds in disarray, as they fight each other, their kingdom in decay, whispers from Valerius, seeds of doubt and distrust, causing disputes and conflicts, turning them to dust, chaos and destruction, reign over the once powerful land, as they retreat back to the ancestral rift, under Valerius' command, the system lords, with voices bold, grew tired of the chaos, the stories told of Belarius' influence on human minds and their kind's past arrogance left behind. They saw the destruction, the pain and strife caused by Belarius' manipulation of life, the punishment they deemed unjust, their faith in him tarnished with rust. So the system lords, as one decided, to close the rift where Belarius resided, an apology for their kind's past wrongs, a way to right the balance and move along, for they knew the harm that could be wrought by Belarius whispers, and his powerful thought. The system lords, with courage and might, close the rift, to prevent further plight. Some may call it cowardice or fear, but the system lords remain steadfast, and clear. Their action, a symbol of hope and peace, their legacy, forever, to increase. May the Terrans learn, from the system lords plight, and see the truth, in a new light. None had heard from the Terrans in ages, since the rift was closed, and history's pages. Turn to a new chapter of peace and calm.
The time moved on with a new bomb. But you, a curious Terran traveler, arrived on our world like a stargazer. With wonder in your eyes and a thirst for truth, you step forth from your world so uncouth. And now you stand before me, a being of light, a human with a heart so pure and bright. You asked me, what brings you to our world? Dr. Kyle was recording the speech the whole time, capturing every word of the story about the mentioned God and his punishment of the Terrans, humans from Earth. The tension in the room was palpable as he and his men listened to the tale of chaos and destruction caused by these gods' influence on past human leaders. Dr. Kyle answers, I apologize for any harm caused by my kind in the past. The opening of what you call a rift was not our doing. Somehow it just happened. We don't know who or what caused it. As for my reason for being here, my superiors sent me as an inquisitive explorer to learn about your world and bridge the gap between our cultures. I come in peace, hoping for knowledge about the world and whether or not it poses a threat to my people. The voice spoke with caution, and warned the traveler of a possible distortion. For though our world may seem wondrous and new, there are secrets here that may not be for you. Be cautious, dear Terran traveler, in your quest, for there are forces here that may put you to the test. The wonders of our world may be too much to bear, and the mysteries of our worlds are too difficult to compare. Your curiosity is admirable, but do not forget that knowledge can come with a heavy debt. The secrets of this world come with great power, and if not handled carefully, can cause great scour. But fear not, dear traveler, for our world is open and our knowledge to you can be spoken. Just remember to tread with caution and care. Then, suddenly, the island started to shake. Captain Tempest looked around in confusion as the ground beneath their feet rumbled and quaked. Dr. Kyle's eyes widened in shock as he realized the warning he had just been given may have been more serious than he initially thought. What's happening? Dr. Kyle saw his hand held radio beeping and quickly grabbed it to trying to answer the urgent call from the Flying Dutchman. Commander Deccan's soft voice came through the radio. Dr. Kyle, we need you and your team to get out of there immediately. Our sonar has detected that the island's limbs have started to move. It's not safe to stay there any longer. Dr. Kyle quickly looked at the dimly lit hall and asked, What's going on? What are you planning? The hall's expression turned grave as the voice replied, Dear Terran Traveler, I ask of thee, to grant me refuge from the kingdoms that seek to be free. For though my power may be great and strong, my will to use it has been gone for too long. The kingdoms of my world seek to control the power that I possess with all their soul. But I do not wish to be their pawn. For my purpose has been lost and gone. So I ask of thee, dear Terran traveler, to grant me refuge from the kingdom's fervor. Let me be in your world free, and my power I shall use with great decree. Dr. Kyle saw the opportunity in his words and knew that this sentient relic could be a valuable ally. The rift is far southwest, but be wary. We have this thing called politics, he said with a wry smile. Thank you, my friend, the relic said. For your words, you have given us a new thread. I shall be wary of the politics you speak, and with your help, our future shall not leak. The relic's surprised reaction was evident upon mention of politics. Dr. Kyle could see a flicker in the hall but he was reassured by the relic's words. They seemed to understand the concept and promised to be wary of it as they worked together to find the rift. Dr. Kyle couldn't help but feel relieved that the relic was on their side, despite its initial hesitation towards politics. He was willing to take the risk and bring the relic to earth. It was a small step towards a larger goal, but Dr. Kyle was confident that they were on the right path. He quickly relayed the message to his team to pack up and prepare for extraction making sure to keep a close eye on their surroundings. As they made their way out of the dimly lit hall, Dr. Kyle couldn't shake off the feeling that they were being watched. 1. Part 5 Briefing Room As they got out of the hall, the rumbling stopped. He saw the horizon in front of him, and one structure stood out among the rest. It was a towering structure with an ominous aura. It was the island's head slowly revealing itself. Meanwhile, the Flying Dutchman, Commander Deccan, observes the island from a safe distance with his binoculars. He can see its giant limbs emerging out of the water as the island slowly rises, revealing its head. At the edge of the island, its head almost looks like a saucer with its two glowing eyes, giving it an intimidating appearance. How's your situation there, Dr. Kyle? asked Commander Deccan. I'm utterly fascinated by what I'm seeing, Commander, replied Dr. Kyle. 
This island is unlike anything I've ever seen before. Its structure and size are truly remarkable, giving it an ominous aura, and the way it's revealing itself is almost mesmerizing. It's as if the island is alive, and it's exciting to witness its emergence. Their helicopter finally arrived to pick them up, and as they approached the edge of the island, the once familiar sandy shore vanished, replaced by a surreal and imposing sight. The rough surface of the ancient relic, weathered by centuries of wind and waves, loomed before them. Barnacles and coral clung to its surface, an eerie reminder of the island's long history and the relentless power of the sea. As they gazed out from the island's new vantage point, they saw that the world had changed around them. The island now towered 800 feet above the water, dwarfing their two ships and making the vast expanse of the ocean seem almost small by comparison. The sheer scale of the transformation was breathtaking. Jesus! exclaimed one of Dr. Kyle's men as he peered over the edge. I never thought I'd see anything like this in my lifetime, taking in the sight with a mix of awe and trepidation. They knew that this was only the beginning of their journey, and that there were still many mysteries to uncover in this strange world. Now we wait for our team to pack up and prepare for extraction, Dr. Kyle said, snapping them out of their reverie. The team quickly went to work, gathering equipment, while Dr. Kyle stood back and admired the view. He had been on many expeditions before. As they made their way toward the designated pickup spot, the team couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement and anticipation for what lay ahead. They were about to embark on an adventure that few people had ever experienced before. As the sound of the approaching helicopter grew louder, Dr. Kyle and his team stood at the edge of the island, ready to make their exit as their craft came into view, its rotors whirring with a distinct sound that echoed off the island's rocky surface. The chopper drew closer. It tilted its nose down and swooped in low, hovering just above the island's surface. The team scrambled aboard, their gear and equipment secured, as the chopper lifted off in a spectacular display of skill and precision. The relic finally noticed their helicopter as it circled him while Dr. Kyle was gathering data. Its head was tilting, watching the Terran machine with curiosity. So the Terrans had learned how to fly without magic. Led by him while Dr. Kyle was gathering data, the team settled into their seats, the hum of the chopper's engines filling the air. Dr. Kyle couldn't help but ponder the possibilities that lay ahead and the mysteries waiting to be uncovered in this strange and wondrous world. As he gazed out at the vast expanse of the ocean below, he wondered if there were scientific advances in this realm that could help Earth search for a new power source. The relic's power and energy were undeniable, and Dr. Kyle couldn't help but wonder if there were ways to harness that power and bring it back to Earth. But as he considered the possibilities, he couldn't help but wonder about the role of magic in modernizing new technologies. Was it possible that the ancient powers of this world could be harnessed and combined with modern science to create something truly revolutionary? Dr. Kyle knew that the idea of magic and science working together would be controversial, but he couldn't help but feel that there was something to it. The relic itself was proof of the power of ancient magic and its fusion with advanced technology could lead to incredible breakthroughs. As their helicopter approached their research vessel, the Flying Dutchman, the team could see from above that the crew was already busy filming the walking island. The relic's movements were unlike anything they had ever seen before. As the helicopter landed on the deck of the ship, they were met by Commander Deccan while the crew rushed forward to help unload the gear and equipment. Dr. Kyle got out of the helicopter, and walked towards Commander Deccan with an emotionless expression, but he got used to it on his face as he stepped forward to meet them. Dr. Kyle was surprised to see a glimmer of respect in his eyes. Welcome back, Dr. Kyle, Deccan said, his voice low and measured. I trust your expedition was successful. Yes, sir, Dr. Kyle said, a sense of pride swelling in his chest. Yes, Commander Deccan. We were able to collect valuable data and small amounts of new specimens including glowing plant life that could potentially revolutionize the field of bioluminescence research. The potential for further research is immense. Deccan's eyes flickered with interest, and Dr. Kyle could see that he was genuinely curious about their findings. I look forward to hearing more about it, he said, his voice tinged with respect. Captain Tempest couldn't help but feel uneasy as he got out of the aircraft. After all, he was a caught pirate, and as he proceeded into the briefing room, with the assistance of two of Lieutenant McCredger's combatants, he attempted to ignore such thoughts. Commander Deccan had invited him to accompany them on their expedition, 
and he knew that he possessed significant knowledge of the waters and the magic that resided in this realm. When he walked into the room, he was welcomed by a number of scientists and security personnel, who all gazed at him with a mixture of wonder and concern. Captain Tempest, Commander Deccan remarked solemnly, Thank you for joining us. We have much to discuss. As you know, the waters in this region are treacherous, and we've encountered many dangers during our expedition. But what concerns us most is the existence of magic in this world, and the potential implications it could have for our understanding. Captain Tempest nodded, his expression serious. I, I understand your concerns. Magic is a powerful force in this world, and it can be both a blessing and a curse. But I must warn you, my knowledge of magic is limited, as I am but a humble pirate who has spent most of his life at sea. As the briefing continued Captain Tempest shared what little knowledge he had of the world, his words painting a vivid picture of a world full of wonder and danger. And as the scientists and military personnel listened, they knew that they were on the brink of something truly extraordinary. Commander Deccan leaned forward, his eyes intense. Nevertheless, we need all the information we can get. Tell us, Captain, what can you tell us about the Terrans? Captain Tempest shrugged, his expression solemn. I've heard tales and rumors, but I cannot say for certain. And what about what you said when Dr. Kyle accidentally opened the door on the previous expedition, that you said Dr. Kyle has Terran blood within him? Commander Deccan interjected. Captain Tempest nodded slowly. Yes, it's true. Dr. Kyle's ancestors were Terrans when the relic awakened after it detected his presence. But he was born and raised on our world. The group fell into a thoughtful silence pondering the possibilities and challenges that lay ahead in their mission to explore the special region. As Commander Deccan listened to Captain Tempest's theory about Dr. Kyle's Terran heritage, the idea that their own team member or all of them could be connected to an ancient race of humans was both fascinating and unsettling. Are you saying we have Terran blood in our veins? He said it in a measured tone. Captain Tempest hesitated for a moment before speaking, his eyes scanning the faces of those gathered in the room. I don't know for certain he said slowly, but I have a theory. You see, I believe that you people are not just descendants of the Terrans, but we are the Terrans themselves. The room erupted into a flurry of whispers and small arguments as the people tried to process this revelation. For many, it was a shock to learn that they had a connection to this ancient race. I know it sounds impossible, outsiders, Captain Tempest shouted, but hear me out. The relic says that the Terrans were said to possess a unique immunity to magic and curses and they were known for their incredible strength and fighting prowess. Does that not sound like you foolish, boozed up people? Commander Deccan was not offended by Captain Tempest's outburst. In fact, he understood the pirate's confusion and frustration. Captain, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but let me fill you in on our history, he said, his voice calm and measured. We may share some similarities with the Terrans, but we are not the same people. Our ancestors may not have had magical abilities, but they were resourceful and innovative, he said. They learned to harness the natural resources of this world to create new technologies and weapons that were far ahead of their time. These advancements may have looked like magic to the people of their time, but they were based on sound scientific principles and a deep understanding of our natural world. For instance, the ancient people in my world built impressive structures like the pyramids and temples, which still stand today and also developed a sophisticated understanding of astronomy and mathematics, as evidenced by their accurate calendars and precise measurements. These achievements were not just a product of chance or luck, but rather the result of careful observation and analysis of the natural world. These may have seemed like magical feats to their contemporaries, but they were the result of years of trial and error, experimentation, and ingenuity. As the conversation shifted, Commander Deccan turned to Captain Tempest. Speaking of worlds, he said, what can you tell us about your world, Captain? Captain Tempest nodded, his eyes flickering with memories. Aye, it's a place like no other, he said, his voice tinged with nostalgia. In my world, magic is not just a thing of myth and legend. It is a very real force that is woven into the fabric of everyday life. People use magic and runes for all sorts of things, from farming and building to healing and warfare. It can be a powerful tool but it can also be dangerous in the wrong hands. Captain Tempest continued, There are some devices that can harness the power of magic, but we are still trying to fully understand how they work. It's a delicate balance that requires both scientific knowledge and magical expertise. 
He then went on to talk about the dwarves in his world, who were known for their mastery of steam power and their ability to create rune-engraved swords and other contraptions. He also mentioned the continents of the Middle East, where scholars studied the stars and used magic to unlock the secrets of the universe. In my world, science and magic are not separate things, he concluded. They are two sides of the same coin, and it takes a special kind of person to understand them both. The people in the room listened intently, their minds racing with the possibilities of such a world. It was clear that Captain Tempest's world was a place of wonder and mystery, where anything was possible. Commander Deccan nodded thoughtfully as Captain Tempest finished speaking. It sounds like your world has much to offer, he said. Is there any friendly kingdom or country that might help us in diplomacy and that may give us an advantage? Captain Tempest thought for a moment before answering. There are many kingdoms and countries in my world, some more friendly than others, he said. But there is one in particular that might be of interest to you. Captain Tempest's eyes lit up as he spoke of the kingdom of Iranilu. Ah, uh, Iranilu, he said, his voice filled with admiration. It's a place of great culture and beauty, and it's the center of all trade in the region. Other kingdoms rely on its resources and wealth, and many scholars and nobles visit there for its knowledge and enlightenment. He went on to describe the many wonders of the kingdom, from its towering palaces and bustling markets to its lush gardens and grand libraries. He spoke of the many cultures and peoples that called it home, from the proud knights and noble ladies to the humble farmers and artisans. Iranilu is a place of great power and influence, but it's also a place of kindness and compassion, Captain Tempest continued. Queen Marielle is a wise and just ruler, who cares deeply for her people and is willing to protect the weak and vulnerable. Her kingdom is like the heart of the region, Captain Tempest said. It's a place of great importance, not just for its wealth and resources, but for its culture and traditions as well. The people in the room listened intently, their minds racing with the possibilities of such an alliance. It was clear that Aranala was a place of great power and influence, but also a place of kindness and compassion. Good, Commander Deccan said with a cold tone. An alliance with Queen Marielle's kingdom could bring us many benefits, both in terms of diplomacy and resources. The people in the room nodded in agreement, their thoughts turning to the possibilities of such an alliance. Dismiss, said Commander Deccan abruptly, cutting off their discussion and ending the meeting. The people slowly gathered their belongings and filed out of the room, still contemplating the potential benefits of an alliance with Iranilu. Captain Tempest was guided to the lab and told to get some rest. As he made his way through the ship's corridors, he couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. They were in a strange and unfamiliar world, surrounded by dangers and mysteries that they had yet to fully understand. But he pushed those thoughts aside as he arrived at the lab, where his crewmate was being observed. He entered the room and was greeted by the sight of his friend, lying on a bed with wires and sensors attached to his body. As he got closer, he saw something that surprised him. His crewmate was laughing, and beside him were Dr. Sarah and her guards. Hey, look who's here! Claude exclaimed, waving at his friend with a bright smile. I'm having a great time here. They're treating me like royalty, he added, gesturing towards Dr. Sarah and her guards. The sight of his friend's cheerful expression and the warm welcome from the lab staff brought a sense of relief. Captain Tempest couldn't help but laugh at Claude's enthusiasm despite the seriousness of the situation. He approached the bed and greeted his crewmate with a smile, relieved to see that he was in good spirits. How are you feeling? Captain Tempest asked, looking at Claude's face for any signs of discomfort. I'm doing okay, his crewmate replied, grinning. These guys have been keeping me entertained. I told you he's gonna be fine, said one of Dr. Sarah's guards, throwing him something that looks like a can. What is this? He looked at the can. It's a can of beer the guard replied with a laugh. Just a little something to help you pass the time. Captain Tempest took the can of beer and examined it curiously. He had heard of beer before, but he had never tried it. He looked at the guard and asked, How do I open this? The guard chuckled and showed him how to use the tab to open the can. Captain Tempest watched carefully as he demonstrated, and then he mimicked the action himself. He heard a hissing sound as the can opened, and he took a cautious sip. The taste was bitter and slightly fizzy, but not unpleasant. He took another sip, feeling the warmth of the alcohol spreading through his body. The guard gave Captain Tempest a pat on the back and grinned. Welcome to the world of beer, Captain, he said with a chuckle. It's not as good as a good old-fashioned rum, but it'll do in a pinch. Captain Tempest laughed, 
feeling more relaxed than he had in days. He took another sip of the beer and savored the taste, feeling a sense of affection for his captors for a moment. He forgot about the mission and the mysteries of the unknown world they were in, and he just enjoyed the simple pleasure of good company and a cold drink. It was a small moment of joy in the midst of their struggles, but it was enough to give him the strength to carry on. My apologies for the lengthy and brief chapter publish. School has just recently begun. I know my grammar is sheet but I have to study. 2. Part 6 Rescue! Captain Tempest had just finished enjoying a meal with his crewmates when he received an urgent call from the bridge. He hurriedly made his way there, his heart pounding with anticipation. As he entered the bridge, he saw the crew frantically working at their stations, trying to make sense of the readings on their instruments. What's going on? He asked, his voice filled with urgency. We've detected an undocumented life form heading towards us, the first officer replied, her voice tense. It's massive, and it's moving fast. Commander Deccan's brows furrowed in concern as he immediately took command of the situation. He swiftly analyzed the data on the screens and instructed his crew on the necessary defensive measures to take. Despite the tension in the air, he remained composed and steadfastly focused on protecting his crew and their mission. Commander Deccan spoke confidently and calmly, his voice cutting through the chaos on the bridge. Men, listen carefully. We have encountered this creature before, but we were unable to document it or even name it. The last time we encountered this beast, we were able to ward it off by simply shooting at the water near it. Now I need you all to call our sister ship to ward that thing off. Captain Tempest watched in awe as the Queen Anne's revenge appeared on the horizon, its bizarre weaponry gleaming in the moonlight. He knew that this ship was a force to be reckoned with, and he felt a sense of fear, knowing that they had such powerful support. The crew of the Flying Dutchman worked quickly, adjusting their course and staying clear of the Queen Anne's Revenge's line of fire. They watched in awe as the ship fired warning shots near the sea monster, creating a wall of sound that drove it away. As the sea monster disappeared into the depths of the ocean, Captain Tempest felt a sense of relief wash over him. He knew that they had narrowly escaped a disaster. As the sea monster disappeared into the depths of the ocean, Commander Deccan remained silent, watching the creature disappear through his binoculars with a blank expression on his face. The crew of the Flying Dutchman looked at him nervously, unsure of what to say. Captain Tempest took a deep breath before responding. That was just a small but rare sea serpent, he said, his voice filled with a mix of awe and apprehension. More of these kinds linger in these waters which is why ships rarely venture into this part of the ocean. Commander Deccan listened carefully as Captain Tempest explained the nature of the creature they had just encountered. He nodded slowly, taking in the information with a sense of quiet contemplation. So sea serpents exist in these waters, he said, his voice measured and calm. It seems like every scientist's wet dream has come true out here. Commander Deccan turned to him with a visible fake smile and said, For now, I think it's time for you to get some rest. We have a long journey ahead of us, and we need someone like you to be at his best. Captain Tempest hesitated for a moment, seeing that he was not good at lying. He then sighed and nodded in agreement. Thank you, Commander, he said. I appreciate your concern. I'll get some rest, but I'll be ready to face whatever challenges come our way. With that, Captain Tempest headed to his quarters with the same two guards, leaving the rest of the crew to continue their work. Commander Deccan watched him go, his expression blank. He knew that they were facing a daunting challenge, but he was confident that they would be able to rise to the occasion and succeed in their mission. As Captain Tempest entered the observation room, he was surprised to see that it was more comfortable than he had expected. The room was spacious and well lit, with a large mirror on one wall. The bed was not luxurious, but it looked comfortable enough for a good night's sleep. Captain Tempest lay down on the bed, feeling the softness of the mattress beneath him. He closed his eyes and thought, why does Commander Deccan, someone younger than him, have such authority? Captain Tempest couldn't help but wonder what qualities and experiences Commander Deccan possessed that warranted such authority at a relatively young age. It intrigued him. As Captain Tempest pondered these thoughts, exhaustion began to overtake him. The warmth of the room and the gentle hum of the ship's engines lulled him into a state of tranquility. Gradually, his mind wandered away from unanswered questions and he finally fell asleep, embracing the much-needed rest that awaited him. Meanwhile, on the bridge, the crew of the Flying Dutchman monitored the ship's progress, 
watching the radar closely for any signs of danger. Suddenly, a blip appeared on the screen, indicating the presence of an object nearby. Commander Deccan leaned forward in his seat as he saw the radar and sonar pings on the screen. The blips were getting closer, and he knew that they needed to investigate. He immediately ordered the crew to adjust the ship's course towards the blip. The crew members quickly sprang into action, preparing themselves for a potential encounter. As the ship steered closer, they eagerly anticipated getting into visual range to identify the mysterious object. As they finally got into visual range, the crew's excitement was met with a shocking sight, a destroyed merchant ship that had been cut in half. The crew members gasped in disbelief as they took in the wreckage before them. Clearly, a catastrophic event had occurred, and they knew their investigation had just become much more serious. Dr. Kyle quickly assessed the situation and began coordinating efforts to gather as much information as possible. He ordered the crew to document every detail of the wreckage, looking for any signs of what could have caused this destruction. As the crew continued to survey the wreckage via an observation drone, they noticed something unusual. One of the bodies was not like the others. It appeared to be that of an elf and was still alive, though unconscious. Sir, I got heat signatures and movement at the wreckage. It looks like one of them survived, sir, said one of the crewmen. The ship's team of scientists crowded around the display screen, watching the scene with a mix of curiosity and skepticism. As they zoomed in on the survivor, they saw that she was indeed a woman with long, pointed ears. Her blonde hair stood out against the charred debris surrounding her, and they wondered how she had managed to survive such devastation. An elf? murmured one of the scientists, their skepticism turning into astonishment. The first scientist rolled her eyes. Oh, please don't start with that nonsense. We're scientists, not anime enthusiasts. Let's stick to actual scientific explanations here. Commander Deck can listen to the scientists' conversation with a mixture of amusement and frustration. He knew that they were a group of intelligent and curious individuals, but their skepticism sometimes blinded them to the possibilities of the unknown. As they continued to watch the scene, the sonar technician suddenly noticed something moving on his screen. It was the sea serpent they had encountered earlier, and it appeared to be wounded. It looks like our sea serpent friend is back, the sonar technician said pointing to the screen. Commander Deccan's eyes narrowed as he watched the creature. He knew that it was a dangerous predator, and if it was responsible for the destruction of the merchant ship, they needed to take action. Prepare for evasive maneuvers. Commander Deccan simply said so, his voice filled with determination. The crew swiftly executed his orders, maneuvering the ship to gain distance from the wounded sea serpent. At the same time, the ship's gunners locked onto their target and prepared to shoot ready to defend themselves and ensure the safety of their vessel. Deccan's curiosity was piqued as he observed the wounded sea serpent with a perplexed expression. The sight of the injured creature sparked questions in his mind, leaving him wondering why it was wounded and what caused its condition. However, his curiosity was quickly overshadowed by the sheer magnitude of the serpent's size. It towered above the ship, casting a shadow that seemed to swallow everything in its path. The crew members watched in awe as the once mythical, deafening creature revealed itself, its immense body gliding through the water with a grace unimaginable for its size. The sea serpent begins to roar, its deafening cries echoing across the ocean. The crew members were now filled with fear, except for Commander Deccan, who maintained an expressionless stare. His eyes remained fixed on the serpent, unblinking and unaffected by the chaos unfolding around him. While his crewmates panicked and scrambled for safety, Commander Deccan's calm demeanor never wavered. It was as if he had locked away all emotions. They could feel the vibrations of its powerful voice reverberating through their bodies. As the serpent was just about to rise and lay waste to their ship, its deafening shriek was stopped by their sister ship's MK-45 Mod 4 naval gun rounds, which are designed to explode on impact, ripping the serpent apart. The air was filled with the stench of burnt flesh as the creature's blood sprayed across their ship, coating the deck in a gruesome display. The crew, though still shaken by the encounter, Commander Deccan looked over the crew, his expression serious. Our job is not done yet, he said firmly. We still have a survivor to rescue. We cannot let our guard down until we have successfully retrieved the survivor. Stay focused and remain vigilant. The crew nodded in agreement, their determination renewed as they prepared to face whatever challenges lay ahead. On the good deck, Lieutenant McCredger's hazmat team hurried to their inflatable boat 
an NSW rib, to be exact, which is designed to be fast, maneuverable, and capable of operating in a variety of sea conditions and can be used for a variety of missions, including infiltration and exfiltration of personnel, maritime interdiction operations, and reconnaissance. Their boat finally slid into the water with a gentle splash, and the crew members quickly secured their gear and took their positions. The lieutenant's voice crackled over the radio, issuing final instructions before they set off towards their destination, determined to complete their mission successfully. The crew members could feel the wind whipping through their hair and the spray of the ocean on their faces. They knew that they were racing against time and that the fate of the elf survivor hung in the balance. The sonar technician's eyes widened as he listened to the multiple pings, this time smaller, coming from the depths of the ocean. They were not expecting it to have offspring, and they were likely searching for their wounded parent. Commander, he said, his voice urgent, we have multiple pings coming from the water. It's probably the sea serpent's offspring. Lieutenant McCrager's radio crackled as he listened. We need to warn you that you may be facing multiple adversaries, which we think are its offspring, and that they need to be prepared for anything. Oh, great, the lieutenant replied sarcastically. Because dealing with one giant mythical creature wasn't enough, now we have to worry about a whole family reunion in the middle of our rescue mission. Well, it looks like my retirement plans just got a lot more interesting, one of his men chuckled. Well, boys, it's time to dust off the old harpoon, their lieutenant exclaimed with a determined grin. As the rescue team approached the wreckage, they could see the sea serpent's offspring circling the debris, ready to feast on the dead. The crew members knew that they had to act quickly if they were going to save the elf survivor and prevent the sea serpents from attacking them. It looks like we've got some unwanted guests, Lieutenant McCredger said grimly. Time to show these sea serpents who's boss. His men nodded in agreement their faces set in a determined expression. They quickly loaded their weapons, preparing to fend off the sea serpents and protect the rescue team. The sea serpents turned their attention toward the rescue team, hissing and snarling in anger as they approached the unconscious elf survivor trapped in the wreckage. When they noticed the sea serpents drawing closer to the survivor, their trusty gun roared to life, unleashing a barrage of rounds from its burning barrels on the sea serpents. Eat lead, you slimy sea snakes! The bullets pierced through the scales of the sea serpents, causing them to writhe in pain and retreat. Lieutenant McGregor couldn't help but chuckle at his crew's enthusiasm, even in the face of danger. Keep it up, boys, he said, a smile playing on his lips. We've got a job to do, and we're not going to let a few sea serpents stand in our way. Despite the sea serpents' best efforts, the rescue team managed to successfully retrieve the elf survivor and bring her back to the Flying Dutchman's infirmary. She was still unconscious wearing a light green cloak with embossed ornate silver patterns woven into the silk fabric, clutching a small leather bag tightly in her hand. The rescue team carefully examined the bag, whose soft brown leather was smooth to the touch. It was small but had a distinct air of importance about it, as if it held something precious within. As the rescue team laid the elf survivor gently on the bed in the infirmary, one of the crew members caught a glimpse of something glinting in the light. It was the elf staff, propped up against the wall, adorned with delicate runes and other intricate embroidery. The crew member brushed aside the staff for now, focusing on monitoring the elf survivor's vital signs and evaluating her injuries. The crew member observed that the elf's breathing was weak and her eyelids were dropping, both of which indicated exhaustion. They understood the elf had pushed herself to her breaking point, possibly experiencing days without rest. Despite her unconscious state and evident exhaustion, the elf's beauty remained undeniable in the soft glow of the room. The delicate features of her face were highlighted by the gentle flicker of candlelight, casting a serene aura upon her weary form. While the doctors tend her injuries Dr. Kyle was looking trough a glass panel, analyzing the elf and writing down his observations in a detailed report. He then gave a sigh, things are getting interesting, he muttered to himself. I never thought I would witness something like this in my career although not a doctor himself. Dr. Kyle had always been obsessed with fictional stories, particularly those involving fantastical creatures like elves. The upcoming day, which promised to be exciting. As he lay in bed, Dr. Kyle couldn't help but think about the elf survivor and the potential secrets that she held. He wondered if she knew more about magic than anyone else on the ship, and if she could reveal the mysteries of this world that had always fascinated him. 1. Part 7 A Mysterious Presence a room full of adventurers gathered at the guild, sharing strange reports and tales from their recent quests. 
one old mage has claimed to have encountered a strange presence far east of Aranala during a quest to hunt a raging sea beast. According to their account, they could sense the presence of something uncanny. Unbeknownst to the adventurers, a big event had just occurred worldwide. The adventurers murmured excitedly as the drunken old mage recounted his tale of encountering a strange presence somewhere in the east of Aranalu. Some looked skeptical, while others were captivated by the mage's words. I tell you, there was something unnatural about that place, the mage said, his voice low and ominous. I could feel it in my bones. A major event is taking place, mark my words. The air in the room became thick with expectation as the old wizard spoke. The other magicians exchanged looks, their faces a combination of interest and anxiety. They, too, had detected a ripple in the magical breeze of the east, sending shivers down their spines. It was undeniable. Something powerful and uncanny had taken place, and it was not limited to just one location. The other wizards sensed it as well, a sensation of worry that hinted at coming change and new perils on the horizon. The other adventurers exchanged glances, wondering what the mage could refer to. Had they missed something important in their recent quests? The drunken old mage continued talking. The queen of Aranala felt the same way. A rush of anxiety swept over her as she sat on her throne, prompting her to clutch the armrests hard. She knew all about the mystery presence that the elderly magician had detected. I also heard that some adventurers attempted to approach the queen for more details but were met with silence and avoidance. The queen declined to reveal anything, stating that the topic was too important and that it was for the sake of the kingdom's protection. Suddenly, the huge doors of the guild burst open. The guild master stepped forward and addressed the crowd of eager adventurers. His bearded face showed determination, his muscles bulging under his shirt, a true testament to his strength, and his voice booming above the chatter of the other adventurers. This is a momentous occasion, he proclaimed. The guild master stood before the gathered adventurers, his expression grave. I have received a mission from the Queen of Aranalu, he announced. It is a task of utmost importance, one that will require great skill and courage to complete. He paused for a moment, allowing the weight of his words to sink in. The mission is to venture outside the trade routes. The room fell silent as the adventurers exchanged worried glances. They knew that the dangers of the open sea were not to be taken lightly. Sea monsters and beasts were some of the most fearsome creatures in the world, and even the most experienced adventurers could fall prey to their attacks. The guild master continued, his voice steady. The queen has specifically requested an S rank, adventurer to aid in uncovering the truth behind a mysterious presence that has been sensed far east of Aranalu. He surveyed the room, his eyes resting on each adventurer in turn. Who among you is brave enough to take on this task? He asked. Who among you has the skill and experience to handle it? The adventurers looked at each other nervously, wondering who would step forward to accept the challenge. Suddenly, a petite and graceful figure caught everyone's attention. A blonde elf mage raised her hand slowly, her luminous green eyes filled with determination. The room fell silent as all eyes turned toward her. The guild master studied the elf for a moment, his gaze sizing her up. Are you certain you're up for this task? He asked his tone serious. The elf nodded confidently. I am, she replied, her voice steady. I know the dangers that lie ahead, but I am prepared for them. I have faced sea monsters and beasts before, and I have the skills and knowledge necessary to overcome them. Some of the adventurers still looked uncertain, but the guild master silenced them with a wave of his hand. Very well, he said. If the elf is willing to take on this task, then I do not doubt that she has the power to stay alive. She is one of our most skilled and experienced adventurers, and I trust her abilities. That the elf was indeed a strong contender for the task. They murmured their support and encouragement, wishing her luck on her journey. He turned to the elf and asked, May I know your name? My name is Yend of the Silverleaf tribe, the elf said confidently. Yend, may your skills and strength guide you to success in this perilous quest. The Silverleaf tribe is renowned for their mastery of magic, and Yend is a member of this tribe. The guild master stated, nodding approvingly. Yen's excitement grew as the guild master acknowledged her tribe's reputation. She knew she had the skills and determination to succeed in the mission, but she also felt the weight of expectation. The other guild members watched with anticipation as Yen prepared herself for what lay ahead. With a final nod from the guild master, Yen set off on her journey, ready to face whatever surprises awaited her. The next day, she was now on Storm Chaser, a sleek, 
fast ship with a black hull and crimson sails that billow in the wind like flames. Its figurehead is a fierce dragon, carved from obsidian, that seems to soar through the waves as the ship speeds through the open ocean. The salty sea breeze mingled, fueling her spirit and pushing her forward. As the ship sailed towards uncharted waters, Yen couldn't help but wonder what mysteries lay beyond, and she couldn't wait to unravel them. As Yen gazed out at the vast expanse of the open ocean, her excitement grew. The ship's crew had spoken of a legendary sea serpent rumored to dwell in these uncharted waters. With each passing wave, Yen's anticipation heightened, and she wondered if she could beat the sea serpent if it were to appear. The storm chaser, with its dragon figurehead leading the way, seemed prepared to take on any challenge that lay ahead. Yen's anticipation turned to alarm as the crew spotted dark shapes moving in the water ahead. Sea serpents, one of the sailors cried out, pointing to the massive creatures that were now circling the ship. Yen's heart raced as she watched the sea serpents, their scales gleaming in the sunlight as they closed in on the ship. Yen knew they had to act fast. She summoned a powerful spell that struck a bolt of lightning through the air. Glittering magical runes floated around her staff as she cast the spell. The lightning struck the sea serpents, sending them reeling back and giving the crew a chance to regroup. But the sea serpents were not so easily defeated. They continued to circle the ship, their eyes fixed on their prey. Yen knew they had to come up with a plan, and fast. As the storm chaser sailed on, Yen began to feel the toll of the battle with the sea serpents. Despite her mastery of magic, the constant use of spells had exhausted her, leaving her drained and weak. Her eyes grew heavy, and her movements became sluggish. The crew noticed her condition and began to worry, knowing that they needed her sharp mind and powerful magic to complete the mission. But Yen refused to give up. She knew that the queen was counting on her, and she was determined to see the mission through to the end, no matter what. As the hours passed, Yen continued to fight off exhaustion, pushing her body and mind to their limits. She knew she couldn't afford to rest, for the sea serpents were still out there, waiting for their chance to strike again. But as she battled on, Yen began to realize something sinister. The sea serpents weren't just attacking the ship, they were trying to exhaust her. Their tactics became more and more aggressive as they launched coordinated attacks, forcing Yen to use more and more magic to repel them. She could feel her strength waning and her mana running dangerously low. Yen was aware that she had to maintain her energy, but the sea serpents appeared to be one step ahead of her, continuously testing her limitations. She felt like a puppet on a string, her every motion controlled by the sea serpents. As the sun began to set, Yen collapsed onto the deck, completely exhausted. Her body shook with fatigue, and her mind felt like it was in a haze. The crew gathered around her, their faces etched with concern. She has fought off sea monsters before, but this time was different. These sea serpents were smarter and more cunning than anything she had faced before. We have to keep moving, Yen managed to say her voice barely above a whisper. The sea serpents won't give up. The crew exchanged worried glances, realizing the gravity of the situation. They knew they were powerless against the sea serpents, and their fate seemed bleak. Yet they all remained determined to continue fighting, knowing that their lives depended on it. They had come too far to give up now. Suddenly, the largest of the sea serpents rose out of the water, its massive jaws closing in on the ship. The crew braced themselves for impact but it was too late. The sea serpent's razor-sharp teeth tore through the hull of the ship, breaking it into pieces. Yen stood there in horror as the storm chaser was ripped apart. As the sea serpents closed in around her, she clutched a piece of debris, attempting to keep afloat. The crew battled valiantly, but they were defeated one by one by the animals. As Yen watched her comrades fall, she knew that she was the last survivor. Her heart pounded in her chest as she tried to think of a way to escape but it seemed like there was no way out. Just then, the last crew member who was bleeding showed up at her side, holding a piece of debris over her to shield her from view. Stay quiet, he whispered. Yen nodded, her eyes fixed on the sea serpents as they searched for their prey. The last crew member swam away to distract the sea serpents. With each passing moment, Yen could feel her heart pounding in her chest, wondering if they would make it out alive. As the sea serpents grew closer, Yen clenched her fists her mind racing with fear and desperation. She watched in horror as the last crew member lured the serpents away. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the sea serpents moved on, leaving Yen and the last person alone in the open sea. She drifted on the debris for hours, with no land or help in sight. 
Yen was weak and exhausted, her mana completely depleted. Tears streamed down Yen's face as she clung to the debris, drifting on the open sea, unsure of what the future held. But through it all, she knew that she had to keep moving and keep fighting, no matter how difficult the journey ahead might be. Suddenly, a sharp pain shot through Yen's head. Everything went black, and she lost consciousness, fainting right there amidst the wreckage of their ship. In her sleep, she keeps hearing faint beeps and whispers of voices. Slowly, Yen regained consciousness and found herself in an unfamiliar place. The clinical white walls and bright fluorescent lights contrasted sharply with the chaos of the open sea. Waking up disoriented, she realized that she was no longer adrift but instead surrounded by medical equipment and the scent of antiseptic. As her vision cleared, she saw a person wearing clean white robes. He seemed to be writing something as he looked again at her, shocked to see her awake. Yen couldn't help but feel a wave of confusion and curiosity wash over her. Who was this person? As she was about to ask the person, he quickly got up from his seat and ran outside the room, leaving Yen even more perplexed. She wondered what could be so urgent that he had to leave in such a hurry. As she tried to gather her thoughts, wandering in the room filled with even stranger objects, she remembered that she volunteered to investigate the presence that has been bothering most mages outside the trade routes. Yen's heart sank as she recalled the regretful decision to set sail with her crew on that ill-fated expedition. The horrifying image of their peaceful boat being attacked by enormous sea serpents replayed in her mind, and suddenly she noticed footsteps coming from the hallway, growing louder with each passing second. The same uncanny presence can be felt in the air, causing Yen's unease to intensify. She looked around the room, looking for her staff, but it wasn't present in the immediate vicinity. The footsteps continued to approach, and Yen's heart raced as she realized she was defenseless without her staff. The footsteps drew closer, and Yen's anxiety was reaching its peak. She tried to steady her breathing and focus her mind, but the unfamiliar surroundings were making it difficult. Suddenly, the door burst open, and a group of people in hazmat suits rushed in. Yen's instincts kicked in as she saw the strangers barging into the room. Without her staff, she made a split-second decision. In a moment of desperation, Yen lashed out and punched one of the intruders. The surprise attack caught the hazmat-suited individual off guard, giving Yen a brief moment to assess her options. Realizing that she was still vastly outnumbered. Hey listen, I think there's been a misunderstanding here. Can we please talk this out? Said the person wearing white robes. The individual is later struck in the head by a hazmat team member, who claims that it's your fault for leaving the patient. Well I panicked okay? said the person wearing white robes, clutching his head in pain with an embarrassed expression. Where am I? Yen sighed in confusion, looking around at the sterile, unfamiliar surroundings. She could hear the distant hum of machinery and the muffled voices of medical professionals. Suddenly, two young guys in bizarre clothing entered the room and appeared in front of the elf. The two of them stood tall, exuding authority. Welcome aboard the Flying Dutchman, our research ship. I am Commander Deccan and the person beside me is Lieutenant McCredger. You may be disoriented at the moment, but rest assured you are in capable hands. We are here to assist you and provide any necessary medical attention. Take a moment to get acquainted with your new surroundings, and feel free to ask any questions you may have. How did I get here? Yen's voice trembled with confusion as he uttered the question, desperately seeking an explanation. We found you unconscious in the open ocean along with the remnants of what we believe is your ship. Unfortunately, you were the only survivor we could find. It appears that you've been through quite an ordeal. Don't worry, we'll do our best to help you piece together what happened and provide any support you need during your recovery, one of the figures said. She gritted her teeth, unable to comprehend the situation she found herself in. Hey, I heard you were throwing punches like a wildcat back there. McCredger smirked examining her worn out and exhausted appearance. But don't worry, you're in good hands now, he reassured, lifting his finger. Yen bristled at his words, feeling a sense of annoyance at his presumptuous tone. Little did she know that McCredger was the one who had saved her life, but he decided to keep that information to himself for now. Deccan, their leader, noticed Yen's disheveled state and immediately ordered the others to find her suitable clothing. Yen stood there, still slightly dazed from the chaotic events she had endured. She couldn't help but feel a mix of relief at Deccan's concern and annoyance at her appearance. As the others hurried to find her suitable clothing, Commander Deccan motioned for her to accompany him when she had found proper attire. 
Yen followed Deccan, her thoughts racing with questions about what had happened. She wondered what the commander had in store for her, and if he was aware of the facts she had discovered. Despite her interest, she remained mute hiding her doubts. She didn't want to disclose her doubts just yet since she needed more information before reaching any conclusions. As they walked through the brightly lit corridors of the ship, they soon reached the lower deck, and Yen's eyes widened as she realized what was inside. Two sea serpents, dead and captured by them. She looked through the glass window, looking down as she stepped closer to where a group of hazmat specialists were preparing to disembowel the sea serpents that had been captured. With the gigantic beasts put out on tables, their silver-scaled bodies shimmering under the glaring lights. The stench of the sea mixed with the sterile smell of chemicals filled the air, making her slightly lightheaded. She observed as the hazmat crew carefully used their instruments to dissect the serpents, extracting precious samples and studying their anatomy. As she observed from a safe distance, she couldn't help but wonder how they managed to capture such obscure and eerie creatures. Not even she, an S-class adventurer, can save her ship from being torn apart by the same serpents that now lay before her. She can clearly see her marks on the serpent's scales, evidence of her previous encounter. Commander Deccan finally approached her. You haven't told us your name yet, he said. She hesitated for a moment, unsure if she should disclose her identity to these mysterious individuals. However, she knew that hiding her name would only raise suspicion and reduce her chances of finding answers. Taking a deep breath, she replied, My name is Yend. I am an S-class adventurer from the guild. We have been facing problems in the community, and I believe that finding the truth behind what's bothering the mages, including me, is important. There have been rumors of a disturbance in the Far East, a strange presence that is causing chaos and unease among the magical beings. I have come here with the hope of uncovering the source of this disturbance. She stared at Commander Deccan eagerly as she finished speaking, hoping that her words might break through his thoughts. But there was still silence. He appeared to be deep in thought despite the quiet, as he processed the information she had just revealed. After what seemed like an eternity, Commander Deccan finally spoke up. This disturbance in the Far East? I think I might know someone who has the answers we're looking for, he said confidently. 1. Part 8 Elf A strange presence you say? Captain Tempest's voice was tinged with intrigue as he sat in the glass cell, his eyes narrowing in thought. Perhaps this disturbance is connected to the ancestral rift. He mused aloud his fingers idly tapping on the cell's transparent wall. You're bluffing. Yen's disbelief was evident in her voice as she shot a skeptical glare at Captain Tempest. Why would the ancestral rift have anything to do with it? Captain Tempest's demeanor remained steady as he met Yen's skeptical gaze with a knowing smile. The disturbance we're witnessing possesses an otherworldly energy, much like how you elves and magical beings exude a unique presence. Well, I'm kind of getting used to the strange presence, he admitted with a hint of amusement. Yes, it can be quite uncanny at first, but eventually you'll adjust and become accustomed to it. Yen's frustration was palpable as she gritted her teeth and clenched her fists, struggling to contain her emotions. Only a high mage can open the ancestral rift using the cube of the cosmic eye. If the ancestral rift had truly been opened, the other side would have taken notice and potentially crossed over. Heck, we don't even know what kind of beings or entities could come through. Her tone wavered torn between skepticism and curiosity. Captain Tempest simply smiled, casually reclining on the bed in his cell. His gaze remained fixed on Yen and Commander Deccan, his expression cryptic. Commander Deccan's gaze shifted toward Yen, his voice steady and authoritative. You are standing right next to one. Huh? Yen's confusion was evident as her gaze turned toward Commander Deccan, who stood silently beside her. A pause settled in the air, followed by Yen's blinking surprise. Commander Deccan, who had seemed like a statue, was one of the beings Captain Tempest had mentioned. A shiver ran down her spine as she met his gaze, his eyes seemingly piercing through her. A complex mix of curiosity and unease swirled within her. Don't look at me like that. Commander Deccan's voice broke the silence, his words carrying a hint of reassurance. I may appear intimidating, but I assure you, I am human. Yen shifted uncomfortably her gaze dropping from Commander Deccan's intense eyes. His reassurance provided little solace, for the unease in her chest remained. There was an unspoken depth to him that she couldn't quite grasp. Despite his claim to being human, a nagging feeling persisted that there was more to him 
then met the eye. Let's refocus our discussion, Commander Deccan interjected, his tone projecting both calmness and authority. Two years ago, the ancestral rift unexpectedly opened in our world, revealing a portal to your world. However, at that juncture, we were left in the dark about what lay on the other side. This lack of information prompted our superiors to task us with the exploration and documentation of this enigmatic realm, as well as establishing contact with its inhabitants, including local kingdoms or societies. Amidst their planning for the temporary base, which was necessary as they hadn't visited the region before, Commander Deccan continued, with Captain Tempest as our guide, we are preparing to establish a temporary base a few miles off the capital of Iranilu. Additionally, a third ship is being equipped with the essential supplies for our mission. However, it is crucial that we adhere to the instructions provided, avoid direct interaction with the locals for now. Our aim is to ensure our safety and prevent any unintended conflicts or misunderstandings with the native population. As we set up our base, we must operate discreetly and observe local customs and traditions from a distance until we have a more comprehensive grasp of this new realm. Commander Deccan's gaze shifted toward Yend a meaningful look in his eyes. Given your familiarity with the capital and its ways, your guidance will be invaluable. Your expertise in navigating the customs and rules of this foreign land will be crucial. We need to follow the laws and guidelines established by the locals to minimize any potential complications if we happen to be discovered. Yen's expression turned into one of perplexity. The unexpected request left her puzzled, wondering how she had become embroiled in such a monumental endeavor. Reading about the ancients' interactions with individuals from the ancestral rift was one thing, but being personally involved was an entirely different matter. The weight of the situation dawned on her, and she realized that this opportunity could reshape her understanding of history and her perception of the world she knew. I'm sure this is a lot to process, Yen. Commander Deccan's tone softened, acknowledging the magnitude of their request. However, your assistance is of great importance to us. Your familiarity with your world's customs and practices can offer us a significant advantage. Although hesitant, Yen found herself agreeing to help despite her reservations, recalling a similar situation from her past where her knowledge had led to disastrous outcomes. Though uncertain, she hoped that her involvement this time would yield a more favorable outcome. I'll contribute in any way I can, she replied, her voice steady, though her hands betrayed a hint of nervousness. She recognized that guiding these unfamiliar individuals would be a challenging undertaking, whether their narrative held true or not. The uncertainty of the situation lay heavy on her mind, but her willingness to assist prevailed, driven by the potential to make a positive impact on the unfolding events. Please, take some rest and eat. We have prepared food and provisions for you. Since you are our guests, we want to make sure you are well taken care of. Please... Feel free to rest and enjoy the food and provisions we have prepared for you. Dr. Sarah will now accompany you to the cafeteria, where you can rest and have a meal, Commander Deccan announced, gesturing toward a door at the end of the room. She will be available to answer any questions you may have and provide any assistance you might need during your stay here. Yen nodded, grateful for the offer of rest and nourishment. Her mind was still reeling from the revelations but she knew that taking care of herself was essential to being able to help in the days to come. She followed Dr. Sarah to the cafeteria, her thoughts swirling with a mixture of curiosity and apprehension. As they left the room, Commander Deccan looked at Captain Tempest with a mixture of curiosity and apprehension. Guiding us to unknown realms is no easy task. Captain Tempest nodded, a smirk playing at the corners of his mouth. But where's the fun in easy tasks? I live for trouble and adventure, he replied mischief twinkling in his eyes. Messing with us will cost you dearly, Commander Deccan warned, his tone firm. Captain Tempest chuckled, his confidence unwavering. Oh, I assure you, Commander, the cost will be worth every moment of excitement, he said, his voice filled with anticipation. Besides, what's life without a little risk? In the bustling cafeteria, Yend, the elf, felt slightly out of place amidst the hum of conversations and clatter of trays. Surrounded by the artificial lighting, Yen's senses craved the serenity of nature. However, due to her adaptable nature, Yen quickly adjusted to the new environment and found solace in the diverse array of food options available. As Yen made their way through the cafeteria line, they couldn't help but notice the curious glances from the human crew. Yen brushed off the attention, saying, Erm, Dr. Sarah, do you ever feel a little out of place amid all this activity? With a warm smile, 
Dr. Sarah replied sometimes, but over time, you'd get used to it. Here you go, said the cafeteria worker, handing Yen a plate filled with colorful dishes. Yen thanked them and found a seat at a nearby table, eager to dig into the delicious-looking meal. As Yen took the first bite, an explosion of flavors danced on their tongue. Each dish had its own unique taste, blending perfectly to create a truly extraordinary culinary experience that only the nobles could enjoy. She never expected it to be this good, Yen thought to themselves as they savored each bite. As Yen was eating, Dr. Sarah walked by and caught sight of Yen's adorable eating habits. Dr. Sarah couldn't help but smile at how cute Yen looked, with her small bites and the way she delicately wiped her mouth after each one. It was a joy to see someone enjoy a meal with such enthusiasm and appreciation. What are you looking at? Yen asked, noticing Dr. Sarah's amused expression. Dr. Sarah chuckled and replied, Oh, I was just admiring your eating skills. You make even the most ordinary meal look like a culinary masterpiece. Yen blushed and laughed, grateful for the compliment. It was nice to know that their enjoyment of food also brought others joy. Dr. Sarah then fixes her glasses and says, Why won't you try some sweets? Yen's eyes widened with excitement as she eagerly accepted the offer. Really? Sweets were a rare indulgence in the capital. Dr. Sarah nodded understanding Yen's excitement. She led the way to the dessert section of the cafeteria, where an array of delectable treats awaited. Yen's eyes sparkled as they took in the sight of the beautifully displayed desserts. The tantalizing aroma of freshly baked goods enveloped the air, making her mouth water. Dr. Sarah pointed to a tray of rich, chocolatey brownies and said, These brownies are a crowd favorite. Go ahead, give them a try. Without hesitation, Yen grabbed a brownie and took a small bite. Immediately, a slight bitter taste spread across her tongue, contrasting with the sweetness of the chocolate. Yen's expression became curious as she savored the unique flavor. The bitterness added an unexpected dimension to the treat, leaving her intrigued and wanting another bite. These are incredible, Yen exclaimed, her eyes lighting up with delight. I never would have expected they served such delicious sweets on this ship, Yen said. It is important to maintain good morale during extended voyages. The crew must be provided with a small indulgence to serve as a comforting reminder that certain luxuries are still accessible. This will ultimately contribute to their overall mental wellness and should not be overlooked. Dr. Sarah smiled as she fixed her glasses, listening to Yen's enthusiastic praise. As the two continued their conversation, Commander Deck Ken was still on the well deck, along with Dr. Kyle and Captain Tempest, analyzing the debris recovered from the wreck. Huh! Captain Tempest furrowed his brow as he examined a polished piece of wood that had been salvaged from the wreckage. This must have been part of a glorious ship, he smiled, holding it up to the fluorescent light above him. This type of ship was not something that could be easily acquired. It was reserved for only the most esteemed adventurers and wealthy nobles. This suggests that Yend, the elf your people rescued, held a position of great importance among her kin. What about this? Dr. Kyle picked up a worn leather bag from the debris. This must be hers, Dr. Kyle said as he carefully opened it, revealing a collection of old maps and vials of various elixirs. The vibrant colors and handwritten labels on the vials indicated that they were potent and carefully crafted. Erm, these items look like they can only be seen in video games. Is this some kind of joke? exclaimed Dr. Kyle, staring at the ridiculous assortment of fantastical objects before him. I mean, come on, elixirs and maps? It's like something out of a fairy tale. He couldn't help but chuckle at the absurdity of it all. While the objects may seem fantastical and unrealistic, it is important to approach them with an open mind and consider the possibility that they could have historical or cultural significance. Be careful. The bag is still filled with seawater. It might ruin the maps, Captain Tempest warned, his voice laced with caution. I am aware, Sir Tempest or whatever your real name may be, Dr. Kyle responded with a smirk. I have certainly never dealt with waterlogged maps before, Dr. Kyle said sarcastically, rolling his eyes. Sigh, well I guess that's it for today, Captain Tempest said, his tone indicating his irritation. Oh, this one is still in good condition, Dr. Kyle remarked, noticing that the map was not damaged by the water. He has seen maps that can withstand water damage in museums, but this one is particularly impressive. Despite being submerged, the map shows no wear and tear. Captain Tempest widened his eyes in surprise and reached out his hand toward Dr. Kyle. Hand me that thing, he exclaimed eagerly. 
The pirate was eager to examine the map himself. Ha 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 ha, luck is truly on our side, he exclaimed with a hearty laugh, his enthusiasm painting the scene with an aura of adventure. This map is undoubtedly tailor-made for the hearts of adventurers. Dr. Kyle peeked, can you read it for us? I can't read it at all. It looks like complete gibberish to me. Captain Tempest then pointed at a particular spot on the map and said, This here, my friend, is the kingdom of Iranilu. The nearest city is located just a few days sail from here. It is known as the center of all trade in these waters. Merchants from far and wide flock to this prosperous kingdom to engage in lucrative trading deals. As the conversation reached its conclusion, Captain Tempest's mischievous grin widened. But before we call it a night, how about you fetch me a can of beer? I believe there's one in your galley. Dr. Kyle's eyebrows shot up in surprise. Captain, you do remember that you're still technically my captive, right? Ordering me around for a beer might be a bit of a stretch. Captain Tempest chuckled, his eyes glinting with amusement. Ah, uh, don't take it too seriously, my friend. I'm just trying to keep the spirit of adventure alive, even in our unexpected circumstances. Dr. Kao rolled his eyes, his lips curving into an amused grin. You know what, Captain? I'll humor you this time. But don't think it's a regular thing. 1. Part 9. Horizons Unveiled Commander Deccan was in his quarters, reviewing the latest data and reports from the crew's research and exploration activities. The hum of the ship's engines and the gentle sway of the vessel had become familiar background sensations to him. However, his concentration was broken by a sharp chime from the intercom system. Commander Deccan, please report to the bridge. Repeat, Commander Deccan, please report to the bridge, came the voice of Lieutenant McCredger over the intercom. Curiosity peaked. Commander Deccan set aside his data tablet and left his quarters, striding purposefully through the corridors of the vessel. As he entered the bridge, he noticed Lieutenant McCredger at his station, his fingers dancing across the console. Report, Commander Deccan said as he stepped up to the central command area. Commander, we've received a communication from the USNS Grasp, the salvage and rescue ship. They've informed us that they will arrive in our vicinity in a few hours, Lieutenant McCredger replied, his expression a mix of professionalism and excitement. Commander Deccan's eyebrows rose. The USNS Grasp a versatile vessel known for its salvage and rescue capabilities, was a welcome sight in any operation, especially in the unfamiliar and potentially hazardous environment of the special region. Details Lieutenant Commander Deccan prompted. Lieutenant McCredger pulled up the communication on his console and projected it onto the main screen for Commander Deccan to see. The message outlined the USNS Grasps ETA and their intention to rendezvous with the USS Bataan for a joint operation. It seems they've been closely monitoring our progress and activities, Lieutenant McCredger remarked. They've expressed their interest in collaborating with us for the establishment of a temporary base of operations in the special region. Commander Deccan nodded in approval. The USNS Grasp's expertise in salvage, repair, and rescue operations would be invaluable in setting up a secure and functional base. He knew that this joint operation could enhance the efficiency and safety of their mission. Prepare a response, Commander Deccan said, his tone composed. Inform them that we welcome their collaboration and look forward to their arrival. Lieutenant McCredger nodded and quickly got to work drafting the response message. He emphasized the importance of establishing clear lines of communication and coordinating efforts to ensure the seamless integration of their respective teams. Yen's eyes fluttered open, her surroundings gradually coming into focus. Soft light filtered through the blinds casting gentle shadows on the walls. As her groggy mind cleared, she realized that she was lying in a comfortable bed within the infirmary of the Flying Dutchman. A wave of memories washed over her, meeting the crew, the flurry of activity, and the overwhelming rush of emotions. She had been through quite an experience since her arrival. Ah, you're awake! A cheerful voice greeted her. Yen turned her head to see Dr. Sarah, a warm smile on her face as she approached the bedside. Yen managed a weak smile in return, her voice still a bit raspy. Hello, how are you feeling? Dr. Sarah asked, her tone a mix of professional concern and genuine care. Better, I think, Yen replied, her throat clearing as she spoke. It's been quite a day. Dr. Sarah chuckled softly. Indeed it has. But don't worry, you're in good hands here. I've been tasked with keeping an eye on you and making sure you're comfortable. Thank you, Yen said, her gratitude sincere. I really appreciate it. Dr. Sarah patted Yen's hand reassuringly. No problem at all. 
And just so you know, the cafeteria is serving up some delicious food right now. Would you like to join me for a meal? Yen's stomach gave a subtle rumble in response to the mention of food, causing her cheeks to flush with embarrassment. She nodded awkwardly, grateful for the invitation. That sounds great. Dr. Sarah smiled warmly at Yen's response. Perfect. It'll be nice to have some company. Let's go grab a bite to eat and take a break from all the stress. As they made their way to the cafeteria, Yen couldn't help but feel a sense of camaraderie with Dr. Sarah. The casual conversation flowed easily between them, ranging from Yen's experiences so far to Dr. Sarah's own insights about life on the Flying Dutchman. You know, this cafeteria isn't just the place to eat, Dr. Sarah said with a mischievous grin. It's also where a lot of important discussions and debates take place among the crew. Yen raised an eyebrow, intrigued. Really? Like what? Oh, you know, everything from passionate debates about the latest findings to good-natured arguments about the best ways to pass the time during long journeys, Dr. Sarah explained, her eyes twinkling with amusement. As the two settled at a table with their trays of food, Dr. Sarah leaned in slightly, her voice conspiratorial. And rumor has it that the cafeteria's dessert corner is the real secret to crew morale. Yen laughed, her apprehensions about this new world slowly melting away in the warmth of Dr. Sarah's company. The conversation flowed naturally as they shared stories, anecdotes, and even a few laughs. Just as they were finishing up their meal, a message chimed on Dr. Sarah's phone. She glanced at it, and then looked at Yen with a grin. It looks like we've been called to the helipad. Commander Deccan wants to meet with us. The two stood in the corridor of the Flying Dutchman, her footsteps echoing softly against the metal floor. The unfamiliar surroundings had a way of making her feel both out of place and curious. Yen and Dr. Sarah arrived at the helipad, the cool breeze tousling their hair as they stepped out onto the open deck. The expanse of the helipad stretched before them, surrounded by the endless horizon of the sea. The gentle hum of the ship's engines and the distant sound of waves crashing against the hull created a serene backdrop. As Yen gazed around, her eyes widened in awe. She had seen the Flying Dutchman from the inside, but being on the helipad gave her a completely new perspective. The ship's structure was massive and intricate, every detail meticulously designed. It was as if she was standing on top of a floating fortress, a marvel of engineering that defied the boundaries of what she had thought possible. Wow, Yen whispered, her voice tinged with amazement. She turned to Dr. Sarah, her eyes shining. It's bigger than a dwarf and steamship. How can you people make something so grand? She asked. Her curiosity peaked. Dr. Sarah smiled, her gaze also fixed on the impressive vessel before them. Isn't it? The Flying Dutchman is a testament to our world's ingenuity and determination. And you're now a part of this remarkable journey. As Yen continued to take in the sight, her attention was drawn to another ship stationed nearby. The Queen Anne's Revenge, the sister ship of the Flying Dutchman stood proudly in all its glory. The two vessels side by side looked like steadfast sentinels, guarding the secrets of the special region and the mysteries it held. She can see people walking back and forth on the ship. Their hustle and bustle on board filled Yen with a sense of curiosity, wondering what adventures awaited those who embarked on this extraordinary voyage. As they stood on the helipad, gazing out at the vast expanse of the sea, Commander Deccan's voice broke the silence. Look to the horizon, he said his tone calm and steady. Yen's attention shifted, and she followed his gaze. In the distance, a smaller ship appeared, steadily approaching the Flying Dutchman. Its silhouette stood out against the backdrop of the ocean and the sky, gradually becoming clearer as it drew nearer. Yen watched as the ship grew in size. Her curiosity peaked. It's the USNS Grasp, Commander Deccan explained, his voice carrying a hint of anticipation. Our partnership, carrying the materials and personnel we need for the planned temporary base, known as Alpha Site, Yen nodded, her eyes fixed on the approaching vessel. She could see now that it was indeed smaller than the Flying Dutchman, yet it bore its own significance in the grand scheme of their mission. As the USNS grasp drew closer, Yen could make out more details. The contours of the ship's structure, the movement of people on deck, and the faint glint of sunlight on its hull. She felt a mixture of excitement and curiosity eager to witness the collaboration between the two ships unfold. The USNS Grasp is carrying not only the necessary materials, but also new people who will join our mission, Commander Deccan continued. They're skilled individuals who bring their own knowledge and expertise to our exploration and studies. 
Yen's eyes widened at the mention of new arrivals. The prospect of meeting individuals from different walks of life, each bringing their unique skills and knowledge, filled her with a sense of anticipation. She had already seen the incredible diversity among the crew of the Flying Dutchman, and the thought of expanding that circle of cooperation excited her. As Yen and Commander Dekken stood on the helipad, immersed in the sight of the approaching USNS grasp, the sudden roar of helicopter engines shattered the tranquility. The sound reverberated through the air like the roar of a raging beast, drowning out any other noise. Yen instinctively brought her hands to her ears. The noise was piercing and overwhelming. The helicopter descended with remarkable precision, its blades cutting through the air with a powerful force. As it touched down on the helipad, the rush of wind generated by its blades was intense, causing Yen to struggle against the gusts that threatened to knock her off balance. The helicopter's arrival was a jarring interruption, a stark contrast to the serene expanse of the sea around them. With her ears still ringing from the deafening noise, Yen blinked to clear her vision as the helicopter's blades began to slow down. Through the wind and noise, she could see the helicopter's side door open, revealing a figure stepping out onto the helipad. A woman in her late twenties stood before them, her posture poised and confident. She wore a tire that mirrored Commander Deccan's, signaling her rank and role on the ship. Her gaze swept across the scene, and for a brief moment, her eyes locked onto Commander Deccan's. There was a glimmer of recognition in her expression, as if she had just met an old friend. However, the warm anticipation that seemed to light up the woman's face was met with Commander Deccan's unyielding coldness. He regarded her with his trademark stoicism, his icy demeanor unchanged. There was no hint of familiarity in his gaze, no trace of warmth or recognition. The woman's smile wavered slightly, a flicker of uncertainty crossing her features. It was as if her expectations had been met with a response she hadn't anticipated. Despite the noticeable shift in atmosphere, the woman maintained her composure, straightening her posture and offering a more formal nod of acknowledgement. Commander Deccan, she said in a voice that carried a hint of professionalism, even as the warmth in her eyes seemed to wane. I see you're as welcoming as ever. Commander Deccan's response was a curt nod, his expression revealing nothing of his thoughts or emotions. It was a silence that Yen found perplexing, a dynamic between two individuals that she couldn't fully grasp. As the wind from the helicopter's blades continued to dissipate, Yen stood witness to a meeting that seemed to hold more beneath the surface than met the eye. Yen observed the exchange, feeling like an outsider in a conversation that held a history she knew nothing about. The woman's gaze lingered on Commander Deccan for a beat longer before she turned her attention to the surrounding environment, perhaps seeking a distraction from the chilly reception. Quite an impressive vessel you have here, Commander, she commented her tone light and conversational, attempting to bridge the gap. Her eyes swept across the helipad, taking in the expanse of the Flying Dutchman and its sister ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, which stood nearby like twin giants of the sea. The woman's gaze shifted from Commander Deccan to Yend, her expression morphing from one of formality to one of genuine curiosity. Her eyes met Yend's, and there was an openness to her demeanor that contrasted sharply with Commander Deccan's reserved attitude. So you're the elf that they found, is that right? The woman asked, her voice carrying a light-hearted tone that seemed to melt away some of the tension in the air. Her smile was warm and inviting, a stark contrast to the sternness that had characterized the initial interaction. Yen nodded, feeling a bit taken aback by the woman's friendly approach. Her response was met with an encouraging nod from the woman, as if she were genuinely interested in getting to know Yen. I'm Captain Cassandra, by the way. The woman introduced herself with a friendly smile. I'm the captain of the USNS Grasp, the ship that just arrived. It's a pleasure to meet you, Yen. Yen felt her guard start to ease in the presence of Captain Cassandra. Her demeanor was refreshing, a stark departure from the rigidity Yen had initially witnessed between her and Commander Deccan. As if on cue, a gust of wind ruffled Yen's hair, reminding her of the powerful helicopter that had brought Captain Cassandra to the helipad. You're not from around here, are you? Captain Cassandra asked, her curiosity evident. You're an elf, but I can tell there's something different about you. Mind if I ask where you're from? Yen hesitated for a moment, unsure how much she should reveal. However, Captain Cassandra's genuine interest and friendly demeanor put her at ease. She found herself opening up a bit. My name is Yen. I am an adventurer from the Silverleaf tribe in the distant land of Elinder. We are a house of noble elves, 
known for our renowned mastery of magic. Our people have dedicated generations to honing our magical abilities and are considered some of the most skilled spellcasters in all of Elinder. Captain Cassandra's eyes widened slightly, clearly intrigued by Yen's response. However, before she could respond, Yen's attention was drawn to a figure approaching from behind. It was Dr. Sarah who had been tasked with observing and taking care of Yen during her first day on the ship. Everything okay here? Dr. Sarah asked with a friendly smile, her presence unexpected. Yen's eyes widened in surprise, realizing that she had shared more information than she intended. Dr. Sarah's unexpected appearance had caught her off guard, and she quickly tried to regain her composure. Oh, uh, yes, everything's fine, Yen replied, her cheeks flushing with embarrassment. I, um, guess I got a bit carried away. Dr. Sarah's smile turned understanding, and she chuckled softly. It happens to the best of us. Don't worry about it. Captain Cassandra watched the exchange with amusement, her friendly demeanor unchanged. Well, it sounds like you've led quite an adventurous life, Yen. Commander Deccan then interrupted, his stoic demeanor softening as he offered a rare smile. He motioned for Yen to join them, his gesture inviting. Indeed, we are all eager to hear more about your experiences. Let's head inside and continue the discussion. Yen felt a mixture of surprise and curiosity at Commander Deccan's unexpected smile. It was a subtle shift that caught her off guard, yet it spoke volumes about his genuine interest in learning more about her. With a nod of agreement, Yen followed Commander Deccan and Captain Cassandra as they turned and headed back toward the ship's interior. 1. Part 10. Awakening Skies Yen stood near a window overlooking the hangar bay of the Flying Dutchman. The sight that greeted her was a hive of activity, a dynamic scene filled with people wearing high-visibility vests, moving purposefully around the area. The metallic clang of tools and the distant hum of machinery were the backdrop to this orchestrated chaos. As her eyes scanned the scene, Yen's heart quickened with a mix of emotions. Many of the faces she saw were familiar, members of the crew she had interacted with, shared meals with, and even engaged in conversations with. There was a sense of unity among them, a shared purpose that brought them together in this uncharted realm. In the midst of it all, a Moss Hind called a helicopter stood outside the hangar bay, its imposing presence a testament to the capabilities of the crew. They say that this aircraft was a marvel of engineering, with its intricate design and powerful engines embodying the cutting-edge inventions that had brought them to this new world. Yen's thoughts swirled as she observed the crew members preparing for another mission. She couldn't help but marvel at the audacity of their endeavors. These were people from another world, exploring her homeland with a mix of excitement and curiosity. Her own perspective on the matter was complex, a blend of fascination, apprehension, and even a touch of protectiveness. On the one hand, Yen felt a deep appreciation for their dedication. These were individuals who had left their familiar lives behind to venture into the unknown, facing challenges and uncertainties at every turn. She admired their courage and their relentless pursuit of knowledge, recognizing that their presence in her world could lead to discoveries that had the potential to reshape history. Yet, alongside her admiration, there lingered a sense of unease. The outsider's arrival carried the weight of change, change that could disrupt the delicate balance of her homeland's ecosystem, culture, and way of life. The bustling activity in the hangar bay was a stark reminder that this special region was no longer a secluded sanctuary. It was now a stage for collaboration, exploration, and perhaps even conflict. As she continued to watch, Yen's gaze settled on the faces of those she had met. Dr. Sarah's familiar smile, Lieutenant McCredger's cunning determination, and even the stern countenance of Commander Deccan, all of them were part of a larger tapestry woven with ambition and purpose. Yen recognized that their intentions were driven by a thirst for knowledge and a genuine desire to understand and connect with this new world. In the end, Yen's perspective was a mosaic of conflicting emotions, much like the tapestry she observed before her. She saw the potential for mutual benefit, a chance for her people to learn from these newcomers, just as they could learn from her world's rich history and magical heritage. At the same time, she felt a deep responsibility to protect her homeland and its secrets, to ensure that the exploration didn't come at the cost of what made her world unique. As the crew members continued their preparations, Yen's gaze lingered on the helicopter, a symbol of their reach and ambition. She knew that their presence marked the beginning of a new chapter, one that held both promise and challenges. 
With a mixture of optimism and trepidation, she silently pledged to play her part in shaping this narrative, forging connections, and safeguarding the world she held dear. Yen stood near the window, her gaze fixed on the hangar bay below. The view offered a direct line of sight to the bustling activity that had captured her attention. A group of people clad in high-visibility vests had gathered in a neat line, their eyes fixed on the same sight that had captured Yen's curiosity. The Sikorsky S-92 helicopter, with its powerful form striking a stark contrast against the metallic surroundings of the ship's hangar. Yen had never met these people before, and their presence and purpose were shrouded in mystery. Yet there was something intriguing about the way they stood. Their looks were concentrated and motivated. Yen's instinct informed her that this was a significant event for the adventure they were all embarking upon. As Yen continued to watch, she noticed that some of the researchers were holding small devices in their hands, capturing the scene before them. These devices, smartphones, though Yen had no concept of their purpose, were pointed at the helicopter, recording the moment as it unfolded. The researchers seemed engrossed in their task, capturing images and videos with a sense of purpose that intrigued Yen. Curiosity nodded at her, causing her to move closer to the window. She leaned in slightly, her brow furrowed, trying to comprehend the gravity of what she was watching. What was it that had these individuals so fixated on the helicopter? What was it about this machine that drew them in? The whispers of chatter reached her ears, with the researchers sharing their insights and delight with one another. Yen couldn't help but think about the relationship between these researchers and the machine outside. She hoped she could understand some of the phrases they were using so she might gain insight into their thoughts and feelings. As Yen continued to watch, a subtle tension seemed to grip the room, a tension that mirrored the excitement building outside. The researchers exchanged glances and shared nods, their expressions a mix of anticipation and wonder. Yen felt as if she were on the cusp of something significant, even if she couldn't fully grasp its nature. A sense of unity permeated the room as if everyone present recognized the importance of the moment. These individuals, each with their own unique roles and expertise, were united in their anticipation of what was to come. Yen's curiosity deepened, and she leaned in slightly, captivated by the scene unfolding below. Then it happened. The helicopter was dragged to the helipad, its enormous body gliding with purpose. The researchers let out excited gasps, their hushed voices rising louder with each passing second. It was as though their collective breath had been unleashed in a chorus of appreciation. As the helicopter settled onto the helipad, its rotors began to spin, creating a mesmerizing dance of motion and power. The cheers of the researchers, once confined to whispers, burst forth in an eruption of enthusiasm. Their voices filled the room, a symphony of excitement and anticipation that resonated with Yen's own sense of wonder. Yen watched her heart stirred by the genuine joy and awe that radiated from the researchers. Their cheers were a testament to the shared spirit of exploration that had brought them all together. In that moment, a bond was forged through a mutual pursuit of discovery. It was a scene that transcended language and culture, a celebration of human ingenuity and determination. Yen may not have understood the specifics of their work, but she could recognize the power of collective passion and the joy of witnessing something remarkable. The hangar bay was a flurry of activity as the anticipation for the helicopter's departure reached its peak. People in high-visibility vests moved with purpose, their steps synchronized with the meticulous preparations taking place. Amidst the controlled chaos, a door opened, and a figure stepped out onto the hangar deck, exuding an air of confidence. We're good to go, the person announced with a firm nod, their voice carrying over the din of activity. The announcement acted as a catalyst prompting a ripple of movement among those gathered. The researchers exchanged quick glances, their faces alight with a mixture of eagerness. And it was clear that this moment was the culmination of careful planning and anticipation, a moment they had all been waiting for. As the line of researchers began to move, Commander Deccan followed close behind Yend, his presence a steady presence in the midst of the commotion. He observed the scene with his customary composure, his eyes taking in the meticulous preparations and the focused passion of the researchers. Noticing Yen covering her ears with her hands, Commander Deccan's keen observation skills kicked in. He recognized her sensitivity to loud noises, an understanding that came from their previous interaction during Captain Cassandra's arrival. Without hesitation, he approached one of the people nearby who was equipped with an aviation headset, a device designed to protect against the deafening noise of aircraft. 
With a polite gesture, Commander Deccan signaled to the person, who willingly handed him an aviation headset. Holding it in his hands, he approached Yend, his gaze steady and thoughtful. He extended the headset toward her, his intent clear. Yend, he said, his voice carrying a sense of reassurance. The loudness of a helicopter can be overwhelming, especially for sensitive ears. This will help protect your hearing. Yen looked at the aviation headset in his open hand, a mixture of surprise and gratitude crossing her features. She hadn't expected this gesture, and the fact that Commander Deck Ken had anticipated her needs touched her in a way she couldn't quite express. Thank you, she replied, her voice tinged with sincerity. Taking the aviation headset from him, she studied it for a moment before carefully placing it over her ears. The snug fit offered a comforting sensation, and she could already sense the difference it would make. As the headset enveloped her in a world of muted sounds, Yen looked up at Commander Deccan, a small smile playing at her lips. Much better, she said with a nod, her gratitude evident in her eyes. Commander Deccan's own expression remained composed, a subtle nod acknowledging her response. He had done his part to ensure her comfort, a gesture that revealed a side of him that Yen was only just beginning to glimpse. The clean interior of the Sikorsky S-92 helicopter welcomed Yen with a sense of materialism that slightly contrasted with her world's traditional aesthetics. The seats were arranged with a precision that spoke of engineering perfection, with each detail tailored with a level of craftsmanship that rivaled the finest creations of her own kingdom. Yen took a moment to appreciate the surroundings. The clean lines and contemporary design left an impression on her. Finding her chosen seat near the clean window, Yen settled in her anticipation growing as the reality of the journey ahead sank in. The sound of the door closing echoed within the cabin, its sealed closure muffling the sounds of the outside world. The interior felt almost serene, a stark contrast to the bustling activity she had witnessed in the hangar bay. Yen noticed a subtle mitigation of the noise, with the insulated interior serving as a buffer against the loudness she had experienced during the helicopter's earlier arrival. It was a relief allowing her to focus on the journey itself rather than being overwhelmed by its mechanics. The helicopter began its ascent, and the sensation was both thrilling and surreal. Yen's gaze was drawn to the window. Her eyes were fixated on the world outside. The landscape below gradually transformed, the ship's surroundings taking on a new perspective from this vantage point. The ocean stretched out, its vastness a testament to the world's endless mysteries. As the helicopter gained altitude, Yen's attention was captured by another helicopter in the distance. It was more massive, its bulkier frame setting it apart from the one she was riding in. The sight piqued her curiosity, and she watched as the larger helicopter maintained a steady course alongside them. Little did she know, the helicopter she was observing was the Sikorsky CH-53K King Stallion from the sister ship. Its powerful presence and robust design marked it as a workhorse, capable of carrying heavy payloads and troops. To Yend, it was an unfamiliar marvel, a machine unlike any she had encountered in her world. As the two helicopters flew side by side for a brief moment, Yen couldn't help but marvel at the diversity of machinery that now surrounded her. It was a testament to the unity of purpose that transcended worlds, an alliance of technology and exploration that had brought them all together. She watched as the bulkier helicopter continued its course. Yend wondered what else these machines were capable of, and what other wonders they held within their mechanical shells. As she looked out at the helicopters, she couldn't help but feel a sense of curiosity, eager to discover more about the capabilities that lay hidden within these strangers and their machines. As the helicopter continued its journey, Yend's gaze was drawn to the changing landscape below. The vast expanse of ocean gave way to the gradual emergence of land on the horizon. The coastline appeared like a distant painting, the details sharpening as the helicopter closed the gap. The shores of the special region were coming into view, and Yen's heart quickened in anticipation. Amid the soft hum of the helicopter's engines, Yen's ears caught the hushed whispers that circulated among the researchers and personnel in their seats. She couldn't make out the exact words, but the undertone of excitement was palpable. It was a feeling that resonated with her own sense of wonder and curiosity. Amidst the quiet conversations, Yen overheard a voice from the front seats speaking in a distinct German accent. Ah, uh, it looks very close to Muraway Beach in New Zealand, the voice said, the words carrying a sense of familiarity and nostalgia. The mention of Muraway Beach in New Zealand brought a flash of recognition to Yend. Though she had no direct knowledge of these places, 
the accents and references indicated that the people on board hailed from diverse corners of their world. The fact that they recognized the special region's landscape as reminiscent of their own destinations highlighted the shared experience of exploration and discovery. Yen's attention turned back to the window, her eyes fixed on the approaching shores. The comparison to a place called Muraway Beach intrigued her, sparking her imagination as she envisioned the beauty of these distant lands. It was a reminder that even in this realm beyond her own, connections and parallels could be drawn between the familiar and the new. Yen cautiously watched as the larger helicopter descended onto an open space surrounded by dense woods while their own chopper circled the area. The engine screamed even louder, reverberating across the air as the machine touched down. The rotor wash churned up dust and debris, briefly obscuring Yen's view. As the dust began to settle, Yen strained to catch glimpses of the scene below. Her gaze focused on the people disembarking from the bulkier helicopter, and her heart quickened at the sight. The individuals were dressed in thick clothing. Their attire was bulky and practical. The colors of their clothing blended with the natural surroundings, making them almost appear like extensions of the terrain. Intrigued, Yen squinted to see more details. Each person had various items strapped to their backs, and as they moved, their purposeful actions suggested a familiarity with their surroundings. Her eyes widened as she observed the equipment they carried. Some of the items resembled tools, while others seemed more robust and functional. Yen's lack of familiarity with such technology left her speculating about its purposes. A sense of caution crept over her as she noticed that many of these individuals also carried what she could only interpret as weapons. The weapons were unlike anything she had encountered in her own world, and their appearance stirred a mixture of curiosity and apprehension within her. She couldn't help but wonder about the intentions behind these individuals' preparedness and the need for such armaments. As the helicopter Yen was in continued to circle, maintaining a safe distance from the scene, she watched as the people on the ground formed a perimeter. Their movements were disciplined, efficient, and coordinated. The quality with which they carried out their tasks indicated a level of expertise that intrigued Yen while also raising questions. The descent of the helicopter was gradual the world below growing larger and clearer as they approached the ground. Yen felt a mix of excitement and trepidation as the aircraft steadily descended, the wind rustling her hair as it flowed through the open windows. The ground grew closer, and with a soft thud, the helicopter touched down, its landing gear absorbing the impact. As the engines wound down and the rotor blades slowed to a halt, Yen unfastened her seatbelt, her senses adjusting to the change in surroundings. Her eyes widened as she noticed the people on board taking out their devices and capturing the moment on film. Cameras and smartphones were held up, capturing images and videos of the landscape and the aircraft they had just disembarked from. Yen watched with fascination as the passengers, many of whom were researchers, documented their arrival in the special region. The act of filming seemed almost second nature to them, as if they were keen on preserving these moments for posterity. The various accents and languages she heard added to the sense of diversity in the group. As the door of the helicopter opened, Yen's senses were greeted by a rush of clean, fresh air, the same air that she had experienced during her moments on the ship's deck. She stepped outside, the ground beneath her feet firm and steady. The scene before her was breathtaking, an expanse of lush grass and vibrant foliage, surrounded by towering trees that seemed to stretch endlessly into the horizon. She wasn't the only one taking in the scenery. She noticed the people who had been on board the helicopter with her stepping out and stretching their limbs. Some let out audible gasps of awe as they looked around, their expressions a mixture of wonder and appreciation. It was as if they were taking in the sights and sounds of a world entirely new to them. Yen's attention was drawn to the people around her, many of whom were reaching for their phones and capturing the moment on camera. She observed them as they documented their surroundings capturing images and videos that they would likely share with others. The act of recording seemed to be as much a part of their experience as the landscape itself. Amid the clicking of cameras and the hushed conversations, Yen's ears perked up as she overheard a conversation nearby. The voice had a hint of nostalgia, and the words seemed to carry a weight of fond memories. This reminds me of the countryside back home, playing with schoolmates, the person said, their tone wistful. The mention of countryside and schoolmates caught Yen's attention once again. It wasn't the first time she had heard these terms, and each time they were spoken, her curiosity grew stronger. She pondered over the meanings, trying to piece together a mental image of what these unfamiliar concepts might entail. 
schoolmates, Yen mused to herself, the word resonating in her mind. She could only guess that it referred to companions or friends with whom one attended this mysterious school. As for the countryside, she imagined vast fields, open landscapes, and a sense of tranquility far removed from the bustling city life she had witnessed during her first stay at the capital. Amidst the excitement and conversations of the newcomers, Yen's gaze was drawn to a different kind of activity unfolding nearby. A group of people wearing high-visibility vests had gathered, and in their midst, a person stood out, a figure wearing an Akubra hat and the same high-visibility vest, seemingly orchestrating the scene. The atmosphere around them felt charged with purpose, as if they were engaged in something more deliberate than mere exploration. Curiosity peaked. Yen's eyes focused on the object that the person with the hat was holding, a device that resembled the painted talisman she had seen on the Flying Dutchman's screens. However, this object was larger and bulkier, its presence commanding attention. It seemed to have a glassy surface, and the person was gesticulating and talking to it as if engaging in a conversation. As she observed from a distance, Yen could sense the air of intentionality in their actions. There was something different about this group. They were working together with a shared goal. The person in the Akubra hat turned slightly, and Yen caught a glimpse of their expression. It was sharp and strong, yet it held a hint of excitement. Besides the person with the hat, a camera operator was capturing the scene with a larger camera, its lens pointed in the direction they were all facing. The camera itself was an enigma to Yen, a foreign object that she had only seen a few times before. She had no understanding of its purpose or how it worked, but she sensed that it played a pivotal role in whatever was unfolding before her. As the camera operator adjusted the camera's position, Yen couldn't help but overhear snippets of their conversation. Words like frame, angle, and action were repeated, and the person in the Akubra hat seemed to be providing instructions to ensure that everything was captured as intended. Her attention was captured as the person with the camera directed their lens towards her. Curiosity mingled with a sense of unease as they approached, and she couldn't help but feel like an object of interest. The person with the Akubra hat began speaking to the camera, their voice carrying confidence that resonated through the air. Good day, everyone. My name is Bogart Explorer from Davos City, and we're here in the special region, exploring the mysteries of this world and meeting its fascinating inhabitants and mysterious cultures. Join us on this thrilling adventure as we uncover the hidden gems and untold stories that lie within these enchanting lands. And look who we've come across. A real-life elf named Yen. The name sounded strange and foreign to Yen's ears, but she understood that it referred to her. The person with the Akubra hat turned their attention to her, a warm smile on their face. Yen, is it? I'm Bogart. The person introduced themselves, their voice filled with charm and an insane charisma that instantly captivated Yen. She couldn't help but be drawn in by Bogart's magnetic presence, feeling a strong connection to this mysterious stranger. Intrigued by the prospect of embarking on this thrilling adventure together, Yen eagerly extended her hand and replied, Nice to meet you, Bogart. I'm excited to uncover this enchanting world's hidden gems and untold stories with you. Mind if I ask you a few questions? He asked. Yen hesitated, feeling a mixture of curiosity and uncertainty. This was an opportunity to learn more about the newcomers and their world, but she also felt exposed, as if her every word might be scrutinized. Bogart's off-the-wall charisma seemed to bridge the gap as he posed his questions in a friendly manner. You've been observing the activities of these people from another world, haven't you? What have you gathered about them? Are there any similarities or differences between their ways and those of your people? Yen glanced at the group of people she had been watching. They were engrossed in their tasks, whether it was carrying equipment or filming. With Bogart's charming encouragement, she found herself responding. They treated me like one of them, Yen admitted, her voice filled with surprise and awe. They didn't make me feel like an outsider, despite being from a completely different world. They were so welcoming and inclusive that I forgot I was the observer and felt like a true participant in their activities. Also, I've seen them carrying those strange devices, she began, gesturing towards the camera and they carry objects that I don't recognize. Some of them wear clothes that are different from anything I've seen, and they seem to be working together in a way that's organized. Bogart nodded, his expression attentive as he absorbed her words. And what about you? How do you feel about their presence in your world? Yen considered the question, her thoughts racing. It's both strange and exciting. They have things I've never seen before, and they seem interested in learning about this world. 
I'm curious about their devices and their culture, but I also wonder how their actions might affect our land. Bogart smiled, seemingly pleased with her response. Thank you, Yend. You've given us valuable insight into this unique encounter. It's fascinating to see the curiosity and openness on both sides. Perhaps this is the beginning of a new chapter in the relationship between our worlds. As Yend observed the group of people and the camera captured her image, she felt a mixture of emotions. While she still struggled to fully comprehend the concept of a camera or a reporter, she recognized both sides' genuine interest in each other. The encounter left her with a sense of wonder and a desire to learn more about the people who had ventured into her world from distant realms. As Yen found herself surrounded by a barrage of questions from Bogart, her unease grew. The relentless stream of inquiries felt overwhelming, and she struggled to keep up with the rapid pace of the conversation. Each question seemed to be followed by another before she could even form a coherent response. Amidst the flurry of questioning, Commander Deccan's presence caught her attention. She noticed his stern expression and realized that he had observed her discomfort. Before she knew it, he stepped forward, his tone firm but measured. That's enough, Commander Deccan stated, his gaze focused on Bogart and the camera. We appreciate your interest, but this is becoming overwhelming for Yend. Let her have some space. Bogart's expression wavered for a moment, a hint of frustration mingling with surprise. However, he quickly masked it with a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. Commander Deccan, we're here to capture the reality of this encounter. Our audience wants to know about the interactions between the inhabitants of this world and our own. It's a unique opportunity. Commander Deccan's response was steady and unwavering. I understand that, but it's also important to respect the comfort and well-being of those involved. Bogart's expression hardened, his charisma giving way to a more rigid demeanor. Commander, our job is to report the truth and capture real moments. If we stop now, we'll lose the authenticity of this encounter. Commander Deccan's gaze held a hint of sympathy, but his resolve remained resolute. I'm not suggesting that you abandon your reporting. Just give Yen some space, and when she's more comfortable, you can continue. Yen watched the exchange, her earlier discomfort replaced with a sense of gratitude towards Commander Deccan. His intervention had granted her the reprieve she desperately needed. She found herself appreciating his consideration of her feelings even as she struggled to fully understand the dynamics of the situation. After a tense moment, Bogart finally relented, though his disappointment was evident. The camera was lowered, and a group of reporters began to disperse, their murmurs of discontent fading into the background. As the crowd thinned, Commander Deccan turned his attention to Yen. Are you alright? Yen nodded, her relief evident. Thank you. It was getting a bit overwhelming. Commander Deccan spoke reassuringly. I understand. It can be quite overwhelming to face such intense scrutiny. Just remember, you're doing an incredible job. Yen's tension eased as she realized she had someone in her corner, supporting her through this challenging experience. As the two continued to talk, someone caught Commander Deccan's attention. A man in bulky green clothing. The person was wearing a military uniform and had a stern expression on his face. Commander Deccan excused himself from the conversation with Yen and approached the man. As Yen's keen observation continued, she observed Commander Deccan with a sense of intrigue and curiosity welling up within her. It was clear that the people in the bulky green clothing held a level of respect for him that hinted at a higher rank within their world. She watched in silence, her sensitive ears attuned to their conversation. Yen's ears strained to catch the conversation between Commander Deccan and the man in the green uniform. His voice carried an air of authority as he issued a command, requesting a report from the man. Status report, Commander Deccan said, his tone steady and composed. The man in green clothing returned the salute before providing his report, his voice tinged with concern. Sir, we've spotted movement in the distance, approximately 500 meters from our current location. He gestured with his hand to indicate the direction. Based on our observations, we suspect it might be a group of short, green humanoid creatures. As he spoke, he made a sweeping motion with his hand to emphasize the size of the group. Their numbers appear to be small, and they're headed in this direction. He paused, his expression reflecting the gravity of the situation. It must have heard the sound of our helicopters, the man continued, his voice filled with concern. We believe that the noise may have alerted them to our presence. Yen listened intently as the man shared his observations with Commander Deccan. A sense of urgency filled the air as they discussed the situation. 
Yen hesitated, torn between her desire to help and her shyness about approaching these modern people. Nonetheless, her curiosity and concern for the potential encounter compelled her to take a step forward. Keeping a respectful distance, she cleared her throat softly to catch Commander Deccan's attention. Um, excuse me, Yen began tentatively, her voice barely above a whisper. She didn't know the modern word for commander, so she used a term she was more familiar with. Might I speak, sir? She added, trying to convey her politeness and respect. Commander Deccan turned his attention to Yen, noting her presence with a slight nod. Of course, he replied, his tone firm but not unkind. He appreciated her proactive approach to the situation. Yen took a deep breath, gathering her courage. I couldn't help but overhear your conversation about the creatures. In my world there are two types of goblins. One is the savage goblin, known for their hostility and aggression. The other is the hobgoblin, which serves an economic role in many kingdoms. They are skilled merchants and traders. She paused, her expression a mix of curiosity and concern. I wonder, sir, if you are dealing with merchant hobgoblins or the more savage kind. It could make a significant difference in how we approach this situation. Yen's opinion caught the attention of the man in the green suit, who appeared to be evaluating the option she had raised. Commander Deccan gave her a contemplative look as he observed her, respecting the perspective she had to provide. Thank you for your insight, Commander Deccan said, acknowledging her contribution. It's a valuable perspective to consider. He turned his attention back to the man in green clothing, his mind processing the new information. However, before we make any decisions, I think it would be beneficial to clarify the creatures that Yen mentioned, Commander Deccan suggested. We should bring Yen with us, Commander Deccan proposed. They may be able to provide further information and help us make an informed decision. The rest of the group nodded in agreement recognizing the importance of Yen's expertise in clarifying the creatures that had been mentioned. As Yen observed the unfolding situation and Commander Deccan's willingness to consider her insights, her curiosity got the better of her. She wanted to see for herself if their descriptions of the creatures were accurate. Moreover, her fascination with these modern people in bulky green clothing, whom she suspected to be soldiers due to their movements, was growing. She decided to join them, keeping a respectful distance. The group began to move toward the woods, their footsteps making little noise on the grassy ground. Yen trailed behind, her keen elven senses attuned to every detail of the environment. As they approached the tree line, she noticed the other personnel, the civilians in high visibility vests, engaging with one of the military individuals. The man was carrying a massive bag that was almost as tall as a dwarf in her world, which was known for their love of drinking, mining, and carrying bags twice the size of their height. The sight of such a large bag intrigued Yen, and she couldn't help but compare it to the dwarves of her world. While she couldn't understand the conversation between the civilians and the military personnel, the body language and gestures conveyed a sense of cooperation and shared purpose. In the dense woods, Yen quietly observed the soldiers and one of the researchers as they moved cautiously through the underbrush. Her keen elven senses allowed her to blend seamlessly into the surroundings a skill honed by years of living in the forested realms of Elinder. As they continued their advance, a soldier at the front raised his hand, signaling for the group to slow down. His voice was barely a whisper, but Yen's acute hearing caught his words, We're here. Peering through the foliage, Yen focused her gaze on the scene unfolding before her. The men in bulky green clothing, military personnel by all appearances, had their tools at the ready. These tools, she knew, were more than just instruments. They were weapons. The soldiers pointed them toward a group of short, green-skinned humanoid creatures that were emerging from the bushes ahead. Yen remained hidden, her senses alert, and her heart beating steadily. The soldiers maintained a muted presence, their movements precise and disciplined. She couldn't feel their presence in the same way she could with creatures of the forest. But that didn't mean they couldn't be detected. Her sensitive nose picked up the scent of their uniforms, a blend of fabric and metal. It was a scent unfamiliar to her, yet impressive in its ability to keep them silent and low profile, much like how her wood elf can move through the forest. As Yen continued to observe, she confirmed her suspicions. The short, green-skinned creatures were indeed goblins. Their unpredictable nature was known across the special region, often causing trouble for adventurers and settlements. She had encountered goblins before, but never in such close proximity to modern people from another world. 
In the midst of observing the tense standoff between the soldiers and the goblins, Yen's thoughts drifted to a longing she had carried since their arrival in her world. Her mind whispered with regret as she wished for something she had lost during a previous encounter. If only I had my staff, she thought silently to herself. Her staff, a precious extension of her magical abilities, had been a constant companion on her journeys through Elinder. With it, she could command the elements, summon protective spells, and wield the forces of nature to her advantage. With the tension in the air palpable, Yen couldn't help but feel a sense of urgency and concern for the people around her. As she watched the soldiers and their weapons trained on the goblins, she felt compelled to share her insights with the group. Excuse me, she said, her voice now more confident. The soldiers turned to look at her, their expressions a mix of curiosity and surprise. These creatures, Yen began, her gaze focused on the goblins, I've encountered them in my world, and they can be quite dangerous. In my experience as an adventurer, I've faced goblins and other magical beasts. Their unpredictable behavior and raids can pose a significant threat to settlements and travelers. She could sense a shift in the atmosphere as some of the military personnel considered her words while keeping their weapons at the ready. Yen's desire to see the situation resolved was clear, but she also wanted to witness the soldiers in action, to understand how they dealt with such challenges in this world. If it's safe, she added cautiously. I would like to see how you handle this. It might help me understand more about this world and how to protect myself and others in it. As Yen stood there, her heart pounding in her chest, she noticed a silent exchange between the soldier who had spoken and Commander Dekken. The soldier's gaze met the commander's, and in that brief moment, understanding seemed to pass between them. With a solemn nod from Commander Dekken, the soldier turned back to the group of goblins, and without hesitation, the soldiers opened fire. The noise was deafening, a rapid barrage of gunfire that filled the air. For a moment, the cacophony disoriented Yend. Her sensitive ears struggled to cope with the sudden and intense sound. When she finally managed to open her eyes, she was met with a scene of swift and efficient action. The soldiers, their weapons expertly wielded, had eliminated the goblins in a matter of seconds. The once threatening creatures now lay lifeless on the ground, their threat extinguished. Yen couldn't help but be impressed by the soldiers' precision and teamwork. She had witnessed firsthand the effectiveness of their response to a potential threat. Her thoughts raced, wondering what other secrets and capabilities these modern people held. As the dust settled and the echoes of gunfire faded, Yen couldn't shake the feeling that there was much more to learn about this intriguing situation she had found herself in. As Yen watched again from a safe distance, her keen eyes assessing the scene, she couldn't help but notice something peculiar about the goblins' wounds. They were different from what she had seen in battles back in her world, where swords and magical spells left distinct marks. These goblins bore wounds that were more precise, cleaner in a sense. The injuries didn't have the jagged edges and deep slashes that blades would inflict. Instead, it appeared as if something had punctured them with great force, leaving small, precise entry and exit wounds. Her mind raced with theories trying to make sense of the unfamiliar weapons these modern people used. She pondered whether their weapons fired some sort of projectile. But what kind of projectiles could deliver such precise, lethal blows? As an elf with ancient wisdom and knowledge, she was accustomed to the elegance and fluidity of traditional elven weaponry. Their blades were renowned for their intricate designs and graceful movements. But these new weapons fascinated her, as they seemed to possess a different kind of power, a precise, almost magical force that caused minimal damage yet guaranteed a fatal outcome. She couldn't help but feel a certain sense of wonder and inquisitiveness towards these people and their arcane knowledge. 1. Part 11. UN Headquarters, New York. The United Nations debating the appearance of doorways in the Indian Ocean and Madagascar, and wondering if the new world is dangerous? Are the new threats? Why did the doorways appear so suddenly? And why is there magic there? Or will the doorways have some other purpose? Someone interrupted the meeting to announce that the expeditionary force had sent a new message stating that they had found a town that, based on the image they sent and other factors, appeared to be from the Middle Ages, and they needed Commander Deccan's team to go and investigate the town for clues. Back to Commander Deccan. His guys were told to rest up for tomorrow. The next day Yen was astonished by how they were able to conceal their helicopters despite their enormous size when they began to hide their tracks and obscure any signs of human presence the following day. Five soldiers were left to guard the choppers. 
Their preparations took one hour. They were well known to be good at their job. They began to walk toward the town. The men all raised their rifles at the same time when they heard a branch break as they were moving. Commander Dekken and his crew activated their thermal. They saw movements hidden by the dense vegetation. Commander Dekken ordered them to advance slowly. A member of Commander Dekken's crew approached the noise slowly. But before he could get there, a spear came close to him, but the soldier was protected by his soft body armor. The group of people turned toward Commander Deccan's group. They were all armed with a large shield strapped to their backs and short swords at their waists. Bandits, shouted Yend. Commander Deccan pulled out one of his glocks from his waist. He then pointed his gun towards the bandit. A warning shot was fired at the ground near the attacker after it hit one of Commander Deccan's crew. What the fuck was that? One of the bandits dropped to the ground after hearing a loud bang. The bandits were confused for a moment. You want more? Commander Deccan asked with a cold tone. One of the bandits rose up with great speed and charged at Commander Deccan's group with his sword drawn. Commander Deccan then drew his knife and blocked the attack knocking the bandit down. Impossible. He couldn't possibly have blocked the weapon with just a knife. New orders. Captured the bandits alive. Understood. One of the soldiers smiled. Putting his rifle in his back dot he then charged at the bandits, punching one before it could react. You can't fight against us with such weapons. The leader of the bandits said Commander Deccan's group was now capturing the bandits one by one. While some of them escaped, we'll see you again soon, said the remaining bandits as they ran off into the woods, leaving Commander Deccan's group behind. After the bandits retreated they tied the captured bandits to a nearby tree you gotta be fucking kidding me. Hey. Don't leave us. Hey. Commander Deccan's group then moved forward again, until they were greeted by five armored figures riding on horseback. We are the Knights of the Order of the Holy Sword. State your business. I am Commander Deccan of the U.S. Army. We are here as a peacekeeping force and would like to meet with your monarch. The knights were surprised to see men dressed in a strange green clothing surrounding the captain with one of the knights approaching Commander Deccan's group. Our Majesty has been expecting you. What? How did your queen know about this? One of the scientists asked. The knight then bowed and said, This information was relayed by our queen. Queen? My name is Sir Gaston. I know it's a bit confusing to all of you, but you must follow me. 1. Part 12. Sir Gaston, these people are not of this world either. You must help them to understand the situation in order for us to be able to explain things. After a few minutes, the group returned to the village. The villagers were baffled by what they saw. Men dressed in strange green clothing and armed with a strange muskets. As the commander and his crew rode on the villagers' cart, they noticed that most of the villagers were not humans. Most of them were mixed races. Is it common to have mixed races in this place? Commander Deccan asked Yen as they sat inside the cart behind the driver. Yen said in the northern part of my country, there are many mixed races. In fact half of my people is of mixed descent. The convoy finally reached a massive wall after hours of driving. It was a substantial wall that stood close to 100 feet tall. As they went inside, they saw a lot of markets and people of different races. It was a very large metropolis, with busy streets, enormous canals big enough for a ship to sail through, towers rising high above, and towns full of statues. When one of the knights noticed that some of the foreign soldiers were in awe of the city, he smiled motivatingly and said, Welcome to the capital of the kingdom of Aranala. We often receive visitors from all around the world and we are the center of all trade. But we have never had a delegation from another world. This is truly a unique event. Then they saw the castle, which dwarfed the towers and city walls. Dr. Sarah was very impressed with the architecture of the buildings in the capital. The castle itself was huge and very tall, also surrounded by a moat. Dr. Sarah and the archaeologists heard a loud thud as the massive drawbridge lowered to the ground. Commander Deccan and his crew got out of their convoy and accompanied by the knights, as they slowly entered the castle they were greeted by maids and others welcoming them as they arrived in the castle. They got into the throne room seeing their queen dressed in a white dress with a crown on her head. Dr. Sarah was stunned at how beautiful the queen was. Their queen bowed to them and introduced herself my name is King Marielle of the Royal House of Aranalu. I am honored to welcome you here. This is the first time anyone from another world has ever visited our land. I am very happy to see you. How did you know about us? Asked Commander Deccan. The queen smiled I have been watching over you ever since our embarrassing defeat by the demon king and the day the gates suddenly appeared. A few days ago, 
My foresight told me that one of the Remanig heroes purposely summoned the gates. You people have a very strange aura. I don't sense any magic in any of you. That's probably because we're from a world where magic doesn't exist. According to Dr. Sarah, Queen Marielle then explained to them how she had been watching over them. After she finished, the queen gave an order to a servant to bring water and food for everyone. 1. Part 13. I appreciate it, but I have to refuse your offer for the safety of my crew. As you can see, we only have little information about this world, but we would love to stay in this place for a few days if you allow us to, said Commander Deccan. Of course you can. We just want to make sure that you are safe, said the queen. Commander Deccan and his men felt at ease now knowing that they were safe. The queen then ordered her knights to show the visitors around the city. We also require disguises because we do not want rumors to spread in the city that could endanger one of us, said Commander Deccan. We will need to find you something more suitable. Can't you disguise yourselves using your own clothing? asked Queen Marielle. We can, but it won't look right. We don't need to wear fancy clothes. It might attract more attention, Commander Deccan answered. Commander Deccan allowed his men to change clothes while the commander and the queen talked on the balcony. We don't mind pretending we are locals for the time being, but we must make it look convincing to the residents, explained Commander Deccan. It's pretty surprising that you managed to find us first, said Commander Deccan. The queen chuckled a little and looked Commander Deccan in the eyes. His eyes appeared to be those of a dead person, and he appeared to have experienced unspeakable horrors that would eventually break a normal person. The queen got curious about the state of his soul. Is it true that you come from a world where magic doesn't exist? She asked with curiosity. Yes. Magic doesn't really exist in this world, he said. But we have come a long way from the mere use of the spear, bow, and arrows to high-tech war equipment. Advances in technology have led to technologies that go beyond the thing you call magic, such as advanced computing, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, autonomy, robotics, directed energy, hypersonics, and biotechnology, the very technologies that ensure we will be able to defend ourselves. Commander Deccan looked again at Queen Marielle, who listened to him attentively with a look of confusion on her face. Her expression seemed to suggest that she didn't quite believe him. Commander Deccan explained the difference between magic and technology, and how the latter would always be superior to the former. While he was explaining, the Queen seemed to become a little worried about what would happen in this world. Don't worry. Our goal is to explore, observe, study, and document previously unknown things and then introduce them to the public. Commander Deccan continued his explanation. I'm sure that you've heard of the theory of evolution by natural selection. Well, that theory applies to life as well. So, what you're saying is that you have evolved from a primitive state into a highly developed civilization, just like the dwarves and the kingdom of Vorden. The queen replied, Vorden? Asked Kamena Denken. The kingdoms of the dwarves and the Vordani have also made advances in science and magic. Dwarves who have mastered the use of steam and gunpowder are another example. They are strong in both fields. After hearing those words, Commander Denkin paused to gaze out the balcony of the castle and noticed several trade ships and cogs going back and forth along the city's extensive ports, where the sun was slowly setting. Queen Marielle looked at Commander Deccan with interest, but she remained silent for a while. I think that's enough talk for today. I will look forward to staying in this city while waiting for new orders, said Commander Deccan. Queen Marielle smiled and exited the balcony, accompanied by her entourage. I didn't expect the queen to say yes so quickly, said Commander Deccan. What do you mean? asked Yend. She said that she would let us stay here as long as we wanted. Why? asked Yend. Commander Deccan looked at Yend and said, probably because she doesn't want conflict. It would ruin her kingdom's reputation as the center of all trade. Commander Deccan then went to change into his disguise, which consisted of merely a double-layered cloak covering all of his military equipment from head to toe. Sir, our majesty has reserved rooms, said a maid. He was also told to go down to the ground floor and wait for an escort. When he arrived on the ground floor, he was met by his crew, who were dressed in tunics and other native garb. Then two more people entered the room one of whom appeared to be a knight and the other a scholar. My name is Sir Rudyard, and I and my men will show you around, and these scholars will help you with your questions. Thank you, Sir Rudyard, said Commander Deccan. They discussed for a few minutes before shaking hands and reaching an agreement. Rudyard was a tall, well-built man with a balding head. 
He wore a thick breastplate covered in yellow and blue checkerboard pattern fabric, arm and leg greaves, and a metal skirt that gave him the appearance of a conquistador's armor. Sir Rudyard and I agreed to split into two groups. Professor Abigail, Dr. Sarah, Kevin, Lewis, and Dr. Kyle will be guarded by Bacon and Sir Leonard, the rest of the crew with me. The group then proceeded to the port as directed. However, Dr. Sarah's group preferred to remain in the city monastery. Sir Rudyard and his guards were followed by Commander Deccan and his men. Commander Deccan's crew was well prepared, carrying cameras and other data-gathering equipment, but the scholars and Iranilan Sodiers have no idea what they're doing. While at the monastery library, where Dr. Sarah and the others were escorted to the library, they were given permission to enter the library by the librarian, who showed them around. There were many bookshelves filled with ancient manuscripts and scrolls. But there's a catch. They can't read it. It looks like drunk Chinese to me. Bacon laughed, opening the book closest to him. Hey kid, could you kindly read that for us? Dr. Sarah respectfully asked one of the scholars. Wait, you can't read those books? Asked the scholar. Isn't it obvious they're from another world? Said Sir Leonard to the young scholar. Oh, the young scholar said I'm sorry. The young scholar proceeded to read the texts in the book. The History of the Aranalu. The kingdom first rose to prominence when the kingdom of Aranalu served as a reliable naval ally, receiving many ships from other continents thanks to its two capsules that protected the ships from pirates and sea serpents. Going to shore in an unoccupied location is risky at the moment because of the demon lord's devastating aura, which confuses every magical beast on the continent. When the great Sodiers of Null fought in the fourth demonic crusade with the great priests and locked away the demon king, the great sun began to rise and warm the front lines. It took a long time for the seas to calm after the war, and the safest place for traders to land was in the kingdom of Arananalu, which also helped its economy grow. It became the greatest trading nation in the region and also gained fame for its excellent trading industry. That's impressive, said Dr. Sarah. Yes, it is, said the young scholar proudly. While Dr. Sarah and her colleagues were talking, Sir Leonard tried his best to hold his laughter while standing in the corner. Bacon soon took notice, asking, Why are you laughing? As Bacon whispered, Sir Leonard laughed quietly and pointed at the book. I can't read it, said Bacon. Oh, sorry. It's really funny that they're reading a children's book. They look like kids. Do we're just trying to learn about your culture and history, added Bacon. Is it rare to have a proper education in your world? Sir Leonard asked. Well, no, it's quite unusual to encounter someone who hasn't had a decent education. UNICEF aims to offer excellent learning opportunities that provide children and adolescents with the necessary information and skills. Bacon answered. You mean people who don't go to school? Indeed, sir. Most of our population attend university or technical schools, said Bacon. That's understandable, said Sir Leonard as the two watched Dr. Sarah and the Aranalan scholars read while Dr. Sarah's team just took down notes. Hey, mister, what's that thing on top of the book? A young scholar questioned Professor Abigail as a tiny ray of light traced the texts in the book. Well, that's a scanner. It is a device that optically scans images, printed text, handwriting or an object and converts it to a digital image. Wow, your technology is really impressive. Probably outperforming the dwarves and Vorden's current technology, the young scholar said as she looked at Professor Abigail, who was working on his laptop. Meanwhile, the Flying Dutchman's communications officer was doing his usual work while drinking coffee when he received a message from Dr. Sarah and Professor Abigail. Yo! I got some good news I have sent you the file. When the communications officer opened the file, he nearly spilled his coffee and immediately called Chief Commander Kreger. When Kreger viewed the file, he widened his eyes. Contact the UN immediately! shouted Chief Commander Kreger. Commander Deccan, along with Sir Rudyard and his crew, were walking through the wide city streets, which were crowded with people carrying goods and merchants from other races, such as elves and demi-humans, buying and selling items. Woe is look that guy has cat ears, said one of Commander Deccan's crew pointing at it like a kid, while holding a camera taking pictures of the city's crowded markets. The young scholar looked at the same merchant and said, Oh, he's a demi-human. His race is unique in this world. Some kingdoms treated them as pests, but that is strictly forbidden in this kingdom, and they are treated with respect. So, that's a demi-human? said one of the Commander Deccan's crew before taking a photo at the crowd. They are considered half-beasts, half-human creatures that have both magical and physical powers. Some are born with divine bloodlines and possess superhuman abilities, 
We should better get going, said Commander Deccan. Sir, Rudyard, we'd like to stop by the port to examine the merchant ships, Captain Deccan asked. Certainly, you have my full authority to do so, replied Sir Rudyard. As they made their way through the bustling crowds, a tall hooded figure followed them, her intentions unknown, and everyone in Commander Deccan's crew didn't notice because of the crowds and carriages moving along the busy road. The cloaked woman kept following Commander Deccan and his crew until they reached the port. So this is the port? Ivan, one of Captain Decker's crew members, the person who was carrying the camera. The port was massive, crowded with all types of ships, and the sheer quantity of movement and bustle in the air was overwhelming. Despite the fact that the port was crowded, it was impressively clean. Even Ivan, a seasoned sailor, was taken aback by the port's sheer size and vitality. This is indeed the harbor, said Sir Rudyard. The Aranala Kingdom is known for its military power, especially its navy, and many merchant vessels come to trade with the kingdom. Many ships were in the harbor, including large warships and merchant vessels from far-off lands, making it truly a sight to behold. Look at the size of that thing. It's almost as tall as an Arlei Burr-class destroyer, said Ivan while taking a photo of the massive wooden steamed ship as it towered over the harbor. It almost looked like a Viking ship. Its hull was embedded with ornate carvings. Oh, that thing is the Grand Monarch. It's a merchant vessel that belonged to the dwarves. They're a pretty advanced kingdom. People rarely see this marvel of technology. They often trade with valuable stones and metals in exchange for barrels of booze, said the other scholar. It's really something to behold, Ivan said in amazement, as he marveled at the intricate details on the bow of the vessel. The crowd suddenly starts cheering and swarms around the vessel anxious to get a better view. The majority of the observers were children. What are they doing? asked Commander Deccan. Those are the sailors who work on the Grand Monarch. They're celebrating their arrival, replied Sir Rudyard. Well, most kids want to hear about the great adventures that they encounter. Most of their stories are made up, but the dwarves are good storytellers. Sir Rudyard smiled and said, The tales of the Grand Monarch are definitely something special. When I was little, I used to listen to the sailors' tales of the wonderful places they'd visited during their expedition to the south and the amazing creatures they'd encountered along the way. The dwarves were quite happy to share their stories of their travels with the children, regaling them with tales of orcs, sea monsters, and mysterious lands. Look, said the onlookers as the ship's crew disembarked, waving at the cheering crowd as the sailors stepped onto the docks. They were short, bearded people, and their clothing was full of fur and leather. Let's have a feast, said one of the dwarves. Everyone cheered and clapped, for these seafaring dwarves had traveled the world. As the rest of the crew's interest wanes, they widen their eyes as mechanical mechs descend from the ship, carrying crates on their backs, towards the town. What are those? Ivan inquired. Oh, those are one of the dwarves' steam and magic-powered automata, said the young scholar. But Commander Deccan wasn't impressed nor shocked as one of the automata walked past them with the sound of steam hissing from its mechanical foot. You don't look so impressed. Ivan chuckled. It does not look too practical compared to a tracked and wheeled vehicle that can travel at fast speeds compared to a mech that has too many moving parts. It must have been expensive to repair them. Well, they're used mostly for mining and lifting heavy cargo. Most caves in the north were full of dungeons and monsters so it was not an ideal environment for wheeled or tracked vehicles. They're very protective about the technology that was used to create the mechs, so they made sure to keep their technology a secret, the same as the Vordans, said the young scholar. The crowd then stormed them, causing the crew to flee, but they quickly regrouped except for Ivan. Meanwhile, Ivan, pushed by the cheering crowd, found a way out, taking a breath, and it was then, as he walked through the city's glowing streets in the middle of the night, that he realized he'd lost his way. Shit. 1. Part 14. Crap, said Ivan, who had no clue where he was going or what he was going to do, so he chose to focus on finding his way back while aimlessly exploring the city. He remained calm, remembering that he had his radio tucked into a leather bag around his waist. The special region does not have GPS satellites or other navigational devices. Then he smiled recalling that the UN has always been aiding them with navigational assistance and observing our progress through a special unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV. So basically, the UAV works like a satellite specifically for this job, but without having to be launched into orbit. He chooses not to call them and instead waits for them to contact him. He then gets his camera and records as much information as he can. 
He knew he'd get in trouble if he didn't return to the group, so he did everything he could to avoid getting in trouble. He checked his leather bag before proceeding, ensuring that he had everything he needed for the night. Inside the bag are a handheld radio, a gun, notably a suppressed Glock 30, a few clips, a SAK, also known as a Swiss Army knife, and a chocolate bar for an energy boost. He sighed and put his rifle and three ammo clips tucked under his clothing around his waist. He also put his Swiss Army knife in his pocket. But for some reason, he left the snacks in the bag. He continued to walk along the city streets cautiously, glancing around at the buildings and choosing a less crowded street. As he moved, he noticed a young woman being pinned in the corner by three people. The person in the back appeared to be overweight and was donning a nice coat and top hat with black feathers, while the two who were blocking the young lady wore leather armor, carrying swords around their backs. These don't appear to be Aaronic Watchmen, the medieval version of a police force explained by Sir Gaston before they left the royal castle. As they spoke, he quickly hid himself in the corner or otherwise tried to listen to whatever they were saying. He could barely make out their conversation, but it seemed as if they were talking about a girl who had been taken against her will, which made him feel even more uncomfortable. Good evening, young lady. We're very sorry for the loss of your sister, said the person at the back with a wide grin. But, the man then raised his hand and said, You see, your sister might have a huge debt to pay, and I'm afraid we may have to take matters into our own hands. You have two choices, either pay the debt in full or accept the burden of using your body as collateral. The young lady then gritted her teeth, her face filled with fear and anger, and hissed, I refuse to accept this. No one has the right to use my body as collateral, not even if it means paying off my sister's debt. Well then, the man clapped his hands with a wide grin. Hmm, I guess I should take it as a yes. Then they heard a faint beeping sound at the corner, catching their attention. Shit, I forgot to turn off the alarm, said Ivan as he hurriedly walked out of the corner and switched off the alarm. As he looked up, he saw that four of them were looking at him. Uh, hello there, he said nervously. Help me, said the young lady. It seems like you've heard everything we've discussed, said the young man wearing the top hat. Guards. One of the men who was blocking the young lady and gladly nodded, following his orders. As you wish. Before Ivan could say anything, a knife struck the side of his chest and knocked him to the corner. No, she screamed as she struggled to get free. She shoved her captor off of her and hurried towards Ivan, terrified and frantic. Ivan lay on the ground, injured and in shock, but determined to rise and return to his feet while drawing the knife tied across his chest. Ivan began to sweat and chuckle quietly as he realized his radio had saved his life. He looked back at the two captors and said, That really scared the crap out of me. Whoever the person was that was wearing a top hat with a displeased look on his face spoke, You think this traveler, this puny little traveler, can protect you? Ivan, still somewhat trembling but with a cheeky grin on his face, grabbed the young woman's hand and yelled, Let's run! Meanwhile, at the port, Sir Rudyard and Commander Deccan's group just gathered after getting dragged by the bustling crowd celebrating the dwarves' arrival. Hey, is everyone all right? Sir Rudyard checked the faces in the crowd and asked anxiously, Are you all okay? I was worried that something might have happened to one of you. He looked around, relieved that everyone seemed to be in one piece. What about you, Commander Deccan? asked Sir Rudyard. Ivan is missing, said Commander Deccan. He had been separated from the group after the celebrating residents started to swarm us, and none of us have heard from him since. Commander Deccan then tried to call Ivan, grabbing his handheld radio and waiting for him to respond. He's not responding. Commander Deccan felt concerned as he thought about all of the various scenarios if Ivan had been M.I., missing in action. There might also be a technological leak. Do you know a shortcut towards the port? Ivan said while running with the lady. Yes. I know a path. There's a small alleyway that leads directly to the port, said the young lady as she took the lead. I see it, said Ivan. As they were running, the two guards were on the city roofs, dashing towards the young lady and Ivan. Capture the girl, and don't kill him. Travelers often don't go alone. Someone might be waiting for them. If we can capture him, we might want to use him for ransom. Talk about hitting two birds with one stone, said one of the men as he jumped off the roof and landed in front of them pointing his sword towards them. He he he, you can't escape me, said the man as he stepped closer towards Ivan, his eyes narrowing as he scowled menacingly. 
Ivan gritted his teeth as he grabbed his radio, then threw his broken radio towards the man. The man quickly saw the strange item he threw flying towards his face. He quickly hit the item with his hand, throwing it aside again. I said you can't escape me that easel Ivan took advantage of the man's momentary distraction and lunged forward, sending a powerful punch in the man's direction while he was mid-sentence, knocking the person out. Ivan jumped back and gasped as he caught his breath. Wow, that was impressive. Did you see that? Ivan said with admiration. Focus, said the lady. They continued to run towards the port but stopped when they saw the man wearing the top hat smiling towards them. They tried to turn back, but there was also another guy blocking the way. It's a trap, said the young lady. Ivan then pulled his Glock towards the person wearing the top hat move. Or I shoot. Are you serious? The man asked, still smiling. Do you think that little pea shooter can handle me? You know this thing I'm holding? said Ivan. The man flinched at Ivan's gun. So you're a Vorden spy? What are you talking about? Ivan then brought the Glock up to the man's face, resting it on the trigger. Heck, I don't even know what a Vorden spy is. Only the Vordens and the dwarves possess those weapons, said the top-hatted man. Move. Ivan clenched his teeth, turned, and fired, but the bullets passed through him. Behind you, shouted the girl as she called Ivan. As Ivan turned, he saw the other man running at him pulling out his sword, but Ivan pushed himself back, inches from slicing through his head. His hand landed on the man's face, giving him a bloody nose. As the man regained his senses and looked up, he was now surrounded by the Queen's royal guards and a few caped foreigners pointing strange-looking muskets at him. He notices something hard poking his head. Drop your weapon or the last thing you will ever see is your head hitting the ground, said Commander Deccan. The man's eyes widened in fear as he dropped his knife realizing that he had made a grave mistake. His mind raced as he wondered how he had managed to stumble into the middle of a royal security detail. 1. Part 15 Next. Meanwhile, at the city monastery, they were still talking to each other. They were still not done trying to translate every book about the special region, thanks to the kingdom scholars helping them, and there were still many things to be recorded, like rare so-called magical creatures and places, cities, towns, religions, kingdoms, laws, factions, and most of all magic. Yes, technology has come a long way, but there is still much to learn and discover. Speaking of discoveries, Dr. Sarah, have you heard about the ancient texts being translated? They may hold valuable information about the special region, said Professor Abigail. Dr. Sarah nodded and said, yes, I have heard about it. It's exciting to think about what we may learn from those texts. Who knows what kind of knowledge and magic we may uncover? Professor Abigail smiled. Exactly. It's important to remember that technology and magic can work together to advance our understanding of the world around us. Dr. Kyle then interjected and said, Hey everybody, I just received a message from Commander Deccan. He said that Ivan got into trouble. What? The group's attention shifted from the discussion of technology and magic to the news about Ivan's trouble. They all wondered what had happened and hoped that it wasn't anything serious. Hey, hey, nothing major here. Commander Deacon stated that it has already been resolved, and that Ivan is now safe. Commander Deccan also mentioned we may have to remain a little longer since he still has some critical issues to address with someone. After receiving the news, the group breathed a sigh of relief and thanked Commander Deccan for the report. They chose to wait for additional instructions with patience, hoping that all would be addressed quickly. Commander Deccan and Sir Rudyard were now leading their retinue back to the castle. So tell me, Sir Rudyard, those folks are a little bit of an inconvenience on the outskirts of your capital. Can you tell me who those men are? Oh, those really are a nuisance in the city. This corrupt organization calls itself the Red Menace. They mostly consist of criminals and have ties to other radical groups, robbing travelers and even adventurers wherever they go. The authorities have been trying to dismantle them for years. But they seem to always find a way to outsmart us by using our trade ships as a cover for their illegal activities and hiding in the shadows of the city's slums. It's a constant battle to keep them at bay and protect innocent citizens from their harmful actions. Sir Rudyard answers. Commander Deccan then looked towards Ivan and asked. Can you explain how you got into this situation? Ivan cleared his throat and lowered his head. And said. I was just passing by when I saw them harassing this young woman. Well, I did not plan to intervene, but let's just say things didn't go as planned and things escalated quickly. As he looked up, Commander Deccan was still looking at Ivan. 
Sir Rudyard nodded his head in understanding and gestured for Ivan to continue with his explanation. Ivan took a deep breath and recounted the events that led to his current situation, hoping that his honesty would earn him some trust. I'm not angry, said Commander Deccan as they continued to walk. Ivan then sighed in relief, grateful that he wasn't going to face any consequences for his actions. Good, said Commander Deccan, because I need you to help me out with something. Ivan then looked at Commander Deccan curiously. What do you need me for? Paperwork. You say, pt ha ha ha. The rest of the group started laughing. Ivan felt embarrassed and annoyed by his friend's behavior, but he tried to keep his composure in front of Commander Deccan. Why are they laughing was that supposed to be a joke? The Arenalin soldiers whispered at each other, not understanding what the joke meant. Yen then raised her hand. What does the joke mean? Well, a commander would be responsible for signing off on many different documents and reports, and failing to do so can result in a lot of headaches for the commander and the entire military. This joke is meant to ridicule the mountains of paperwork that military commanders are often faced with and to demonstrate just how much of a hassle it can be to be in charge of a military operation, answered one of Commander Deccan's crew. Sir Rudyard also can't help but smile. Yen nodded in understanding, realizing the pressure that commanders must face. She then asked, Is there anything we can do to make the paperwork process easier for our commander? One of Commander Decker's crew then answered her question, Hey, it's just a joke. It's nothing serious. The rest of the group laughed again except for Ivan, who remained silent. Commander Deccan then turned towards Ivan and said, You're right. There is no reason for you to worry about such trivial matters. Back at the city monastery, Dr. Sarah and the rest of the second group had now decided that they should take a break because of the large amounts of information being read and translated. Mountains of books were now laid out in front of the table, along with their research equipment. Why in hell is this world very similar to an RPG game? From the existence of dragons and demigods to how magic works, my god, it's complicated, said Dr. Kyle while muttering with his head resting at the table out of boredom and with a very complicated look on his face. Hey kid, what's your name? Can you explain how magic works? That's a good question, said the young scholar. My name is John Gabriel, and magic is typically cast by using a variety of spells and abilities, which can be learned through study and practice. This means that magic can be used in a variety of ways, such as to cause damage to enemies with powerful curses or spells, to heal wounds or cure illnesses, to teleport or fly, or even to create or manipulate elements like water, earth, or fire. Power systems are often based on magical or supernatural energy sources. These sources can come from various places, such as the gods or spirits of nature, and they can be harnessed or channeled in various ways. Some of the most common power systems in this world you visited are spells, which are usually formed through a combination of gestures, incantations, and focus. The gestures and words are often specific, while the focus is generally on the intent behind the spell. The more specific and focused the intent, the more powerful and potent the spell will be. The same spell can be used to create different effects based on the caster's intent and focus. For example, a fire spell could be used to simply create a small flame or it could be used to create an inferno that can scorch the earth and burn everything in its path. Can you do a little magic for us? asked Professor Abigail. The young scholar blushes and says, Well, I'm not very good at it yet, but yes, I can show you. As Dr. Kyle saw the young scholar pulling out his wand, he sighed in frustration and bowed his head back at the table, saying, Oh my God, as expected, a magic wand. Is there something wrong? asked John. Don't mind him. He's just tired. You're doing great, said Dr. Sarah while quickly pulling her camera. John then began to wave his hand in the air, and shapes began to form, with letters forming in a circular fashion. Snowflakes started to materialize and fall out of it. Everyone then started to clap their hands at him. Very impressive now, can I ask a question? Do mermaids and unicorns exist? Asked Dr. Kyle. Yes, they exist. They are just too lazy to go beyond the surface. But I don't know what a unicorn is, said the young scholar. Oh, it's a horse that has a horn on its forehead, replied Dr. Kyle with a smile. Well, I have read most of the books in this library, but they didn't mention a horse that has a horn on its forehead called a unicorn in our archive. After hearing the young scholar's words, he sighed again. Well, at least my daughter will be happy to hear about mermaids. After a brief moment of silence, 
Professor Abigail asked one of the Aranalan royal guards who was keeping an eye on them a question. Why did the queen allow us to have access to your library? Such information is to be handed to us. The guard replied, the queen can see all possible outcomes in the future. This might be a part of her plan to prevent any catastrophic events from happening. Professor Abigail nodded thoughtfully, impressed by the queen's foresight, and started to wonder how his superiors would react to it. It always makes sense to plan ahead and prepare for any potential dangers, he said, and he hopes that your visit will foster a better understanding between our two kingdoms. We are a bunch of curious and desperate souls who want to know more about this mysterious world we found ourselves in, he said while shrugging his shoulders. I guess you could say that you are all obsessed with finding the truth behind our existence. We want to know more about your world and its history, especially if they're similar to ours. Why does this happen? asked Professor Abigail. John then replied, As I mentioned earlier, magic is often cast by using a variety of spells and abilities. It's still unknown who created the gates. The scientists paused for a moment, changed the topic, and said okay. Let's continue translating the ancient texts and see if we can find any clues about these gates. Perhaps there is a way for us to harness this magic and use it to benefit both of our worlds. Nah, I'm tired. Why don't we just take a break, get some air, and come back to this later? Suggested Dr. Kyle, stifling a yawn. We can resume our work with fresh eyes and a clear mind, or even record native animals like birds outside. Ah, the Dr. Kyle wants to go out into the world and have fun. You must not be that bored, right? Dr. Sarah, she said sarcastically. Oh, shut up, Dr. Kao replied, rolling his eyes. I'm just suggesting a way to break up the monotony of our work and maybe have a little fun while we're at it. Plus, it's important to take breaks and not burn ourselves out. Right, said Dr. Sarah with a sigh. She couldn't deny that Dr. Kyle had a point, but she was still skeptical about his idea. However, she decided to give it a chance and see if it could actually help them after all. A little fun could boost their morale and increase productivity. Dr. Sarah thought it was worth a shot to try something new and see if it made a difference in their work environment. John, is there a balcony near your library? asked Dr. Kyle. I'm sure I can get you there, replied John with a smile. It's on the second floor, and it has a great view of the city. Dr. Sarah looked at Dr. Kyle with a hint of curiosity wondering what his idea was and how it involved the balcony. Excellent, replied Dr. Kyle with enthusiasm as he began to take a pair of observation equipment and borrowed a pair of binoculars from one of the guards. John questioned, what are you planning to observe, Dr. Kyle? Dr. Kyle replied, I don't know. I think bird watching is enjoyable to do. I want to observe the behavior of the birds in the city from that balcony. But you don't recognize what different kinds of whatever bird live in this world, right? Dr. Sarah pressed. Correct. But even so, there's no harm in observing them, especially if we are able to see any patterns and behaviors that could give us clues about their habitat and lifestyle. Plus, it's always fascinating to learn more about this special region. Dr. Kao replied, looking at the young scholar, who was also very excited and curious about this prospect. Dr. Sarah then turned towards Dr. Kyle and said, why not just take some notes of what you see and maybe talk to the guards or other residents of the city? Maybe you can get more answers if they see and hear your questions directly. Oh, it's a good idea. I'll try that when we return, Dr. Kyle said with a smile, which made the young scholar beam with pride. John then took the stairs and started their journey to the second floor of the library and its balcony, which was on the top floor of the building, offering a breathtaking view of the entire city. As they walked up the stairs, the young scholar John couldn't help but feel grateful for this opportunity to learn from an esteemed professor and for his reaction to this beautiful region. The view is amazing, Dr. Kyle thought to himself as he stood on the balcony of the building and gazed at the beautiful scenery before him. He pointed at the huge stone buildings around him, saying, I've never seen buildings like these anywhere else in our world. Your towers must be designed to support the tremendous weight of the building itself. This requires the use of strong materials, such as steel and concrete, and a careful design of the building framework to distribute the weight evenly, said Dr. Kyle while placing his observation equipment. So what does your world look like? asked John, quickly pulling out his journal. Dr. Kyle paused for a moment, taking in the surroundings, before answering, Our world is quite different from this. We have more advanced technology, and our buildings are mostly made of glass and steel with sleek designs. Have structures taller than this, 
But I can't help but wonder how you built this thing with limited technology. John has mixed emotions about it after hearing this. To which he replied, I think it's amazing how humans were able to create such impressive structures with limited resources. It really shows the ingenuity, and it's important to appreciate and learn from their achievements. John glanced over the observation apparatus and questioned, Is that a spyglass? Yes, it's similar. It's very similar to a spyglass. But an observation apparatus is a device or piece of equipment used to monitor or study something, such as animals or plants. Some examples of observation apparatuses include cameras, microphones, and thermal imagers, which can be used to observe the movements and behaviors of wildlife in their natural habitats. The observations made using these apparatuses can help scientists gather information about the habitat, population size, and behaviors of wildlife, which can be used to guide conservation efforts and improve wildlife management. Some observation apparatuses can also be automated so that they can gather data continuously without the need for human interaction. This makes it easier for researchers to track the movements and behaviors of wildlife over long periods of time and collect data on multiple species. John then quickly makes notes in his journal about what he just said and draws the observation apparatus. John continued to write down some ideas on his paper, and he was starting to look very excited and happy to learn about the equipment. Dr. Sarah, who is sitting beside him, looks at him and says, I see that you've started taking notes. John jumped and was shocked by her sudden interruption, but quickly composed himself and replied, yes, I find it fascinating how your world's technology has made it this far without magic. The young scholar began to think about what he could possibly say or do to put an end to the conversation. Moments later, Dr. Kyle asked John, how does your world provide lighting from your city? John replied, Oh, we use glowstones. They are a type of magic crystal that glows when in contact with water and is quite popular in other kingdoms and towns. These are abundant in caves and widely used by the dwarves because of their reliability. They have been around for a long time, and many people use them in lamps. That's quite impressive. Indeed it is, replied Dr. Kyle. You don't happen to know anything about fire? John's eyes widened for a moment at Dr. Kyle's question. Yes, actually, we do. Most cultures widely use fire manipulation to their advantage, whether it's for cooking, warmth, or even protection against predators. However, it's important to remember that fire can also be dangerous and destructive if not handled properly. There it is. Dr. Kyle pointed to a large flock of birds in the city that numbered probably around a thousand as he peered through the lens. What did you see? asked Dr. Sarah. Well, it's a plump bird with a rounded body and a short tail. Its wings are short and rounded. Dr. Kyle continued to observe the flock while showing footage. Ah, it's called an alleyway sparrow, which is a versatile bird that has adapted well to life. It is a scavenger, picking out pieces of food scraps from the streets and even rummaging through garbage pits for a meal. It is also a skilled hunter, snatching insects from the air and picking off worms from the concrete. The alleyway sparrow is constantly on the move, darting from one alley to another in search of food. It can also be aggressive when it comes to defending its territory from other birds, as it is often outnumbered in the city. With a sharp memory and the ability to distinguish between patterns and faces, the alleyway sparrow is also quite clever. It is known to make friends with humans, who sometimes leave out bird feed for them to enjoy. Okay? How about this one? Asked Dr. Kyle, showing live footage of a bird near a glass window. Huh, said John while looking at the screen. The footage shows a black feathered bird with a long tail and talons. It also has a slender neck and legs, and its eyes are bright and keen. They are highly intelligent and can be trained to navigate the city with ease. They are known for their loyalty and their willingness to go to great lengths to deliver their packages, often braving harsh weather and dangerous situations to ensure that their deliveries arrive on time. They are also known to be able to read and remember addresses, allowing them to navigate the city efficiently and accurately. The letter raven, or letter carrier raven, is a prized breed among the high class of noblemen due to their exceptional abilities and unique appearance, making them a symbol of status and wealth. After minutes of talking on the balcony, Dr. Kyle noticed Commander Dekken and the rest heading towards the city monastery. 1. 